Chapter on the first day of the January sales, and wheeling him in and out of the changing room. Tonight, he was wearing the outfit Branson had put together specially for this date. An unlined brown suede blouson from Jasper Conran, the most expensive black t shirt he had ever bought, beige Dolce and Gabbana trousers, an insanely pricey belt, brown loafers, and even brand new yellow socks, which Branson insisted added a hip touch. In addition, he now had an entire new wardrobe for just about every occasion. The bill had come to over two and a half thousand pounds. He had never spent more than a hundred quid in a clothing shop in his life before. But what the hell, he thought. These last few years he had barely bought any items of new clothing at all. Get it all over with in one big hit, and anything he didn't like he could go back and change. For a copper? Do I take that as a compliment? he asked with a quizzical grin. She smiled warmly, searching his face with her eyes. If you want. He gave what he hoped came over as a nonchalant shrug.、Uh, just some things I threw on. I, uh. She was staring at his right shoulder. Is the price tag part of the design? He clamped his left hand onto his shoulder. Immediately his fingers touched stiff card attached to string. Under Cleo's wickedly amused gaze, he traced the string back under the jacket collar, cursing his carelessness. Part of the design, he nodded. Totally part of the design. It's the new thing in jackets, that, um, sort of, um, off the shelf look. She laughed, and he found himself laughing back. His nerves had disappeared, and suddenly his head was full of stuff he wanted to talk to this woman about. But she got him first as he tugged the tag free, balled it, and dropped it in the ashtray. Swirling her drink in her glass, she said, I'm curious, Roy, about your wife. Is it something you talk about? Tell me if I'm being nosy and it's none of my business. He reached hesitantly into his pocket for his cigarettes. Technically, he had given up, but there were moments when he still needed one. Like now. A waiter appeared with menus, two massive folded cards. Grace put his down without glancing at it, and Cleo did the same. No, you're not being nosy. He raised his hands a moment, a little helplessly, unsure where to begin his reply. I've always talked about it openly, maybe too openly. I just want people to be aware, you know. I've always thought that if I talk about it to enough people, maybe one day I'll jog someone's memory. What was her name? Sandy. He offered the pack to Cleo, but she shook her head. He took a cigarette out. Is it true what people say? She just disappeared. On my thirtieth birthday. He fell silent for a moment, all the pain returning. Cleo waited patiently, then prompted On your thirtieth birthday? I went to work. We were going to go out with some friends for dinner in the evening to celebrate. When I left home, Sandy was in a great mood. We'd been planning a summer holiday. She wanted to go to the Italian lakes. When I came back in the evening, she wasn't there. Had she taken her things? Her handbag and her car were gone. He lit the cigarette with the Zippo lighter Sandy had given him, then gulped some more of his drink. Talking about Sandy didn't seem right on a date. Yet at the same time, he felt he really wanted to be honest with Cleo, to tell her everything, to give her as much detail as possible. Not just about Sandy, but about his entire life. Something about her made him feel he could be open with her, more open than with anyone he could remember. He took a long drag on his cigarette, then blew the smoke out. It tasted so damned good. Frowning, Cleo asked, Her handbag and her car. Were either of them ever found? Her car was found the next evening in the short term car park at Gatwick Airport, but she never used any of her credit cards. The last transactions were on the morning she disappeared one at Boots for £7.50, one for £16.42 from the local Tesco garage. She didn't take anything else. No clothes, no other belongings, nothing. What about CCTV? There weren't so many around then. The only footage we got was on the forecourt of the Tesco garage.
She was alone and she looked fine. The cashier was an old boy. He said he remembered her because he always noticed the pretty ones and he'd had a bit of a laugh with her. Said she didn't seem under any duress. I don't think a woman would just walk out of her life leaving everything behind, Cleo said, unless, she hesitated. Unless, he prompted. Fixing her eyes on him, she replied, unless she was running away from a wife, Peter. Then she smiled and said gently, You don't look like a wife, Peter, to me. I think her parents still harbour a sneaking suspicion that I've got her buried under the cellar floor. Seriously? He drained his glass. I suppose they figure every other avenue has been exhausted. They actually accused you? No. They're sweet people, they wouldn't do that, but I see it in their faces. They invite me over for the odd drink or Sunday lunch to keep in touch, but what they really want is an update. There's never much to tell them, and I can see they're looking at me strangely, as if they're wondering how much longer can he keep up these lies about Sandy. That's terrible, Cleo said. Grace stared at the cluster of gleaming bracelets around Cleo's wrist, thinking what great taste she had in everything. She was their only child. Their lives have been destroyed by her disappearance. I've seen it in other situations from work. People need something to cling to, something to focus their emotions on. He took another drag on his cigarette and tapped the ash into the ashtray beside the price tag of his jacket. So, enough about me. I want to know about you. Tell me about the other Cleo Mori. The other Cleo Mori? The one you change into when you clock off from the mortuary? Not yet, she teased. I haven't finished with you yet, not by a long way. He saw she had finished her drink also and hailed the waiter, ordering another for each of them. Then he turned to Cleo. I'm sorry, it's your turn to answer a question. She pulled a face which made him grin. I want to know, he said, why the most beautiful woman in the world is working in a mortuary doing the most horrible job in the world. I was a nurse. I did a degree at Southampton University. I wasn't a very good nurse. I don't know. Maybe I didn't have the patience. Then I spent a couple of weeks working in the mortuary at the local hospital, and I just found... I don't know how to describe it. I, I just felt that it was the first place I'd been to in my life where I could make a difference. Have you ever read the writings of Shang Se? I'm just a dumb copper from the back streets of Brighton. I never got to read anything fancy. Who he? A Chinese Taoist philosopher. Oh, of course. Silly me for not knowing. She dug her fingers into the ice at the bottom of her glass, then flicked a droplet of water at him. Stop being horrid. He flinched as it struck his forehead. I'm not being horrid. You are. Tell me what this chunk say geezer said. He said, What the caterpillar calls the end of the world, the master calls the butterfly. So you turn corpses into butterflies. I wish. They were the last to leave the restaurant. Grace was so engrossed in Cleo and so drunk, he hadn't noticed that the last customers had left a good half an hour before and the staff were waiting patiently to close up. Cleo made a grab for the bill, but he snatched it off the plate, adamant. OK, she said, I get the next one. Deal, he said, tossing his card down, hoping he still had some credit on it. A few minutes later, they staggered out into the blustery wind and he held the door of the waiting cab for her, then climbed in, his head spinning. He had lost count of how much they'd drunk. Two bottles of wine, then sambukas, then more sambukas, and they'd had several drinks to start. He slid an arm over the seat and Cleo nestled comfortably against him. Ich bin gut, he slurred. Like, ich mean, really... Then her mouth was pressed against his. Her lips felt soft, so, so incredibly soft. He felt her tongue hungrily against his. It seemed just seconds later the taxi pulled up outside her flat 
in the fashionable North Lanes district in the centre of the city. Through the haze of alcohol, he recognised the block, a recent conversion of an old industrial building. There had been a lot of publicity about it. He asked the cab to wait while he got out and walked with her to the entrance gates, unsure suddenly when they got there of the protocol. Then their mouths found each other again. He held her tight, a little unsteady on his feet, running his hands through her long silky hair, breathing in her perfume, totally intoxicated by the night, by her scents, by her softness and warmth. It seemed just moments later when he awoke with a start in the back of the cab, alone, to the beep of an incoming text. Shit, he thought. Work. He fumbled with the keys to read the text. It was from Cleo. It read simply, X. Chapter Forty. Kelly was quiet. The orange street lights strobing on her face as Tom drove the Audi down the London Road back towards Brighton. The radio was turned down low. He could just hear the Louis Armstrong song "We Have All the Time in the World," which always stirred him. He turned it up a little, tired out, struggling to stay awake, and completely sober. The car clock read one fifteen a.m. The evening at Philip Angelides's house had gone okay. But the atmosphere had been stilted. Some years ago, he and Kelly had joined the National Trust and used to like driving out to visit different stately homes on Sunday afternoons. Some of the houses they had visited were smaller than the Elizabethan pile they had been in tonight. There were sixteen of them seated around the antique dining table, served by a retinue of starchy retainers. Angelides forced each guest in turn. To guess the provenance first of the white wine, then the red, starting with the country of origin, then going on to grapes, style, maker, and year. Caro Angelides, the tycoon's wife, was probably the most stuck-up woman Tom had ever had the misfortune to sit next to, and the woman on his right, whose name he had forgotten, was not much better. Their sole conversation was horses. It veered from eventing to hunting and back again. He could not remember either of them asking him one single question about himself throughout the entire evening. Meanwhile, Kelly had had the man on her right brag to her about how clever he was, and the man on her left, an oily-looking banker who had got increasingly drunk, repeatedly put his hand on her leg and tried to move it up inside her skirt. All the other guests were clearly seriously rich and from an entirely different social stratosphere to Tom and Kelly. Neither of whom had ever had any exposure to really fine wines, and it had particularly angered Tom to see Kelly's choices belittled by her host, and he had had no chance to engage him in any kind of business conversation. In fact, as he drove, he wondered why Philip Angelides had bothered to invite them at all, except perhaps to just show off to them. But it was a bonding of a sort. He hadn't misbehaved. He managed to keep the conversation going with the two women on either side of him, despite zero knowledge of the horse world, apart from an annual flutter on the Grand National. And he had at least guessed that the red wine was French, although that was a total fluke. What a horrible bunch of people! Kelly said suddenly. Give me our friends any day. At least they're real people. I think I'll get some good business out of him. She was quiet for a moment. Then she said grudgingly, "Great house, though, to die for." Would you like to live in a place that big? Yeah, why not? If I had all those servants. Then, as an afterthought, she added, "We will one day, I'm sure. I believe in you." Tom put his hand out and found Kelly's. He squeezed, and she squeezed back. He continued to hold it, driving with one hand as they lapsed back into silence. Into his thoughts, heading home, heading back to reality. His decision to go to the police hung like a dark shadow at the back of his mind. Of course, he had done the right thing. What choice did he have? Could he have lived with his conscience? They had made that decision together. That's what you did as husband and wife. You were a team. They were approaching the turn-off now. He moved into the left-hand lane on the almost empty road, freed his hand, needing both now, followed the sharp bend all the way round, 
then headed up the hill, coming off at the roundabout at the top. Less than a minute later, dropping down into the valley, he made a left turn into Goldstone Crescent, then a sharp left into their road. He drove up the steep hill, pulled into the carport, switched off the engine and climbed out. Kelly remained strapped in her seat. Tom, holding the key fob, his finger on the electronic locking button, waited for her to get out. But she didn't move. He glanced around at the cars parked down either side of the road, all well illuminated by the street lighting. His eyes studied all the shadows, looking for what? A sudden movement? A solitary figure in a parked car? Paranoid, he told himself. Then he opened Kelly's door. Home sweet home, he said. Still, she did not move. He looked at her face, wondering for a moment if she was asleep, but her eyes were open. She was just staring ahead. Darling, hello. She gave him an odd look. We're home, I know, she said. He frowned. She seemed to be having a Kelly moment, and they were getting more frequent. He could not put his finger on exactly what these moments were, but every now and then, for a few seconds, sometimes longer, she seemed to disappear into a world of her own. The last time he had raised it with her, she had snapped back at him that sometimes she needed space, thinking time. But she sure as hell sometimes chose odd places and times to do it. Eventually, she unclipped her belt and climbed out of the car. He locked the Audi, then walked to the front door, put his key in, pushed it open, and politely stepped aside for Kelly to go in first. The television was blaring. Christ, he thought. The children were asleep. Didn't Mandy have any common sense? Then he looked around, surprised that Lady hadn't barked or come bounding out to greet them. Kelly put her head through the lounge doorway. Hi, Mandy, we're back. Did you have a good evening? Turn the sound down, will you, love? The babysitter's reply was drowned out by the din of the television. Tom walked into the lounge. Because he'd been driving, he had drunk very little and was now feeling in need of a stiff nightcap, except it would be wise to wait until he had dropped Mandy home. It was a good couple of miles to where she lived, stupid to risk it. On the screen, a teenage girl was standing in a rain-drenched alleyway, screaming as a shadow bore down on her. Mandy was sprawled out on the sofa, a teenage magazine open on the carpet, along with several sweet wrappers, an empty pizza carton and a Coke can. Engrossed in the movie, without taking her eyes from the screen, she hovered her left hand over the carpet, searching for the remote, but she was several inches off target. Just as the girl on the television screamed even louder, Tom knelt, grabbed the remote off the floor and muted the sound. Everything OK, Mandy? The teenager looked a little surprised by the sudden silence, yawned, then smiled. Yeah, fine, Mr Bryce. The children wasn't no trouble. Good as gold, both of them. I'm a bit worried about Lady, though. Why is that? Kelly asked. Sitting up and putting on her boots, Mandy replied, She doesn't seem herself. She normally comes and sits with me, but she didn't want to leave her basket tonight. Tom and Kelly both walked anxiously into the kitchen. Lady, curled in her basket, didn't even raise an eyelid. Kelly knelt down and stroked her head. Lady, darling, are you OK? Mandy followed them in. She drank quite a lot of water a while ago. She's probably got a bug, Tom said, glancing at half a congealed pizza lying on the work surface, along with a knife and fork and a tub of melted Tesco caramel crunch ice cream with the lid off. He knelt and stroked the Alsatian as well. Cocking his head at the dog, he asked, feeling very sleepy suddenly, You got a bug, lady? Feeling grots? Kelly stood up. Let's see if she's any better in the morning. If not, we'll have to call the vet. Tom gloomily saw a big bill coming, but it couldn't be helped. He loved the dog. She was a part of his family, part of his life. Good plan, he said. Kelly squared up with the babysitter, then told Tom she would drive Mandy home. It's OK, I'll do it, Tom said. I deprived myself of all those fine wines. I might as well drive her. I didn't drink much either, Kelly said. I'm fine. You've done enough driving tonight. Have a drink and relax. He didn't take much persuading. 
Tom poured himself two fingers of Armagnac, flopped down on the sofa and flicked the remote, changing from the horror film Mandy had been watching to a golden oldie show, Porridge, and watched Ronnie Barker in prison for a little while before changing again, this time to an American football game. He heard the front door close and the sound of the Audi starting up and felt a good, warm sensation as the first sip of his drink slid down his throat. Then he stared into the glass and swirled the dark liquid around pensively. He was wondering what the difference was between Philip Angelides and himself. What qualities had made Angelides such a financial success and himself such a failure? Was it luck? Genes? Ruthlessness? Outside, Kelly reversed into the street, then began to drive down the hill, making small talk with Mandy. Even if she had looked more carefully in her mirror, she would never have noticed the car that pulled out to follow her. It was more than a hundred yards behind and had no lights on. Chapter 41 Roy Grace, unsteady in his seat in the swaying taxi, stared at the display of his mobile phone, stared at the single letter X. He was having serious trouble focusing and, despite, or because of, his drunkenness, his emotions were in turmoil. Streetlights and headlights flashed past him. On the taxi's crackly radio, some caller on a late-night phone-in programme was talking furiously about Tony Blair and the National Health Service. He looked at his watch. Ten past one. How had the evening gone? He could still taste clear on his lips could smell her perfume in the cab on his clothes. God, she was lovely. He still had a hard-on. He had walked out of the bloody restaurant with a hard-on, and if she had invited him in, would he have? And he knew the answer. But she had not invited him in. He inhaled deeply, but this time all he got was the stale plastic smell of the cab's interior. Four hours bloody wait, me mum's sick with cancer, and they made her wait four hours with her head split open before anyone saw her, the man on the radio said bitterly. Disgusting, isn't it? the cab driver said. Totally, Gray said absently, concentrating on the keypad of his phone. Nice lady you had there, I think I recognised her. Got a feeling I've met her somewhere. Most people only get to meet her when they're dead. Is that right? the driver said, sounding bemused. An angel, is she? Exactly, Grace said distractedly, still concentrating on his phone. He tapped out XX, then sent it. When he reached home several minutes later, he was disappointed that he'd had no response. Chapter 42 Tom woke with a start, feeling muzzy and confused, with a roaring sound in his ears, unable to think for a moment where he was. Motorbikes were racing on the television screen in front of him. He realised, starting to think a bit more clearly, that was the noise. Looking around for the remote, he saw an empty brandy glass on the carpet at his feet, and then it hit him with a jolt. He had fallen asleep. What the hell was the time? The clock on the DVD read 4.10am. That couldn't be right. He looked at his watch. 4.09am. A cluster of motorbikes, all close together, were howling down a straight that he recognised as part of the Silverstone racetrack. He had been on a corporate hospitality day there a couple of years ago, and had also been to the British Grand Prix a few times. They were braking now, heeling over into cops. Finding the remote, he switched the television off and stood up slowly, feeling stiff as hell. Why hadn't Kelly woken him when she came in, he wondered. Carrying his empty glass, he tottered out into the hall, his head feeling muzzy still, his whole body leaden. He set the glass down in the kitchen, then somehow found the strength to haul himself upstairs. Creeping along the landing, trying not to wake anyone, although the motorbike racing had already probably done that, he opened the door to his bedroom. Instantly something felt wrong. The curtains were wide open and there was sufficient grey pre-dawn light to see that their bed was empty. No Kelly. And suddenly he was wide awake. 
Very occasionally, in the past, when one of the children had had a bad dream, she had crawled into their bed for a few hours. Wondering if she had done that now, he checked out each of their rooms in turn. But she wasn't there. Then, cursing his stupidity, he ran downstairs, opened the front door, and stared out at the carport. It was empty. To be doubly sure, he walked out to the pavement and looked up and down, in case for some reason she had parked the Audi in the street and had fallen asleep inside it. But there was no sign of the car. He looked at his watch again, trying to work out how long he had been asleep. What time had she taken the babysitter home? It had been about half past one. Two and a half hours ago. Two and a half hours to make a four mile round trip. An icy whirl of fear spiralled through him. But she had an accident. Wouldn't someone from the police have been in touch by now if that had happened? Was she having a long Kelly moment on her own out in the darkness somewhere? Surely she would have known he'd be fretting. But that was the thing, part of Kelly's problem. She did the most irrational things sometimes without thinking of the consequences. She had never actually done anything to endanger the kids, but she often just did not think. Like the time she had bought one of her endless bargains on eBay, a week at a Champneys health farm, at the same time as he was going to be away in Germany at a trade fair. She had totally forgotten to consider what would happen to the children. There had also been a couple of occasions when she had simply disappeared, once for a whole day, another time for over 24 hours. He had been in despair both times, ringing around every hospital in the south of England to see if she had been in an accident, wondering if she was having an affair. Then she had turned up, apparently unconcerned that he'd had to take the day off to look after the children, telling him that she had suddenly just felt she needed some space. He thought back to earlier when she had gone into one of her silent modes in the car. Is that what she was doing now? Having some space? Nice of her to tell him. He picked up the cordless phone in the bedroom and dialed her mobile number. Seconds later, he heard her demented, crazy frog ringtone coming from downstairs and hung up. She had left her phone behind. Terrific. He sat down on the bed, thinking... God, he loved her so much, despite her quirks. They had their differences, yet in many ways they were so comfortable together. He had loved watching her at the dinner table tonight. Yes, she was out of her social league in that viper's nest they both were, but she had coped. She had held her head up. She had looked beautiful. She had said nice things about him, building him and his business up to the people on either side of her. Then he thought about the envy he had detected in her voice tonight in the car driving back when he had asked her if she would like to live in a house as big as the Angelides. Yeah, why not? If I had all those servants. We will one day, I'm sure. I believe in you. He hadn't yet had the courage to break the news to her that they might soon have to sell this house and downsize. He didn't know how to. Didn't want to see the pain it would cause. And, most of all, he didn't want to seem a failure to her. Christ, where are you, my darling? He got up and paced around, his inside slippery with fear. It was twenty to five. He wondered whether to call Mandy Morrison's parents to ask if Kelly had brought her home safe. But if the girl was not home by now, her parents would have been on the phone, anxious. Still fully clothed, he lay back against the headboard, his brain buzzing, listening for a car coming up the street. Instead, all he heard were the first twitterings of birdsong. After a few minutes, despite the hour, he rang Mandy Morrison's home number. The phone was answered by her very sleepy father, who assured him Mandy had been dropped safely home at about quarter to two. He thanked him, then dialed directory inquiries and asked for the number of the Royal Sussex County Hospital. A few minutes later, he was through to a tired-sounding woman at accident and emergency. She assured him that no one of Kelly's name had been admitted in the past few hours. Next, he got the main number for Sussex Police from Director Inquiries again and rang that. But after being transferred to traffic, then put on hold for several minutes, he was told there had been no reported road traffic accidents involving his wife or their car. He didn't know what to do next. 
Chapter Forty Three. It was only Wendy Salter's second time on nights. The probationary WPC was three weeks out of police training college at Ashford in Kent, and had the best part of two years yet to serve before becoming a fully fledged officer like her colleague. PC Phil Taylor, a few weeks shy of thirty-seven, was at the wheel of the liveried police Vectra, driving fast, blues on. But on this empty road, there was no need for the siren. They were less than a mile from CID headquarters in Sussex House, and had driven almost the entire width of Brighton and Hove in the two minutes since they had picked up the emergency call from the control room. They had only just finished sorting out a drunken argument over a bill which had turned into a fight in the Escape nightclub just off Brighton Seafront. Going at high speed through the city gave Wendy a massive thrill. She couldn't help it. It was like being on the best funfair ride in the world, and a lot of officers felt the same. The expression on Taylor's face showed he was among them. It was four fifteen a.m., and looking up through the windscreen, Wendy could see a few cracks of grey dawn light appearing in the black canopy of the night sky. A terrified rabbit sprinted in the glow of the car's headlights across the road and vanished beneath the bonnet. She waited for the thud and was relieved when there was none. Bloody kamikaze bunny that was, Phil Taylor said cheerily. I think you missed it. I read somewhere that some blokes published a book of roadkill recipes in America. <laughs> Could only be in America, Wendy said. She had never actually been there and had an image of the country heavily influenced by all the crazies in California she had seen on television or read about, with a bit of Michael Moore thrown in for good measure. They were passing Woodland on their right, and a sweeping drop to their left down to the lights of Brighton and Hove. Then, rounding a sharp right-hand bend, they saw the red glow ahead of them. For a brief instant, Wendy thought it might be the sun starting to rise, but dismissed that when she worked out they were travelling almost due west. The glow intensified as they drew closer, and then suddenly she could smell it. The vile, acrid stench of burning paint, rubber, and vinyl. Taylor braked and pulled over a short distance from the blazing car, which was in a tarmac car park in a beauty spot with magnificent daytime views. But all WPC Wendy Salter could see as she unclipped herself and stepped out of the car, dutifully pulling on her hat, was dense, choking smoke as the strong breeze blew it straight towards them, making her eyes water. She turned away for a moment, coughing, then ran alongside her colleague as close as they could get to the vehicle before the heat stopped them. In the distance, she could hear the wail of a siren, probably the fire brigade. She thought, the stench of burning paint and rubber one hundred times stronger now, and the fierce crackling and roaring of the inferno filling her ears. She could see inside the car now, with most of the glass of the windows already burned out, and to her relief, it was empty. It was an estate, and walking round to the front, she recognised the radiator grill. An Audi, she called out to PC Taylor. It's a recent model. You can tell from the grill, he said. I know, the new A4. He gave her a glance. Bit of a petrol head, are you? He said with grudging admiration. Not as much as whoever did this, she retorted. Kids, he said as if it were a swear word. Little bastards torching someone's brand new wheels, joyriders, bound to be. He said, "Who else?" Chapter forty-four. Roy Grace woke at six thirty on Sunday morning to the beeping of his alarm clock, with a parched mouth and a blinding headache. Two paracetamol capsules he'd swallowed with a pint of water at about five in the morning had had about as much effect as the first couple he had downed a few hours earlier, which was not a lot. As he hit the snooze button, temporarily silencing the clock, the loud chirrup of a bird outside took over, incessant, like a stuck CD track. Light streamed in through a wide gap in the curtains, which he realised he had not closed properly. How drunk was I last night? Assembling his thoughts, his brain sluggish, feeling like someone had spent all night pulling wires out of it at random, he reached out for his mobile phone, but there was no further text from Cleo. He could hardly expect there to be one, 
as it was only half six in the morning and she was probably sound asleep, but logic wasn't a major feature of his thinking just at the moment, with the pounding inside his head and the damned bird and the knowledge that he had to get up and face a full day's work. No chance of a Sunday line today, boyo. He closed his eyes, thinking back. God, Cleo was lovely in every way. A really warm, gorgeous human being. She was very, very special, and they had got on so incredibly well. Then he thought back to the kiss in the back of the taxi. A long, long, amazing kiss. And he tried to remember who had started it. It was Cleo, he seemed to recall. She had made the first move. He felt a pang of longing to speak to her, to see her. Suddenly, he thought he could smell her perfume, just the lightest trace on his hand. He brought it to his nose, and yes, it was strongest on his wrist. It must have come from when he had sat in the cab with his arm around her. He held his wrist against his nose for a long time, breathing in the musky scent, something stirring deep in his heart that he had thought, until these past few days, was long dead. Then he felt a twinge of guilt. Sandy. But he ignored it, shut it out of his mind, determined not to go there, not to let it spoil this moment. He looked at the clock again to double-check the time, his brain turning reluctantly to work. To the 8.30am briefing. Then he remembered he needed to collect his car. If he got up now, he worked out, he would just have time to run to the underground car park where he had left the Alpha last night. The fresh air might help his head. Except that his body was telling him it did not need a run. It needed about eight hours more sleep. He squeezed his eyes shut, trying to crush the pain like cheese wire cutting through his skull and to ignore that sodding bird which he could happily have shot if he'd had a gun and drifted for a few delicious moments back into thoughts about Cleo Mori. It seemed barely a few seconds before the alarm started beeping again. Reluctantly, he hauled himself out of bed, opened the curtains the rest of the way and padded naked into the bathroom to brush his teeth. The face that stared back at him out of the mirror over the basin wasn't a pleasant sight. Roy Grace had never been a vain man, but had until recently considered himself still young or youngish, not handsome but OK looking, with his best feature being his blue eyes. His Paul Newman eyes, Sandy used to tell him. And his worst, his small but very broken nose. Now, increasingly, the face he stared at early in the morning seemed to belong to some much older guy, a complete stranger with a wrinkled forehead, slackening jowls and bags the size of oyster shells beneath his eyes. It wasn't the beer or the fags or the fast food diet or the crazy work schedule that got you in the end. It was gravity, he decided. Gravity made you a little bit shorter every day. It slackened your skin a little more, pulling it relentlessly downward. Half your waking life was a struggle against gravity, but it always got you. It would be gravity that banged the lid down on top of you in your coffin. And if you had your ashes scattered to the winds, gravity would eventually bring them back down, every single bit of them. He worried about his thoughts sometimes, which were becoming increasingly morbid of late. Maybe his sister was right. Maybe he was spending too much time alone. But after all this time, he was used to solitude. It was what he knew as normality. It wasn't the kind of life he'd planned, nor the kind he'd ever remotely imagined he would be living 17 years back when he had proposed to Sandy on a warm September day on the end of the Palace Pier, telling her that he'd taken her there because if she had said no, he would have jumped off. She had smiled that beautiful, warm smile, tossed her blonde hair from her eyes and told him with her typical gallows humour, that she'd have considered it a much stronger test of their love if he had taken her to Beachy Head. He downed a glass of tap water, screwing up his face at the taste of the fluoride, which seemed heavier than usual this morning. Drink more plain water, his fitness instructor Ian at the police gym told him repeatedly. He was trying, but the stuff just didn't taste as good as a Starbucks latte, or a Glenfiddich on the rocks, or just about anything else. 
He hadn't really worried about his appearance until now, until Cleo. These years since Sandy's disappearance had taken a heavy toll on him. Police work was hard, but at least most coppers had someone to go home to at the end of their shift and talk to. And Marlon, although company of sorts, just didn't do it for him. He put on his jogging kit, gave Marlon some breakfast in case he forgot later, and eased himself out of the front door into the deserted street. It was a deliciously cool summer morning, with a clear sky holding all the promise of the day being a corker. And suddenly, despite his hangover and lack of sleep, he felt energised. With his heart humming, he set off down the street at a brisk pace. Roy Grace lived in Hove, a residential district that had until recent years been a separate town to Brighton, although joined at the hip. Now both came under the joint umbrella of the city of Brighton and Hove. The Greek, from which the name Hove came, or Hove actually, as it had been nicknamed, was rumoured to translate as burial ground. This was not entirely inappropriate, as Hove was the quieter, more residential sister to the once brash, racy Brighton. The border began on the seafront, at a spot marked by a war memorial obelisk and a coloured line across the promenade, but after that became increasingly obscure, with many people along its zigzag pathway north finding it ran through their houses. Grace's own modest three-bedroom semi was in a street that went directly down to the Kingsway, the wide dual carriageway on the far side of which was the seafront. He crossed over, then ran across the dewy grass of the lawns, past the children's playground and the two boating ponds of Hove Lagoon, where his dad, who enjoyed building model motorboats, used to take him as a child and let him hold the remote controls. The lagoon had seemed such a huge place to him then, now it looked so small and run down. There was a worn-out looking roundabout, a rusting swing, a slide in need of paint, and the same ice cream kiosk that had always been there. The boats were still locked away for the night, and several ducks drifted on the smaller of the two ponds while a group of swans sat on the edge of the larger one. He skirted the ponds and hit the promenade, just as deserted as it had been at this hour yesterday, and passed along a long row of blue bathing huts. As he ran, the landscape on his left changed. At first there was a row of drab post-war blocks of flats and a stretch of equally uninteresting houses. Then, after the King Alfred Leisure Centre, at the moment a major construction site, the view on his left turned into the one he loved. The long esplanade of grand terraced Regency townhouses, mostly painted white, many with bow windows, railings and grand porches. A lot of them had once been single dwellings, weekend homes for rich Regency and Victorian Londoners, but now, like most of the buildings in this city with its sky-high property prices, they had been carved up into flats or converted into hotels. A few minutes later... Approaching the boundary between Brighton and Hove, he could see, ahead of him to the right, the sad, rusting spars rising from the sea which were all that remained of the West Pier. It had once been as lively and garish as its counterpart, the Palace Pier, exactly half a mile further east, and visiting it had been one of the constant highlights of his childhood. His dad who was a keen fisherman, had taken him to the palace pier often, walking down to the exposed fishing platform at the far end, from where, on a Saturday afternoon, out of the football season, or when the Albion was playing away, they could come home with a good haul of whiting, bream, place, and, if they were lucky, the occasional sole or even bass, depending on the tide and weather. But it wasn't the fishing that had been the big lure of the pier for Roy as a child. It was the other attractions, particularly the bumper cars and the ghost train, and most of all, the old wooden glass-fronted slot machines that contained moving tableau. He had one favourite and was forever cajoling his father into giving him more pennies for the slot. It was a haunted house, and for a full minute, as gears cranked and pulleys whined, doors would fly open, lights would go on and off, and all kinds of skeletons and ghosts would appear as well as death itself, a hooded figure all in black holding a scythe. 
Coming up on his left now, and his energy was starting to sag a little, was the hideous monstrosity of the King's West building, a grim 1960s leisure structure totally out of keeping with the rest of the seafront. A few hundred yards further on, and the handsome facade of the old ship hotel loomed. He sprinted up the steps onto the upper promenade, crossed the almost deserted road, kept up his pace along the side of the hotel, and then entered the car park and glanced at his watch. Shit! He realised he had badly miscalculated. If he was going to make the 8.30am briefing on time, and it was vital to his team's morale that he did, he had less than half an hour to get home, change and be out of the door. He also now had a raging thirst, but there was no time to even think about stopping and grabbing a bottle of water from somewhere. He inserted his ticket in the machine, followed by his credit card, then hurried down the concrete staircase to the level he had left his car on, crinkling his nose at the smell of urine, wondering why it was that someone had pissed in the stairwell of every single car park he had ever been into in his life. Chapter 45 at 8.29am, with just a minute to spare, Grace approached MIR1, eating his breakfast, a Mars bar from a vending machine, and clutching a scalding cup of coffee. He hurriedly finished his Mars and popped a stick of mint chewing gum into his mouth to mask any residual alcohol from last night. Putting the rest of the packet back into his pocket, he was about to enter the room when he heard footsteps behind him. Yo, old timer, so how was the date? He turned to see Glenn Branson, in a leather jacket as glossy as a mirror, holding a cappuccino. He had a rim of its froth like a white moustache around his mouth. Fine, he replied. Fine, that's all? Just fine? His eyes searched Grace's mischievously. Grace chewed on the gum and gave a coy smile. Well, probably a bit better than fine, I think. You don't know? I'm trying to remember. I drank too much. Did you get laid? It wasn't that kind of date. Branson looked at him strangely. Man, you are weird sometimes. I thought that was the purpose of dates. Then he broke into a broad grin. I want a blow-by-blow -blow account later. Did she admire your gear? Grace glanced at his watch, conscious it was now past 8.30. All she said was that my tailor must have a terrific sense of humour. He pushed the door open and entered the room, with Branson following. She didn't say that! Are you serious, old-timer? Hey, come on! The whole team was seated around the workstation, all dressed casually, except for Norman Potting, who appeared to be in his Sunday best, attired in a crisply pressed beige suit with a brightly coloured tie, and an even brighter handkerchief sprouting jauntily from his breast pocket. Grace was dressed casually today also, partly because it was Sunday, partly because he was so damn tired he hadn't felt like putting a suit on, but mainly because he had a date. It was with a very special young lady. His goddaughter, Jay Summers, and he did not want to look like a boring old fart by wearing a suit. So he had put on some of the new kit he had bought yesterday, a white T-shirt, jeans that were too tight in the crotch but which Glenn Branson had assured him looked well cool, lace-up shoes that looked like football boots without studs, also apparently well cool, and a lightweight cotton jacket. Jay Summers's parents, Michael and Victoria, were both police officers and had been two of his and Sandy's closest friends, as well as being hugely supportive in those difficult months immediately following Sandy's disappearance and they had stayed just as supportive during the years that followed. With their four children, aged two to eleven, they had become at one time almost a second family to him. He had taken Jay out the previous Sunday, intending to visit Chessington Zoo, because she had a thing about wanting to see a giraffe. But their outing had been cut short within half an hour when he had been called to attend the scene of a murder. He had promised to take her out this Sunday instead. He liked Jay a lot. She was the kind of daughter he would have loved to have had. Extremely intelligent, pretty, interested in all and everything and wise for her years. He hoped he was not going to have to disappoint her a second time. Apart from anything else, it would not give her a great deal of confidence in the reliability of adults. 
The first item on his agenda was Reginald Diaf, the sex offender whose computer had been seized. Grace reported that D.S. Rye at the High Tech Crime Unit had discovered there were identical routings on this computer to the ones found on the computer belonging to Tom Bryce. These routings might have taken Bryce to the website where, Branson believed after questioning the man exhaustively, it seemed likely he really had witnessed the murder. Grace told the team he was expecting a call by 10am from someone from the Witness Protection Scheme with Diath's address. He delegated Norman and Nick to come with him to interview the man. For some reason he couldn't explain, he had a bad feeling about this interview and thought that a show of strength might be needed. Nick Nickel reported he had continued the sweep of all the bars, pubs and clubs in Brighton late into the night with the photograph of Janie Stretton, but had still drawn a blank. Norman reported on his trawl through the clients of the escort agency, BCE 247. So far, he told them, it had not yielded any client who admitted to knowing Janie and none who fitted the identity of the one called Anton. But, he said, I have discovered something from another escort agency. It would appear Ms Stretton was registered with both of them. He held up a different, even raunchier photograph of Janie Stretton to the one Grace had seen in the BCE 247 office. It showed her stark naked, apart from tassels on her nipples, thigh-high patent leather black boots and studded leather wrist cuffs, one hand on her hip, the other brandishing a cat of nine tails. Grace was surprised at this sudden efficiency. Maybe he had misjudged Potting. Where'd you get this? From the internet, Potting said. I did a search of all the girls on offer in the local agencies and recognised her face. Grace had imagined the net might be too much for an old-school detective like Potting to get his head around as a research tool. I'm impressed, Norman, he said, quietly wondering whether Potting's trawl through the agency girls had been purely research for this case. Blushing a little, the detective sergeant said, Well, thank you, Roy. There's life in the old dog yet, eh? He directed a lecherous wink at Emma Jane, who responded by looking down at her paperwork. Great pair on her, Potting said, passing the photograph on to D.S. Nichols seated next to him, who studiously ignored the comment. Apart from their workstation, MIR1 had been almost completely empty when Grace arrived, but more people were coming in every few minutes, filling up the other two stations. Crime was no respecter of weekends. It would be business as usual for all the major incident teams. Emma Jane reported on the overnight task she had been given by Grace. She had contacted every minicab firm in the Bromley area in search of the driver of the cab who had picked up a box of scarab beetles from Eridge and Robinson. But so far she had had no luck. They were interrupted by a loud burst of rap music. It was the new ringtone on Branson's mobile. Looking up apologetically, he said, Sorry, my kid did that. Then he answered with a curt, D.S. Branson. A moment later, holding the phone to his ear, Branson stepped away from the workstation. Mr. Bryce, Grace heard him say, what can I do for you? Branson was quiet for some moments, listening. Then he said, I'm sorry, it's not a good line. Your wife, did you say? She didn't come home last night. Still hasn't. Can you give me a description of the car she was driving? Branson came back to the workstation, sat down and began writing on his notepad. All right, sir, I'll check with traffic. An Audi A4 Estate Sport. I'll call you back. On this number? As he hung up, Nick Nickel said, An Audi Estate, you say? Yeah, why? Nickel typed on his keyboard, then leaned forward, scrolling up through the crime log on the vantage screen. Yes, he said. I thought so. Grace looked at him quizzically. Half past four this morning, Nickel said, still staring at the screen. An Audi estate was found torched up on Ditchling Beacon. The plates were burned off. Branson looked at him, his face a picture of deep unease. Chapter 46 Jessica, in her pink dressing gown, squatted on the kitchen floor, stroking an extremely drowsy lady. 
Max, standing above his sister in a Harry Potter T-shirt which he had on the wrong way round, said very seriously, as if he were a leading authority in such matters, "'It's Sunday. I think she's having a Sunday lie-in.' Then for a few moments he turned his attention to a cartoon on the television. "'She's not going to die, is she, Daddy?' Jessica asked. Tom, who had not slept a wink, unshaven, his hair a mess, barefoot in a T-shirt and jeans, knelt and put his arm around his daughter. "'No, darling,' he said, his voice shaky. "'She's just a little bit sick. "'She's got a bug or something. "'We'll see how she is in an hour or two. "'If she doesn't seem better, we'll call the vet.' He had phoned Kelly's parents, all her close friends and all his, just in case she had gone to one of them for the night. He had even phoned her sister Martha, who lived in Scotland. No one had seen her or heard from her. He didn't know who else to phone or what to do. Jessica laid her face against ladies and kissed her. I love you, lady. We're going to make you better. There was no response from the dog. Max knelt down also and laid his face against the Alsatian's midriff. We all love you, lady. You'll have to get up soon, otherwise you'll miss breakfast. None of them had had any breakfast, Tom realised suddenly. It was half past nine. When Mummy comes back, she'll know how to make her better, Jessica declared. Yes, of course she will, Tom said flatly. You guys must be hungry. What would you like? French toast? Kelly always made the kids French toast on Sundays. You don't make it very well, Max said. You always burn it. He stood up picked up the remote and began surfing the channels. I could try not to burn it. Why can't Mummy make it? She will do, he said, struggling. I could make you some to keep you going until she gets back. Not hungry, Max said grumpily. You want some cereal? You always burn it, Daddy, Jessica said, echoing her brother. Can we go to the beach today, Daddy? Max asked. Mummy said we could if it was nice, and I think it is nice, don't you? Tom stared leadenly through the window. It looked glorious. Blue sky, all the promise of a fine early summer's day. We'll see. Max's face fell. Oh, she promised. Did she? Yes. Well, we'll ask her when she comes home what she'd like to do today, shall we? She'll probably just want to drink vodka, Jessica said without looking up. Tom wasn't sure if he had heard correctly. What did you say, darling? Jessica continued stroking the dog. Jessica, what was that you said? I saw her. You saw Mummy doing what? I said I wouldn't tell. Tom frowned. You wouldn't tell what? Nothing, she said sweetly. The doorbell rang. Max ran out into the hallway, shouting excitedly, Mummy, Mummy, Mummy's home! Jessica sprang to her feet and followed her brother. Tom was right behind them. Max pulled the front door open, then stared up in glum surprise at the tall black man in the shiny leather jacket and blue chinos who was standing there. Jessica stopped in her tracks. Tom didn't like the expression on the detective's face one bit. Glenn Branson knelt down to bring his face to the same level as Jessica's. Hello, he said. She fled back towards the kitchen. Max stood his ground, staring at the man. Detective Sergeant Branson, Tom said, a little surprised to see him. Could I have a word with you? Yes, of course. Tom gestured for him to come in. Branson looked at Max. How you doing? Lady won't wake up, the little boy said. Lady? Our dog, Tom explained. I think she has a bug. I see. Max lingered. Why don't you get some cereal for you and Jessica, Tom suggested. Reluctantly, Max turned and trotted back into the kitchen. Tom closed the front door behind the detective. Do you have some news? He was still puzzled by Jessica's remark about the vodka. What did his daughter mean? 
Talking quietly, Glenn Branson said, We've found the Audi estate you said your wife was driving. It was burned out, torched, probably by vandals, up on Ditchling Beacon earlier this morning. We did a check on the chassis number. It's registered in your name. Tom stared at him, open-mouthed, in shock. Burned out? I'm afraid so, yes. My wife? Tom started shaking uncontrollably. There was no one in it. Happens all the time at weekends. Cars get nicked by joyriders, then they set light to them, either for fun or to get rid of their prints, usually both. It took some moments for it to sink in properly. She was driving the babysitter home, he said. How the hell could it have been nicked by joyriders? The detective sergeant had no answer. This ends Disc 7. Looking Good Dead. Disc 8. Chapter 47. The city of Brighton and Hove had so many different faces, Grace thought, and so many diverse people. It seemed that some cities were divided into different ethnic communities, but here in Brighton and Hove, it was more like different sociological communities. There were the genteel elderly in their mansion blocks or sheltered housing, who on summer days could be seen watching the cricket at the county ground or playing bowls on the Hove lawns, or sitting in chairs on the promenade and the beaches in summer, and, if they had the funds, wintering in Spain or the Canaries. And the poorer elderly, shivering out the winter and half the summer, imprisoned in their damp, dank council flats. There were the in-your-face wealthy middle classes with their smart, detached houses in Hove 4, and the more discreet in the handsome seafront mansion blocks and the more modestly off, like Grace, in homes spread out to the west to the suburb of Southwick, directly behind the commercial port of Shoreham Harbour, and in pockets all over the city and stretching well out to the Downs. Much of the colour and vibrancy of Brighton and Hove came from the very visible and often brash gay community, and the wall-to-wall -wall students from Sussex and Brighton universities and the plethora of other colleges who had colonised whole areas of the city. There were the visible criminals, the drug dealers lurking on the scruffier street corners who would melt into the shadows at the smell of a police car. And the less visible ones, the rich ones at the top of their game who lived behind high walls in the swanky houses of Dyke Road Avenue and its tree-lined tributaries. Council estates fringed the city. The two biggest, Mouscombe and Whitehawk, had long had reputations for crime and violence, but in Grace's view, these were not particularly deserved. There were crime and violence all over the city, and it made people feel comfortable to point a finger at these estates as if there was an altogether different species of Homo sapiens living there instead of mostly decent folk who didn't have enough money to buy themselves smugness. And there was the sad underclass. Despite regular attempts to remove them from the streets, the moment the weather warmed up, the winos and the homeless drifted back to the shop fronts, porches, pavements and bus shelters. This was bad for tourism, and even worse for the city's conscience. From the start of the festival in May and the arrival of spring, tables and chairs appeared outside every café, bar and restaurant, and the streets of the city came alive. Some of those days, Grace thought, you could almost imagine you were on the Mediterranean. Then a weather front would move in off the channel, a howling southwesterly, accompanied by punishing rain that would drum on the empty tables and lash the windows of boutiques filled with mannequins in beachwear, as if mocking anyone who dared to pretend that England ever actually had a summer. The beating downtown heart of the city, through which they were travelling now, was concentrated in a square mile or so either side of the Palace Pier. There were the tightly packed Regency terraces of Kemptown, in one of which Janie Stretton had lived. The lanes, where the antique dealers were centred, and the North Lanes district, filled with small, trendy shops and tiny townhouses, 
among which was the converted factory building where Cleo Mori had her flat. Nick Nickel drove the unmarked Ford Mondeo. Grace sat in the front passenger seat, busily making notes on his Blackberry. Norman Potting was in the back. They were driving down the London Road in the centre of Brighton. At most times of the day or night, they would have been crawling along in dense traffic, but early on this Sunday morning, apart from a couple of buses, they virtually had the road to themselves. Grace checked his watch. Hopefully, this interview with Reggie Diath would not take long, and he could squeeze a couple of hours out of the day for his goddaughter. Enough to take her to lunch, if not to the giraffes today. They were passing the Royal Pavilion, the city's most distinctive landmark on their right. None of the three men looked at it. It was one of those places that was so familiar it had become all but invisible to them. The turreted and minareted building in the style of an Indian palace was commissioned by George IV when Prince of Wales as a seaside shag palace for his mistress Maria Fitzherbert in the late 18th century. And as seaside shag palaces go, nothing quite so grand had probably been built anywhere in the world ever since. They stopped at the roundabout at the intersection with the seafront, with the palace pier garish even early on a Sunday morning opposite them. A leggy blonde in a skirt that barely covered her buttocks crossed in front of them unhurriedly, throwing them a flirty glance and jauntily swinging a bag. Potting, who had been quiet for some minutes, murmured, Come on, doll. Bend over. Show us your growler. There was a gap in the traffic, and Nick Nickel turned left. She's all right, she is, Potting said, turning to watch her out of the rear window. Except she is a he, Nick Nickel corrected him. Bollocks, Potting said. Yes, exactly, the DS retorted. They drove along Marine Parade past the debris of broken glass and food cartons outside a nightclub, the uber-trendy Van Allen apartment building, then the black-and-white flinted Regency facades that fronted the imposing crescent of Sussex Square, where, Glen Branson had told Grace a thousand times, Laurence Olivier had once had a home. "'You're talking through your asshole," Potting replied. "'She was gorgeous!' "'Big Adam's apple,' the DS said, "'as a hotel.' Fuck me, Potting said. I'm sure he would have done if you'd asked nicely. Shouldn't be allowed out on the streets looking like that, bloody fudge packer. You are so gross, Norman, Grace said, turning round. You are quite offensive, you know. Well, I'm sorry, Roy, but I find puffs offensive, Potting said. Never understood them, never will. Yeah, well, Brighton happens to be the gay capital of the UK. Grace said, really irritated with the man. If you have a problem with that, you're either in the wrong job or the wrong city. And you're a complete fucking prat and I wish you weren't in my car or in my life, he would have liked to have added, digging in his pocket for some more paracetamol. On their left, they passed terrace after terrace of imposing white Regency houses. On their right were the sails of a dozen yachts fresh out of the marina on a Sunday race. So, this bloke we're going to have a chat with, Potting said. Reginald D. Ath. Is he one of them too? No, Nick Nickel said. He isn't. He just likes girls, as long as they're not older than about four. Oh, that's something I really can't understand, Norman Potting said. Popping a pill from the foil pack, Grace thought grimly, Great, at last we've found something in common. They drove up a steep hill at the back of Rottingdean, alongside a prep school playing field with cricket pitch marked out in the centre and two large white screens on rollers with pleasant detached houses opposite. Then they turned into a street with bungalows on either side. It was the kind of quiet area where anything out of the ordinary would stand out, as the bright yellow neighbourhood watch stickers prominently displayed in each front window warned. A good choice of location for a safe house, Grace thought, except for one minor detail that appeared to have been overlooked. Who in their right bloody mind would put a paedophile in a house a few hundred yards away from a school playing field? He shook his head. 
Didn't anybody ever think? Is Mr. Diath expecting us? Nickel asked. With morning coffee and a box of under eights, I expect, Norman Potting said, following this with a throaty chuckle. Ignoring the terrible joke, Grace replied, The woman I spoke to from the Witness Protection Agency said they'd left a message for him. They pulled up outside number 29. The 1950s bungalow looked a little more tired than the others in the street, its brown pebble dash rendering in need of repair and repainting considerably overdue. The small front garden was in poor shape also, reminding Grace that he needed to mow his own lawn sometime this weekend, and today was a perfect day for it. But when would he get the chance? He told Norman Potting to wait in the street in case Reginald Diath hadn't got the message they were coming and tried to do a runner. Then, accompanied by DC Nickel, he walked up to the front door. It bothered him that the curtains of the front room were still drawn at a quarter to eleven on a Sunday morning. But maybe Mr Diath was a late riser. He pressed the plastic bell push. Dinky chimes rang out inside the house. Then silence. He waited some moments, then rang again. Still no response. Pushing open the letterbox, he knelt and called out through it, Hello, Mr Diath? It's Detective Superintendent Grace of Brighton CID. Still no response. Followed by Nickel, he walked around the side of the house, edging through the narrow gap past the dustbins and pushed open a high wooden gate. The rear garden was in a much worse state than the front, the lawn weedy and badly overgrown, and the borders a sad riot of bindweed and nettles. He stepped over an upturned plastic watering can then reached a kitchen door with frosted glass panels, one of which was smashed. Shards of glass lay on the brick path. He shot a glance at Nick Nickel, whose dubious frown echoed his own concern. He tried the handle, and it opened without resistance. They entered a time-warp kitchen, with an ancient lek fridge, drab fake wood units and formica work surfaces on which sat a clapped-out looking toaster and a plastic jug kettle. The remains of a meal sat on a dreary little table, a plate of half-eaten and very congealed eggs and beans and a half-drunk mug of tea, and a magazine, opened at a double-page spread of naked children, was propped against a serving bowl. Jesus, Grace commented, disgusted by the magazine. Then he dunked a finger into the tea. It was stone cold. He wiped it on a kitchen towel hanging on a rack, then called out, Hello, Reginald D.F. This is Sussex Police. You're safe to come out. We're just here to talk to you. We need you to help us in an inquiry. Silence. It was a silence Grace did not like, a silence that crawled all over his skin. There was also a smell he did not like. Not the smell of the stale, tired old kitchen, but a more astringent smell which he knew but could not place, except something in his memory was telling him it definitely did not belong in a house. He needed Diath so badly. He was desperate to talk to him about what he had been looking at on his computer. He knew from John Rye that Reggie Diath had followed the same links as Tom Bryce and he had no doubt the paedophile would have information about what Tom Bryce had seen. It was the best lead they had so far in the Janie Stretton murder inquiry. And, as he couldn't stop thinking, it wasn't just about driving the inquiry forward. It was about rescuing his career. He bloody well had to succeed in this inquiry. He nodded for Nick Nickel to start looking around the rest of the house. The detective constable left the kitchen and Grace followed him into a small sitting room where the smell was even stronger. In here there was a cheap-looking three-piece suite, an old television, a couple of very badly framed Turner prints on the walls and one solitary framed photograph on a mantelpiece above a fireplace containing an electric fake coal fire. Grace stared at the stiffly posed couple in the photograph a weak-looking, baby-faced man in his thirties with thinning hair, dressed in a grey suit, a gaudy tie and a shirt-collar riding too high, his arm around a hard-bitten blonde 
outside the entrance of what looked like a register office. Then he heard a shout. Roy! Jesus! Startled, he ran out of the room and saw the DC a short distance down the corridor, hand over his face, coughing in an open doorway. As he reached him, the sour, acrid smell caught the back of his throat. He held his breath and stepped past the DC into an avocado coloured bathroom and came face to face with Reggie Diath through the choking haze. Or at least, what was left of the man. Chapter 48 And now Grace knew exactly what the smell was. A sick little ditty his science master had taught everyone at school sprang into his mind. Alas, here lies poor Joe. Alas, he breathes no more. For what he thought was H2O was H2SO4. Grace's eyes were stinging and his face was smarting. It was dangerous to stay in the room for more than a few seconds, but that was enough to see all he needed. Reggie Diath was lying up to his neck in a bathtub, immersed in liquid that looked as clear as water, but it was sulfuric acid. It had already consumed almost all of the skin, muscle and internal organs below his neck, leaving a clean, partly dissolved skeleton, around which a few pale sinewy tendrils still attached, were shrinking as he watched. A metal ligature around his neck was attached to a towel rail above him. The corrosive fumes were working on Diath's face, blistering the skin into livid pustules. Grace backed quickly out of the room, colliding with Nickel. The two men stared at each other in stunned silence. I need air, Grace gasped, heading unsteadily to the front door and out into the garden. Nickel followed him. Everything all right? Norman Potting asked, leaning against the car, puffing on his pipe. Not exactly, Grace said, feeling very queasy so disturbed he was unable to think clearly for some moments. He took several long, deep gulps of fresh air. A man a short distance up the street was washing his car. Close by was the grind, grind, grind whirr of a hand-pushed lawnmower. Nickel began a series of deep, hacking coughs. Grace pulled his recently issued new phone out of his pocket and looked down at the buttons. He had practised with it a few times but never actually used the camera function before. Holding his handkerchief over his nose, he went back into the house, along to the bathroom, took a deep breath outside the door, entered and took several photographs in quick succession. Then he went back out of the room. Nick Nickel was standing there. You OK, Chief? Never better, Grace spluttered, gulping down air. Then he pocketed his camera not relishing what he had to do next. He took another deep breath, dived into the bathroom, grabbed a large towel off a rail, wrapped it around Reggie Diath's head and yanked hard. After several brutal tugs, the head, along with a length of spinal cord, came free from the ligature. Surprised at how heavy it was and still holding his breath, Grace carried it out of the bathroom and laid it down on the hall floor. The young detective constable took one look at the sight, keeled over, crashing into a wall and threw up. Grace, remembering something from his first aid training, ran to the kitchen, found a bowl in a cupboard, filled it with cold water, then hurried back and emptied it over Diath's face, trying to wash away the acid. If there was any forensic evidence there, it might be saved, and in any case, it would help with identification. The smell of the DC's vomit made him gag, and as he ran back for a refill, he narrowly avoided throwing up himself. Then he went back into the kitchen and radioed for a support team. He requested SOCO officers, a scene guard, and some officers to do an immediate house-to-house. -house. While he was speaking, he noticed a cordless phone lying underneath the vile magazine Diath had apparently been reading with his meal. As soon as he had finished... He carefully picked up the phone using his handkerchief, then brought it to his ear and pressed the redial button. A local number appeared on the display, then the phone rang. It was answered after just two rings by an almost obsequiously polite male voice. Good morning, Dobsons. May I help you? This is Detective Superintendent Grace from Brighton CID. 
I believe a Mr. Reginald D. Ath called you recently. Can you tell me your connection with him? I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Politeness said. That name doesn't sound familiar. Maybe one of my colleagues spoke to him. So,、uh, who exactly are you? Grace asked. We are funeral directors. Grace thanked the man, hung up, and dialed 1471. Moments later, he heard an automated voice. I'm sorry, the caller withheld their number. He hung up. Diath's last call had been to a funeral director's, who had no record of it. Had the phone been left like that as a sick joke by his killers? Deep in thought, he went out and invited Norman Potting into the house. It seemed mean to leave him outside in the glorious sunshine enjoying his pipe all on his own. It was just under an hour before the first scenes of crime officers arrived, including a very disgruntled Joe Tyndall. The man was becoming an increasingly disenchanted Roy Gray's fan. Making this a regular Sunday habit, are you, Roy? I used to have a life too, Gray snapped back, suffering a sense of humour failure. Tyndall shook his head. Only fifteen years, eight months, seven days to my retirement and counting, he said, and I'm ticking off every bloody second. Grace led him into the house and along the passageway towards the bathroom, and the sight that greeted him really did not improve Joe Tyndall's day one bit. Leaving the soco officer, Grace went back outside, ducked under the police tape now securing the outside of the house, and eased his way politely through the fast-growing gaggle of curious neighbours, realising that for over one whole hour he had not thought about Cleo Morey. Half a dozen police cars were now in the street, and the major incident vehicle was reversing into a space. Two uniformed community support officers were knocking on the front door of the next door neighbour, starting their house to house inquiries. He walked a short distance up the street, out of earshot, and first dialed the Summers and apologised to Jay that he was going to have to cancel again. The disappointment in her voice made him feel terrible. They would go next week instead, he promised her, but she didn't sound much like she believed him. Then he dialed Cleo's number. All he got was her voicemail. Hi, he said. Just calling to say. It was great to see you last night. Give me a call when you've got a moment. Oh, and I hope you're not on call today, for your sake. I have a seriously unpleasant cadaver on my hands. His headache, hangover, whatever, was back with a vengeance, and his throat felt as if it had been sandpapered. Feeling low as he walked back to the house, he went over to Nickel and Potting, who were standing outside chatting to the constable on guard. Either of you feel like a drink, because I fucking well need one. So long as it's not Mister Diath's bath water, Potting said. Grace almost smiled. Chapter Forty Nine. Kelly tried to move, but the pain in her arms worsened each time she struggled. The string or wire or whatever had been tied around them, cutting deeper and deeper into her flesh. And when she tried to shout, the deep sound made her whole face vibrate and stayed trapped in her mouth.、Mm-hmm. She could see nothing, could not open her eyes. There was total bitumen blackness beyond the images inside her head. She could hear nothing, except for the sound of her blood roaring in her ears, the sound of her own fear. Shaking in terror and from cold. And from lack of alcohol, her throat was parched. She needed a drink, desperately, desperately needed a gulp of vodka and water. Her crotch was cold and itchy. A while ago, when she had finally let go of the urine she could no longer contain, it had felt strangely comfortably warm for several minutes, until it had started to turn cold. Occasionally, she could smell it. Then it would just be the musty, chilly cellar smell again. She had no idea what the time was, nor where she was. Her head pounded. 
Cold, sick fear swirled in the deep black well of her insides, swirled in the blood inside her veins. She was so scared it was impossible to think clearly. Just occasionally, she thought she could hear the very faint sound of traffic, an occasional siren coming to rescue her. But she had no idea where she was. Tears welled in her sealed eyes. She wanted Tom. She wanted Jessica and Max. Wanted to hear all their voices, feel their arms around her. She tried to remember those moments, those confused, all speeded up moments. She had driven Mandy Morrison home, pulled up outside her parents' modern Spanish-style house in Swanky Tongdean Lane, a steep hill near the Withdean Sports Stadium. She sat in the car, music playing on the radio, waiting to see that Mandy had let herself safely in the front door before driving on. Mandy had opened the door, gone inside, turned and waved, and closed the door. Then. The passenger door of her car had opened, and the rear door behind her. A hand as strong as steel had pulled her neck back. Then something wet and acrid was being held against her nose. She whimpered at the memory. Then she was here, shaking uncontrollably on her back on a rock-hard floor. She struggled, trying to move her arms again, but the pain became unbearable. She tried to move her legs, but they felt cemented together. Her breathing was getting faster, her chest tightening. She felt light pouring onto her. The darkness behind her eyelids became a red haze. Then she emitted a muffled bellow of pain as tape was ripped away from her eyes, taking what felt like half her skin, and she blinked, momentarily dazzled by the light. A squat man with a smug grin and wavy silver hair pulled back into a small pigtail, grossly overweight in a baggy shirt open to the navel, was standing over her. At first, she felt relief. She thought this man had come to help her. She tried to speak to him, but all she could make was a gurgling sound. He stared back at her without speaking, eyeing her up and down with an expression of deep thoughtfulness. Then, finally, he smiled at her, and her heart leapt. He had come to help her. He was going to get her out of here, take her home to Tom and Jessica and Max. Suddenly, his tongue slipped out of his lips and gave a quick flick, like a snake swiping all the way round them, moistening them. Then he said in an American accent, "You look like a woman who takes it up the ass." He put his hand in his pocket, and Kelly heard the clink of metal. As fear squeezed her, crushing every cell in her body, she saw a delicate silver chain swing from his fingers. "I've brought you a present, Kelly," he said in a voice that told her he was her new best friend. He held it up in front of her face. There was a small pendant hanging from the chain, and in the poor light, she couldn't quite make out the design engraved on it. It looked like some kind of beetle. You can relax," he said. "We're just going to take a few pictures for your family album." <coughs> She responded, "If you're a good girl and do exactly what I tell you, I might even let you have a drink. Stolly vodka," he said. "That's your favorite, isn't it?" In his other hand. He held up a bottle. I wouldn't want you to die of thirst," he added. "That would really be a waste." Chapter Fifty. So, an appropriate name for him, then," Norman Potting said. "Death." Grace Potting and Nickel. Were seated in the oak-timbered saloon of the Black Lion in Rottingdean, each with a pint tumbler in front of him. Grace took a mouthful, holding the wide rim of the glass to his nose, breathing in the aroma of the hops, trying to get the reek of the sulfuric acid out of his nostrils. His hand was shaking. He realized, from his hangover, from what he had seen this morning. 
He remembered early on in his career when he had been a beat copper out in a patrol car on nights, being called to attend a suicide on the London to Brighton railway line. A man had lain down on the track by the entrance to a tunnel, and the wheels had gone over his neck. He had had to walk along the track and recover the head. He would never forget the surreal sight of it lying there in the beam of his torch, barely any blood at all leaking, and the almost surgically precise cut. The dead man had been about fifty, with a ruddy outdoor complexion. Grace had picked the head up by the shaggy thatch of ginger hair and had been surprised by just how heavy it was. Diath's head had been just as heavy. He watched the kaleidoscope of lights on a fruit machine, which no one was using, go through their routine. He could hear the faint chimes that went with them. It was still early. There was just a handful of people in the place. A trendy-looking man, a media type, was seated by the fireplace, drinking what looked like a Bloody Mary and reading the Observer. An elderly, shapeless couple sat a couple of tables away, slouched over their drinks in silence, like two sacks of vegetables. Thinking through the day's agenda, which had been thrown badly by Diath's murder, he was worrying about Nick Nickel meeting the SIO of the murder investigation in Wimbledon, where a headless young woman wearing a bracelet with a scarab motif had been discovered two months earlier. It might be better to go himself, one SIO to another, rather than send a junior member of his team. Turning to Nickel, Grace asked, "What time are you meeting the SIO of the murder in Wimbledon?" He's going to call me this afternoon. He has a brother in Brighton. He's coming down to have lunch with him. Let me know and I'll come with you. Yes, sir. Despite being in his late twenties, Nick still had something of a socially clumsy youth about him, and he still could not get his head around calling him Roy, as Grace liked all his team to do. Grace checked the growing list of notes on his BlackBerry. The smell of roasting meat coming from the kitchen. Was churning his already very queasy stomach. It would be a while, he thought, before he could swallow a morsel of food again. He wasn't even sure if drinking with all the paracetamol he had taken was very smart, but this was one of those moments when he needed a drink, on duty or not. He took his phone out of his pocket and checked it was still on, just in case it had somehow got switched off and he had missed a call back from Cleo. He wondered briefly how Glenn Branson was getting on, worrying a little about his friend. Underneath the hulking frame that must have made him a formidable nightclub bouncer was a gentle guy, too damn gentle and kind-hearted for his own good at times. Sulfuric acid, Potting said pensively, raising his glass and taking a long draught. Grace stared at him. The poor sod had not been blessed with good looks. In fact, he verged on being plug ugly. Despite the aging detective's failings, he suddenly felt a little sorry for his colleague, sensing a sad and lonely man behind the bravado. Potting put his glass down on a Guinness mat, dug his hand in his pocket, and got out his pipe. He stuck it in his mouth, then pulled a box of matches from the opposite pocket. Nick Nickel watched in fascination. Ever smoke, lad? Potting asked. The young DC shook his head. I didn't think so. You don't look the type. Fit bugger, I suppose. I try. Nickel sipped his beer. My dad smoked. He died at forty-eight from lung cancer. Potting was silenced for a second. Then he said, "Cigarettes." Twenty a day. He held up his pipe smugly. There's a difference, you see. Nick's a good runner. Grace cut in. I want to poach him for my rugby team this autumn. Sussex needs some good runners at the moment. Potting retorted. They got a lot of bloody runs to get today. What a horlicks yesterday! Three bowled out for ten against bloody Surrey. He struck a match and lit his pipe. Blowing out a cloud of sickly sweet smoke which billowed around Grace, Potting puffed away until the bowl of his pipe glowed an even bright red. Normally, Grace liked the smell of pipe smoke, but not this morning. 
He waved the smoke away, watching it curl heavily and lazily up towards the nicotine-decorated ceiling. Reggie Diath's murder could have been coincidental, he thought. The man was a key witness for the prosecution in the trial of members of a major international paedophile ring. There were several people who would have good reasons for wanting him silenced. Yet what had been found on the two computers seemed to him to indicate another possibility. Bryce had been warned not to contact the police. He had, rightly, ignored the warning, and a police examination of his computer had connected it to Reggie Diath's PC. Less than 24 hours later, Diath was dead. There was an irritating chime from the fruit machine, then a series of further chimes like a xylophone. Potting and Nickel were now deep into a conversation about cricket, and Grace drifted more deeply into his own thoughts. He remained so deep in thought that, even when they were back in the car, he barely registered the one piece of information that Norman Potting, changing the subject from cricket back to Reggie Diath, suddenly revealed. Chapter 51 the emergency vet who had introduced herself as Dawn, a rather butch-looking Australian woman in her mid-thirties, was kneeling beside Lady, who was still very drowsy. She pulled down the Alsatian's left eyelid and examined it with the aid of a pencil torch. Max and Jessica watched anxiously. Tom stood with an arm around each of them. The detective, Glenn Branson, had gone outside to make a phone call. Tom stared down at the dog, his mind in turmoil. Yesterday morning, he had gone to the police, defying the email warning that had been sent to him. Now Kelly was missing and the car had been found burned out. Oh, Christ, my darling, where are you? Standing in the brilliant morning sunshine out in the street, Branson held his mobile phone to his ear, talking to a family liaison officer, WPC Linda Buckley, arranging for her to come straight over to the Bryce's house. Almost immediately after he ended the call, the phone rang. It was an officer from British Transport Police, PC Dudley Bunting, returning Branson's call. Glenn told him what he was looking for and that it was very urgent. Bunting promised to come back to him as quickly as he could. Today is what I need, Branson said. Not three weeks' time, that possible. Bunting sounded hesitant. It's Sunday. Yeah, I know, I should be in church, and I'm with a geezer who would quite like to spend the day with his wife, and I'm with his two kids who'd quite like to spend the day with their mother, except it looks like someone abducted her in the middle of the night. So maybe you'd like to sacrifice the Sunday roast with your in-laws and pull your fucking finger out for me. Bunting assured him he would exert maximum digital extraction. While he was talking, another call came in, from Ari. Branson ignored it. When he finished his call, a message signal appeared on the phone's display, accompanied by two sharp beeps. The DS stared at the sign on the windows of the gym on the other side of the road. Gym and Tonic. It was a good name, he thought. Yeah, he liked that. With a bald fist, he tested his own stomach muscles. He still had a six-pack, but he needed to get back into the gym soon. There had been a time when he went to the gym every single day. Now, he thought guiltily, he did well to make it twice a week. But there was something else making him feel a lot more guilty, as he looked up at the clear blue sky and felt the glorious warmth of the sun on his face. Ari, his wife, and his kids. Sammy was just eight and Remy was three. He missed both of them every minute of the day he wasn't with them. Yet these days he hardly ever was with them. Work was increasingly consuming his life. He pressed the message retrieval button and listened to the voicemail Ari had just left, in a tone that was short and sarcastic and growing shorter and more sarcastic by the day. Glenn! Gonna take Sammy and Remy onto the beach. Be nice if you joined us, as it was your suggestion. They'd quite like to see their father for at least one hour over the weekend. Perhaps you can call me back. My name's Ari, in case you've forgotten. I'm your wife. He sighed heavily. 
They rowed increasingly frequently about his hours. Ari seemed to have forgotten already that he had taken the whole of last weekend off to drive up to Solihull for her sister's 30th birthday, dumping his work onto a broad-shouldered grace. Glen Branson's problem was that he was ambitious. He wanted to rise through the ranks, like Roy Grace had done. But that meant long hours were not a temporary thing. This was the way it was going to be for the next 20 years. A lot of his colleagues found the job tough on their marriages. It often seemed only those officers married to other police officers who understood each other's crazy hours had happy marriages. At some point, he was going to have to make a decision about which was more important to him, his job or his family. That was pretty ironic, really. Soon after Sammy was born, when Glen Branson had been working as a nightclub bouncer, he had decided he wanted to have a career his son would be proud of, and that was when he had joined the Sussex force. He was about to dial Larry when a voice behind him startled him. It was Tom Bryce, and the man looked in bad shape, his face pale, his eyes spooked. Could I have a quiet word with you, Sergeant Branson? he asked. Of course. They climbed into Branson's pool Mondeo and closed the doors. What I want to ask you is if you think we're in danger. Whether I should take my children somewhere, go into hiding. The detective wasn't sure how to respond. He was quiet for some moments, thinking about Janie Stretton's vicious murder and the warning that Bryce said he had received on his email. Then his missing wife. He could not answer because he just did not have enough information yet. But what if this had happened to him and Ari had vanished? Could he honestly look Tom Bryce in the eye and tell him to stay put? But what were the alternatives? A round-the-clock police guard? He doubted that could be swung unless there was much stronger evidence to persuade Alison Vosper to stand the cost. Move them to a safe house. Roy Grace had rung him half an hour ago to tell him about Reggie Diath. So much for safe houses. I think we need to consider the possibility that your wife has been abducted, Mr Bryce. This was what Tom had feared, although there was just one small nagging doubt in his mind. The words of Jessica came back to him repeatedly. She'll probably just want to drink vodka. I saw her. I promised I wouldn't tell. I've arranged for a detective from the family liaison unit, the detective was saying. She's very competent. She'll move in here if you agree. She'll organise a roster of herself and a colleague to give you and your children round-the-clock protection. Is that what you'd do in my situation, D.S. Branson? Yeah, he replied hesitantly. Yeah, for the moment, anyhow. Let's see what we learn today. Glenn Branson looked down not able to look the man in the eye for more than a second. And, as he said the words, he was thinking to himself, If this was me, would I want to have Sammy and Remy remain in the house? And he simply did not know the answer. Chapter 52 Potatoes, Norman Potting said suddenly. The three police officers were in the car, Nick Nickel driving, heading back from the pub in Rottingdean towards Sussex House. The pint of beer on top of the paracetamol and his late night was making Grace drowsy. Potatoes, Nickel echoed. I was brought up on a farm, Potting said. My dad used to spray the potato crop with sulfuric acid. Dilute, mind you. Never did me any harm. Sulfuric acid on potatoes? You're not serious. The word sulfuric acid caught Grace's attention. My friend, I'm always serious, Potting replied. The acid kills off the shoots and makes harvesting much easier. And it kills anyone who eats the potatoes, Grace questioned. It's all bollocks, Potting said. All this organic crap. Nothing wrong with a few honest-to-goodness pesticides. Look at me. I'm looking at you, Nichols said, glancing in the mirror. Never had a day's sickness in my life. You're just permanently sick, Grace thought. Armless stuff in the right hands, Potting continued. I don't think Reggie Diath would agree with you, Grace retorted. Would you give your kids potatoes that have been sprayed with sulfuric acid? Nickel asked Potting. Wouldn't have a problem with it, he said. 
Well, I would, the young DC said. After a moment's silence, Potting asked him, How many kids have you got? First one on its way, any day now, the DC said. How about you? Two by my first marriage, one by my second, two more by my third. The second by her, Susie, has Down syndrome. Not that I ever see much of the little buggers, he said wistfully. Nickel was clearly affected by Potting's response. Downs? Potting nodded. I'm sorry, Nickel said. Potting shrugged. That's the way it goes, he said sadly. She's a good kid, always happy. He shrugged again. Every family has something, don't they? Are you still married? To your third? Potting's face fell. I gave up. He pursed his lips. I'm a bachelor. Footloose and fancy free, like D.S. Grace here. Take it from me, lad, it's the best way. Nick Nickel said, Actually, I'm very happily married. You're a lucky man, Potting replied. So, if we're looking for someone who has enough sulfuric acid to fill a bath, we should be looking for a potato farmer, Grace asked, turning his head. Or someone who supplies potato farmers, Potting said. Or drugs companies, or manufacturers of citric and lactic acids and edible oils. Adhesives, explosives, synthetic rubber, water and effluent treatment, wood pulping, leather tanning, car batteries. You should go on mastermind, Nickel said, with sulfuric acid as your specialist subject. I got involved in a case a few years ago. Chapping Croydon threw some in his girlfriend's face when she dumped him. Apparently it's common practice in one of the countries in Africa. Nice guy, Nickel responded. A regular charmer. That's what you get with darkies. Now Grace was livid. Norman, in case you haven't noticed, we have a black member on our team. If you make one more racist or homophobic remark, I'm going to have you suspended. Any part of that you don't understand. After a few seconds' silence, Potting said, I'm sorry, Roy. I apologise. Not very tactful of me. He's a good man, that D.S. Branson. Even though he's black, Grace was tempted to fire back. Instead, he said, You'd have needed a few gallons of the stuff to fill that tub. The neighbours must have seen something. All those bloody neighbourhood watch stickers. Two tasks for you, Norman. First, find out from the house to house team if any unfamiliar vehicles have been in the street in the past few days. Second, find out if there are any suppliers or users of bulk sulfuric acid in the area. Before or after I finish working my way through the books of Barry and Claire Escorts 24-7, Chief. You'll have to multitask like the rest of us, Norman. Two sharp beeps told Grace he had an incoming text. He looked down and saw it was from Cleo. Instantly, his spirits lifted. Then, when he read it, they dropped. Or rather, plummeted. Chapter 53 the video viewing room in the major incident suite was a tiny windowless cubicle a few yards down the corridor from MIR-1. With just Glenn Branson and Tom Bryce in there, it felt crowded and claustrophobic. Yet another example, in Branson's view, and he was only an occasional visitor, of how poorly thought out the conversion of the building had been. Tom Bryce sat at the desk with a monitor in front of him and to his left a video and CD stack. The machine was loaded with CCTV footage from two cameras at Preston Park Railway Station, the first stop north from Brighton, regularly used by commuters both for its convenient location towards the outskirts and for the free parking in the streets all around. It was the station where the dickhead seated next to him on the train last Tuesday night who had left behind the CD had got off. Constable Bunting had come up trumps. Within two hours of Glenn's call to British Transport Police, the officer had produced footage of the southbound platform of Preston Park at the time of the arrival of the train Tom had been on. Tom forced himself to concentrate, but it was hard because he was beside himself with worry about Kelly. He had the shakes from having eaten nothing all day and drunk far too much caffeine. His stomach felt as if it was full of barbed wire. Suddenly, his mobile phone rang. 
He looked at the display but did not recognise the number. I'd better answer it, he said. Branson nodded his encouragement. It was Lynn Cottesloe, Kelly's best friend, who also lived in Brighton, wondering if there was any news or anything she and her husband could do to help. Could they bring some food over, help out with the children? Tom thanked her and said that a rota of family liaison officers had been organised. She told him to call the instant he had any news, and he promised he would. Then he returned to his task. The first camera showed the length of the platform from a high vantage point. A train was just pulling out of the station. A counter in the top right-hand corner read 1909. That's the Thameslink, the London Bridge service, Glen Branson informed him. Yours is coming in a couple of minutes. Tom fast-forwarded, then slowed when a new train appeared on the track. His nerves tightened. The train came to a halt, doors opened, and about 30 people climbed down onto the platform. He pressed the freeze-frame button and looked at each character carefully. No sign of the dickhead. This is the right train, he asked. Definitely. The 610 fast service from Victoria, the one you told me you took, Branson replied. Run it on a bit. Might be that not everyone's off yet. Tom pressed the play button and all the people sprang back into life. He scanned the open doors of the train, many of which were being shut again, trying to work out the carriage where he had been sitting. It was about four back from the front he estimated he was looking at it now. And then he saw him. The big-framed, baby-faced man, dressed in a safari-style shirt over shapeless slacks and clutching a small holdall, was stepping down onto the platform now and looking carefully around, almost as if to ensure the coast was clear before he got off. Clear of what? Tom wondered, stabbing the freeze button. The man stopped in mid-step, his left trainer-clad foot in the air, his face angled slightly towards the camera but showing no awareness of it. Although the look of deep consternation on his face was clearly visible. Tom pressed the play button again and within moments the man's concerns seemed to be over and he began walking almost jauntily towards the exit barrier. He froze the tape again and said, This is him. Branson stared at the man in shock. Zoom in, will you, on his face? Tom fumbled with the controls, then zoomed in a little jerkily until he was tight on the dickhead's face. You're absolutely sure? Tom nodded. Yes, that's him, absolutely. You couldn't be mistaken? No. That's very interesting, the detective sergeant said. Do you know who he is? Yes, Branson said, his voice turning grim. We do. Chapter 54 Shortly before five o'clock, Sergeant John Rye was sitting at his desk in the high-tech crime unit, still working on Tom Bryce's computer, when his direct line rang. He picked up the receiver. John Rye, he said. Hello, it's Tom Bryce. I'm actually in your building up in the CCTV room. Just wondered if, if my computer was ready. I could pop down, collect. I, I need to do some work tonight. I, I have, I have to prepare for a very big meeting tomorrow. Uh, how are you doing? You sound terrible. You need to do some work, and I need to go home and salvage my marriage. John Rye thought. There was only himself and Andy Gidney a short distance across the room from him, still there in the department late on this Sunday afternoon. Were the two of them sad or what? Gidney, his iPod plugged as ever into his ears, was hunched over his keyboard, his desk littered with empty Coke cans and plastic coffee cups from the vending machines, clicking relentlessly away, working on cracking the code he had been trying to crack all week. Rye worried about the geek. He seemed a lost soul. At least when Rye left the building, he had a home to go to. Maybe Nadine was sour sometimes, but there would be a meal on the table, the kids to talk to. Some kind of normality. What was Gidney's normality? Mind you, he wondered, what was anyone's normality in here, including his own? Most of their working weeks consisted of looking at porn on seized computers, and the vast majority of it was not your average titillating but cosy playboy centrefold stuff, 
It was middle-aged men with children as young as two years old. Something he would never, not in a trillion years, really comprehend. How did that stuff turn people on? How could people do that with innocent children? How could a 40-year-old man sodomise a small child and then live with the knowledge of what he had done? The answer, sadly, was too easily and too often. He knew exactly what he would have done if he had caught someone meddling with his children when they'd been young. It would have involved a razor blade and a blowtorch. There was a sudden jangle of weird electronic noises which was becoming irritatingly familiar to Rye. Gidney's mobile phone. The geek removed an iPod earpiece and answered the phone in a flat tone devoid of any emotion. Oh, hi, he said. Rye knew roughly where Gidney lived, up off the level, somewhere towards the race course in a bedsit. It was an area of densely packed Victorian and Edwardian terraced houses, originally built as artisan dwellings, now largely monopolised by students and young singles. What did the geek go home to, if and when he ever did go home? A tin of beans on a single hob? Another computer screen? The Guardian newspaper, which he always carried under his arms into work but never seemed to read, and a pile of techie magazines. I need about another half hour, Rye said to Tom Bryce. You could wait, or would you like me to drop it back to you on my way home? Yes, I... I have the children. I need to get back. Thank you, Bryce said. If you could drop it back, I'd appreciate that. OK, I have your address. I'll be there as soon as I can. He checked his watch, wanting to make sure he left enough time to get home for the one television programme of the week he was addicted to. The motoring programme, Top Gear. Although it was some years since he had been a traffic cop, he was still an unreconstructed petrol head. As he replaced the receiver, he saw Gidney wearing his anorak and carrying his small rucksack heading out of the door. No goodbye. God, he was always the same. No social graces at all. It took Rye longer than he had planned to finish his examination, and he realised, just a little guiltily, that it was now over an hour and a half since he had spoken to Tom Bryce. He finally closed the man's laptop and was about to stand up when the phone rang. It was an operator from the call handling centre in a building at Malling House, the police headquarters, where non-emergency calls from the general public were handled. Is that the high-tech crime unit? the operator said. Rye took a deep breath, resisting the temptation to tell the man he had the wrong number. Sergeant Rye speaking. I have a caller who's complaining that someone is using his wireless internet connection without his permission. Oh, please, Rye said, nearly exploding. He really didn't have the time for this. If he has a wireless internet connection, all he has to do is activate the encryption to protect it. Would you mind talking to him, sir? the operator said. It's the third call we've logged from him in the past month. He's a bit agitated. Join the club, I thought. Reluctantly, he said, put him on. Moments later, he heard an elderly-sounding male voice with a guttural Germanic accent. Oh, yes, hello there. My name is Andreas Seiler. I am an engineer. I am retired now, but I was building bridges. Then there was just a hiss of static. Rye waited a while. Then, to break the silence, and to see if the man was still on the line, he said, You're speaking to Sergeant Rye in the high-tech crime unit. How can I help you? I'm not hugely in need of a bridge, he was tempted to add. Yes, thank you. Someone is stealing my internet. Rye looked at the clock on his computer screen. Twenty-five to seven. He just wanted to end this call and go home and the operator might have mentioned the bloody man sounded as if he barely spoke English. Stealing your internet? I'm not quite sure what you mean, sir. I am downloading a blueprint from a colleague from my old company for bridges are designing Kuala Lumpur Harbour. Then my internet slows down so much that the blueprint does not download. This is happening before. I think you have a problem either with your internet service provider or with your computer, sir, Rye said. 
you should start by contacting your ISP's technical support. Well, I've done this, of course, and checked my computer. There are no problems. It is outside. I am thinking it is a man in a white van. Now, Rye was just a little bit puzzled and increasingly irritated by this bozo wasting his time. A man in a white van slowing down your internet connection? Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry, Mr... Um, Rye glanced down at his notes. Mr. Seiler, I'm a little confused. Where exactly are you? I'm from Switzerland, but I'm working here in Brighton. Whereabouts in Brighton, sir? Freshfield Road. OK. Rye knew that area well. An exceptionally wide street on a hill with two- and three-storey red brick houses, many of the larger ones converted into flats. Your internet connection. You're on broadband. Broadband, yes. Do you have a wireless connection? You are meaning airport? Wi-Fi? Yes, sir. Yeah, I have that. Rye grinned to himself, realising what the man's problem probably was. Is your wireless network encrypted? Hesitantly, the man replied. Encrypted? I don't think so. I am staying in my son's flat, you see. Uh, this is his computer I am using. You don't have to enter a password to use the wireless broadband. No password, no. Without a password, any passerby with a wireless internet card in their laptop could log onto the internet using someone else's wireless broadband. Rye had done it himself a couple of times, by accident, sitting in a patrol car with his laptop open and he thought a little guiltily he had never bothered to password protect his own wireless broadband connection at home. Is the van still outside? Yes, that is right. Can you read the registration number? The elderly Swiss engineer read it out to him. Rye wrote it down on his pad for no particular reason. My best advice is for you to activate the encryption and that will lock him out. I will speak to my son. Good idea, sir. Rye finished the call and hung up. Then, because he was feeling fed up, he decided the rest of the force could know he was still in the office at 20 to 7 on a bloody Sunday evening, and he decided to log the call as an official incident on the Vantage screen. He typed his own name and department, entered the registration and description of the van, vague as it was, and logged the incident as war driving, Sergeant Rye dealt with by phone. Childish, he knew, but it put him in one hell of a better mood. Chapter 55 I found a lasagna in the freezer, the family liaison officer announced as Tom entered the kitchen. Jessica hanging onto one side of his trousers, Max the other, as if terrified that if they let go, he would disappear like their mother. Would you like me to cook that for your supper? Tom stared at WPC Buckley blankly. Supper hadn't even occurred to him. All he could think about at this moment was the expression on Detective Sergeant Branson's face when he had pointed out on the CCTV film the dickhead who had been on the train. The strangely clipped response when he had asked him if he knew who the man was. Yes, we do. And then the detective's refusal to say any more about him. Turning to the WPC, Tom said distractedly, Yes, thank you, that would be fine. There are some bits in the fridge. Tomatoes, lettuce, radishes, I could knock up a salad. Great, he said. Lady came bounding in through the dog flap, looked at Tom and barked once, then wagged her tail, right as rain again. Are you hungry, lady? Tom asked. She barked again, then looked at him expectantly. I don't like salad, Max protested. I only like Mummy's salad, Jessica said in a kind of solidarity. This is Mummy's salad, Tom retorted. She bought it. But she's not making it, is she? Max said. This very nice lady is going to make it instead. Tom picked up the dog's bowl and began to fill it with dried biscuits. Then he opened a can of her food. The vet had been unable to say what was wrong with the dog. Probably just a bug, she thought. The detective had asked her whether she might have been drugged and the vet had responded it was possible. 
She would need to send a blood sample to the lab for analysis, and it would take several days. Branson had asked her to do this. I found some very yummy lemon ice cream in the freezer, the WPC said breezily. You could have ice cream afterwards. I want mummy's ice cream, Max said. I want chocolate or strawberry, Jessica demanded. Tom exchanged glances with the police officer. She was in her mid thirties, he guessed, with short blonde hair, a pleasant, open face, and a warm but efficient nature. She seemed like someone who could cope with most situations. He gave her a whatever shrug, set the bowl down on the floor, then turned to Max. It is Mummy's ice cream, okay? Max looked up at him with big round eyes, but they seemed completely devoid of expression. Tom couldn't read them, couldn't figure out exactly how his son was feeling, or his daughter, or himself. He desperately wanted to quiz Jessica some more about the vodka she claimed Kelly drank. What the hell was all that about? I don't like lemon ice cream, Jessica said. Tom knelt and put his arms around her. We don't have any other flavors tonight. I'll get you chocolate and strawberry for tomorrow. How's that? There was no reaction from his daughter. Give Daddy a hug, darling. I need a hug. When will Mummy be home? He hesitated for a moment, wondering what he should say: the truth that he just didn't know, or a white lie. The lie was easier. Soon. He scooped his daughter up in his arms. Bath time. I want mummy to bath me. She might not be back until quite late, so daddy's going to bath you tonight, okay? She looked away sulkily. In the living room, he heard the volume of the television rise, tinkly music, the sound of car tires squealing, a high-pitched American voice protesting about something. Max was watching The Simpsons. Good. At least that would keep him occupied until supper. Or should he give him a bath too? He suddenly realized how little he knew about the kids' routines, about anything to do with the house. Dark, cold mist and a terrible fear engulfed him from within. Tomorrow morning, he had to make a major presentation to Land Rover. Their marketing director was talking about a massive contract. If Kelly didn't come back tonight, he just didn't know how he was going to cope with it. Oh God, my sweet, lovely Kelly, please be okay. Please come back. I love you so much. At the top of the stairs, he carried Jessica into her bedroom, then closed the door behind him and sat her down on the bed. He sat beside her. Jessica, can Daddy ask you about something you said this morning about Mummy? I said we would ask Mummy what she would like to do today if she came back in time, and you said she'll probably just want to drink vodka. Remember? Jessica stared silently ahead. Do you remember saying that, darling? Pouting grumpily, she said, "You drink vodka too." Yes, I do. But why did you say that? Downstairs, he suddenly heard Lady barking. Then the doorbell rang. He heard Max shout out, "Mummy, mummy, mummy! Mummy's home!" Tom, his heart racing with sudden elation, tore down the stairs. Max was already opening the front door. Sergeant John Rye stood there, holding his leather laptop case. This ends disc eight. Looking good, dead. Disc nine. Chapter Fifty Six. Roy Grace, sitting at the workstation in MIR One alongside most of his team, was running his eye over the latest incident reports log on the vantage screen in front of him. It was a quarter to eight on Sunday evening, and although he still wasn't feeling hungry, he could feel himself getting shaky from lack of sugar or too much caffeine, or both, and was finding it increasingly hard to concentrate on his tasks. Cleo Morey did not help either. Every few minutes, his thoughts returned to her text of this morning. 
He was checking the latest updates on Reggie Diath when he felt a thump on his back. Yo, old-timer! He looked up. Branson, who had popped out of the room a short while ago, had returned with a massive carton of doughnuts from the supermarket across the road. He doled out one to each of the team members. Grace took his and stepped away from the desk, deciding he needed to stretch his legs. Branson joined him as he walked across the room and out into the hallway. You okay, old man? You look like shit. Grace took a bite, licking the sugar off his lips. Oh, thanks. Lowering his voice, Branson said, So? A little birdie told me that you and Cleo Mori were cozying up to each other in Latin in the Lanes last night. Grace stared at him in surprise. Oh, yes. She's the one yanking your chain. God, this is a small town. It's a small planet, man. How did you know who it was? The DS tapped the side of his face with his finger. Something you taught me. One of the first rules of being a good detective. Build up your network of informants. Grace shook his head, half amused, half annoyed. That was before the regulations changed. Sterile corridors, all that crap. Ever see that movie Police? Gerard Depardieu was a cop who leaned on his informants to get a drugs bust. Great movie. I didn't see it. It's well good. He reminded me of you. Bigger nose, though. I look like Gerard Depardieu. Branson gave him a pat. Nah, you're more like Bruce Willis. Oh, that's better. You sort of look like Bruce Willis's less fortunate brother, or maybe his father. Oh, you really know how to make a man feel good about himself. You look like... Like who? Will Smith? In your fucking dreams? So tell me more about you and Ms. Maury. Nothing to tell. We had dinner. Business, of course. Totally. Even in the back of your cab? Branson pressed. Jesus, is every fucking taxi driver in Brighton and Ove informing for you? No, just a couple. I got lucky. Anyhow, they're not informants. They just keep their eyes open for me. Grace didn't know whether to be proud of his protégé for becoming such a proficient detective or angry at him. Interrupting his thoughts, Branson asked, So, did she like your new gear? She said I needed a new dresser and that you were total crap. Branson looked so hurt, Grace felt sorry for him. <laughs> Don't worry, actually she didn't comment. Shit, that's even worse! We have two homicides and a missing woman. Can we change the subject? Don't change the subject. Cleo Mori, she's well gorgeous. Like, if I wasn't happily married, you know what I mean? Except, like, how do you stop thinking about what she does, man? She didn't bring any of her cadavers with her to the restaurant, so it was easy. Branson shook his head, suppressing a grin. So come on, chapter and verse, don't go all coy on me, tell me. I don't have anything to be coy about. She has a boyfriend, OK? Actually, a fiancé. She somehow neglected to mention him. You're shitting me. Grace pulled out his mobile phone and showed Branson the text he had received this morning. Can't speak to you at the moment. My fiancé just turned up. We'll call later. C -X -X -X. After some moments, Branson declared, He's history. That was midday. She still hasn't called. Three kisses. Trust me, he's toast. Grace crammed the rest of the doughnut into his mouth. Despite his lack of appetite, it was so good he could have eaten a second one. It's another of your hunches. The detective sergeant gave him a sideways look. They're not all wrong. Cleo had not been on duty today. If she had, Grace would have attended Reggie Diath's post-mortem this afternoon, although it would not have been necessary, as another detective had been appointed SIO of that case. We'll see, he said. Grace remembered an expression his mother used to use. Time will tell. Fate. She had been a great believer in fate, but he had never totally shared that belief. It had helped her through her days dying from cancer. If you believed that some greater power was at work who had it all mapped out for you, then in some ways you were lucky. People who had deep religious faith were fortunate. They could abdicate all their responsibilities to God. Despite his fascination with the supernatural, Grace had never been able to believe in a God who had a plan for him. He went back into the room and walked over to the workstation. 
On the large whiteboard was the photograph he had taken this morning of Reggie Diath in his bath and a picture of Kelly Bryce, the photograph Branson had circulated to the press and to all UK police stations and ports. Tomorrow morning, Cassian Pugh, the arrogant shit of a detective inspector from the Met, was starting work with him on his cold case workload. And sure as hell, if he did not have a result of some kind for her soon on Janie Stretton, the assistant chief constable would have Pew treading on the backs of his shoes. Turning to Branson, Grace asked, Glenn, just how confident are you that Tom Bryce hasn't killed his wife? Whenever a woman went missing under suspicious circumstances, it was always the husband or boyfriend who was the prime suspect until eliminated. Like I told you in the briefing an hour ago, I'm very confident. I interviewed him on tape in here before we went through to the CCTV footage, and I can get the tape profile, but I don't think we need to. He'd have to have left his kids on their own in the house in the middle of the night, kill his wife, take her body somewhere, then drive to Ditchling Beacon, torch the car, and walk five miles home. I don't think so. So where is she? Do you think she might have done a runner with a lover? I don't think she'd have torched her car, and I think she would have taken her handbag, some clothes, you know? Could be good cover, torching the car. Branson was adamant. No, no way. I'd like to see this, Mr Bryce. Let's take a drive over. Now? Tonight? We could go over, but he's pretty distressed trying to cope with his kids. I've got a rotor of FLOs with him. I prefer to go back in the morning if his missus hasn't shown up. You've talked to the babysitter's parents? Yeah, they were in bed when their daughter came home. She called out to them to say she was back about 1.45am. They heard a car drive off and that was all. Their neighbours? They don't have many in that street up on Nob Hill. I've been round them. No one saw or heard anything. You've checked all traffic CCTV cameras? I'm waiting. They've been looking through all the footage from 1am until the call-out came in. Nothing so far. Have you found out anything about them as a couple? Talk to their neighbours on one side, elderly couple. He's about ten foot tall and she smoked so heavily I could hardly see her in the room. She seemed to have a bit of a friendship with Mrs Bryce, Kelly. Helps them out babysitting in emergencies, that sort of thing. What she said was that they have money troubles. Grace raised an eyebrow, his interest peaked. Oh yes. You never know it from their house. They've got a fuck-off barbecue that looks like Mission Control at Ooston. Must have cost thousands. They've got a swanky kitchen, plasma telly, order kit. Probably why they've got money problems, Gray said. Could she have torched the car for the insurance? Branson frowned. Hadn't thought of that. Does anyone ever make money out of a car insurance claim? Worth finding out if they owned it or if it was on finance. Whether they've tried to sell it recently. The high-tech crime unit now have a copy of his laptop hard drive. Get them to check if he's posted any ads for his car on a website anywhere. Something like Auto Trader. They could be in on this disappearance together. The more he thought about it, the more excited Grace got. Money troubles, he thought. Might be a red herring, but it needed to be explored. Sometimes people got up to ingenious tricks to reduce their debts. He watched Bella Moy reach for a Malteser. There was a trail of icing sugar from her doughnut to the edge of her keyboard. Nick Nickel was on the phone, concentrating intensely. Norman Potting was on the phone also, working his way through the client list of BCE 247. No doubt causing a few upsets, Grace thought a touch malevolently. Not that he took the moral high ground on prostitution. There have been a few occasions during the past nine years when he picked up the phone to call one of the numbers in the personal ads in the Argus himself. But on each occasion, he had felt the shadow of Sandy over his shoulder. The same thing had happened to him during a brief holiday romance on the one disastrous occasion he had gone on a singles holiday to the Greek island of Paxos. The door opened and the cheery face of Tony Case, the senior support officer for Sussex House, peered round. Just thought I'd pop in to see if there was anything you needed, Roy, he said. Thanks, Tony, I think we're fine. I appreciate you coming in. Case raised a finger in acknowledgement. All part of the service. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, Grace said. Tony Case looked at his watch. All four hours of it. That's almost funny, Roy. As the support officer headed off down the corridor, Grace stared at the bright orange lettering on the vantage screen, 
scanning down it for the latest activity logged on the Diath murder. It didn't take him long to find something. The house-to-house inquiries had turned up a vigilant neighbour who had clocked a white van parked outside Reggie Diath's house at around seven the previous evening. The neighbour had dutifully written down the van's number. He double-clicked on the log to read the details. The PC who had interviewed the neighbour had requested a vehicle registration check and it had come back as clean. The SIO appointed for Reggie Diath's murder was Detective Superintendent Dave Gaylor, a considerably more experienced officer than himself. No doubt Gaylor's team would be all over that van when they found it. Nickel came over and stooped beside him. Roy, I've just had a call from a bar manager I saw yesterday at a place called the Karma Bar down at the marina. They've just been watching some CCTV tapes going back a couple of weeks. They're trying to stop a problem they have with a couple of drug dealers operating in the place, and he reckons he's got some footage of Janie Stretton. Grace felt a sudden bolt of excitement. How quickly can we get it here? He'd rather I went there. He needs the tapes. He said I could watch them right away. Now? Yes. Grace thought for a moment. Nick Nickel had not been in the CID long and still had a lot to learn. The young DC was bright, but he might miss something. And this promised to be the first lead they had in the case. If this was so, then it was crucial to get every possible piece of information from it. Bring her photographs, Grace said. I'll come with you. Turning to Branson, he said, We'll see Mr Bryce as soon as I'm back. That's going to make it well late for him. Glenn Branson was thinking, unprofessionally he knew, but he couldn't help it, about the remnants of his own Sunday night. He longed to see his kids, even if it was for just five minutes before they went to sleep. Glenn, if Mr Bryce hasn't murdered his wife or pulled off some scam with her, he's going to be wide awake all night long. Trust me. Branson gave a reluctant nod, knowing Grace was right, and glanced at his watch. Grace would be an hour at the very least, and probably much longer. By the time he was back and they'd gone to the Bryce's house, it would be eleven at the earliest. He wasn't afraid of facing half a dozen knife-wielding thugs in a dark alley in Brighton, but at times he was bloody terrified of his wife, and at this moment he was terrified of picking up the phone to Ari and telling her he was unlikely to be home this side of midnight. Grace was so fired up by the possible sighting in the karma bar that, running his eye down the rest of the incident reports log, he skipped over the report Sergeant John Rye had logged an hour earlier, headed war driving, without even noticing it. Chapter 57 Tom read a few pages of The Gruffalo to Jessica. His heart wasn't in it, and she wasn't really listening. It didn't fare any better with Max. All he could think was, miserably, that he must be a crap father. The children wanted their mother, which was completely understandable, but he was starting to feel beyond inadequate as a stand-in. They now even seemed to prefer the company of Linda Buckley to himself. The WPC was sitting downstairs waiting for the replacement family liaison officer to arrive and take over from her for the night. He put the book down, kissed his wide-awake son goodnight and closed the door, then went into his den and made another round of phone calls to Kelly's parents, who had been ringing just about every hour, to all her friends and again to her very worried sister in Scotland. No one had heard from her. Then he went into their bedroom and opened the top drawer in the Victorian chest where Kelly kept her clothes. He rummaged through her sweaters, smelling her scent rising from them but found nothing. Next, he opened the drawer beneath, which was crammed with underwear, and his hand struck something hard and round. He pulled it out. It was a bottle of Tesco vodka, sealed, unopened. He found a second bottle, also unopened. Then a third. This one was half empty. He sat down on the bed and stared at it. Three vodka bottles in her underwear drawer. She'll probably just want to drink vodka. I saw her. I said I wouldn't tell. Oh, Jesus. He stared at the bottle again. Should he phone Detective Sergeant Branson and tell him? He tried to think it through. If he did tell him, then what? 
The detective might lose interest, thinking she was flaky and just might have gone off on a bender. But he knew her better, or did until about a minute ago. He rummaged through the rest of her drawers but found nothing further. He replaced the bottles, closed the drawer, then went downstairs. Linda Buckley was sitting in the living room watching television, a police series set in the 1960s. The station sergeant had a box of cigarettes on his desk, which he offered to a harassed-looking woman with her hair in a bun. You like watching cop shows? he said lamely, trying to make conversation. Only the ones set in the past, she said. I don't like the modern ones. They get so many things wrong. It drives me nuts. I just sit there groaning, saying to myself, they don't do it like that, for God's sake. He sat down, wondering if it was wise to confide in her. You must eat something, Mr Bryce. Shall I pop your lasagna in the microwave for you? She asked, before he had a chance to say anything. He thanked her. She was right. Although all he felt like was a stiff drink. She got up and went out to the kitchen. He stared blankly at the screen, thinking about the vodka bottles, wondering why Kelly had the secret stash. How long had she been drinking? And, more importantly, why? Did this explain her disappearance? He didn't think so, or at least did not want to think so. The police series ended and the nine o'clock news came on. There was a smell of cooking meat which churned his stomach. He had no appetite at all. Tony Blair was shaking hands with George Bush. Tom mistrusted both men, but tonight he barely noticed them. He watched jerky news footage of Iraq, then a photograph of a pretty teenage girl who had been found raped and strangled near Newcastle, followed by a plea from a clumsy-looking, inarticulate chief inspector with a haircut like a hedgehog who had clearly never had any media training. It's on the table, the family liaison officer called out bossily. Meek as a lamb, he went into the kitchen and sat down. The television in there was on, showing the same news. He ate a couple of mouthfuls of the lasagna, then stopped, finding it hard to swallow. I think we should put a note on the front door, he said, so your colleague doesn't ring the bell. I don't want the kids disturbed, thinking it's their mother arriving home. Good plan, she said, taking a scrap of paper from her briefcase and walking to the doorway. I want to see that plate clean by the time I come back. Yes, boss, he said, forcing a grin, then forcing another mouthful down while she stood over him. Then, moments after she had gone out of the room, a fresh news item was announced by the newscaster. Sussex police are tonight investigating the murder of convicted paedophile Reginald Diath, who was found dead early today at his home in the village of Rottingdean in East Sussex. A photograph of Diath appeared on the screen. Tom dropped his fork in shock. It was the dickhead from the train. Chapter 58 they had been building Bryant Marina for as long as Roy Grace could remember, far back into his childhood. They were still building it now, and maybe they always would be, he speculated. A large, dusty area was closed off on which sat two cranes, a JCB digger and a caterpillar tracked earth mover, amid towers of building materials beneath tarpaulins flapping in the strong breeze. He'd never really worked out whether he liked the whole development or not. It was strangely positioned at the foot of tall, sheer white cliffs to the east of the city and comprised inner and outer yacht basins around which the Marina Village, as it had been named, had grown and was still growing. There were clusters of ersatz Regency townhouses and apartment blocks, dozens of restaurants, cafes, pubs and bars, a couple of yacht chandleries, numerous clothing boutiques, a massive supermarket a bowling alley, a multiplex cinema, a hotel and a casino. But it always felt a little like Toy Town to him, like a grown-up version of something a child had assembled with Lego. Even after 30 years, everything still looked new and felt a little soulless. The only part he really liked was where he and Nick Nickel were walking now, the wooden boardwalk, built just a few years back, that ran along the entire waterfront. On a warm evening like tonight, 
the place had a great buzz, with people of all ages sitting out at its wall-to-wall cafes and restaurants, watching a few late yachts returning to their berths among the pontoons, talking, canoodling, listening to the pounding of music and the cries of gulls. Grace, feeling more human after the sugar hit of the doughnut, experienced a deep pang in his heart as he passed a young couple seated at an outdoor table, staring into each other's eyes, clearly in love. Why hadn't Cleo mentioned that she was engaged? Why hadn't he thought to ask whether she was in a relationship? That long kiss in the taxi, all the way back to her apartment, that wasn't the behaviour of a woman in love with her fiancé, was it? Even with the alcohol talking? With the sun sinking but still well above the horizon, Grace watched his lengthening shadow skim the planks ahead of him. Nichols, considerably taller one, bobbing along beside it. The DC, hands in his pockets with an envelope containing Janie Stretton's photographs tucked under his arm, loped along, slightly stooped, as if he was embarrassed about his six foot six inches. He had been quiet, as usual, on the way here, which Grace was grateful for tonight, as he wasn't in the mood for small talk. They passed the cooler-than-thou Seattle Hotel, then reached the Karma Bar, with its roped-off outdoor seating area fronting the boardwalk, every table and just about every chair occupied. Grace followed Nickel inside. He had been dragged here on a few occasions during the past couple of years by well-meaning friends who had insisted it was the place in Brighton for a man of his age to meet women. The exotic interior was different to anything else in the city. Spacious, with a warm glow from oriental lanterns, inviting cushions strewn around recessed banquettes, a long bar and decor influenced, to his eye at least, by India, Morocco and the Far East. Nick Nickel went up to a pretty girl behind the bar. Hi, he said. I'm looking for Ricky. She looked around, then said pleasantly, I think he's in the office. Is he expecting you? Yes, could you tell him it's Detective Constable Nickel and Detective Superintendent Grace to see him? We spoke about half an hour ago. She went off to find him. Your guy from the Met, this uh, D.I. Dickinson, the SIO of the case in Wimbledon with a murdered girl wearing the scarab bracelet. It's tomorrow midday we're seeing him now, right? Grace checked with Nick. Yes. Probably just as well we didn't want to do it today. I don't think we'd have fitted him in. They both leaned on the bar. A Joss Stone song was playing. I like her, Grace said. Nickel shrugged. Country and western's my thing, really. Who'd you like? He shrugged again. Oh, Johnny Cash is the man. Rachel and I were going to line dancing classes. Had to stop with the little one on its way. They change your life, kids, so I'm told. Grace said, staring down at a pile of Absolute Brighton magazines next to an ashtray. Prenatal classes aren't as much fun, the DC admitted with a glum nod. A couple of minutes later, the barmaid returned and ushered them up some stairs into a comfortable office containing bland, functional furniture in stark contrast to the bar. There was a desk behind which a young man with spiky hair dressed in a T-shirt and jeans was sitting a sofa and a couple of armchairs, an elaborate sound system and a bank of black and white monitors on which there were closed-circuit television images of the interior and exterior of the bar. The young man stood up with a cheery smile and came round to the front of the desk. Hi, nice to meet you, Mr Nickel, he said and shook their hands. Looking at Grace, he added, I'm Ricky, the manager. Read about you in the Argus. Was it yesterday? Could have been. Thought they were a bit brutal-like. Can I offer you guys a drink? I'd love a mineral water, still, if possible. A Diet Coke, Nick Nickel said. The manager picked up his phone and ordered the drinks, then gestured to them to sit down. They sat on the sofa and Ricky pulled up a chair. Yeah, well, he said, directing his remarks at the detective constable and tapping the side of his head. I got a good memory for faces. Need to here to remember the troublemakers. As I said on the phone, I'm sure that girl you was looking for came in here just over a week ago. 
Friday night with a bloke. It was lucky. The tapes normally get wiped after a week, but we've had a bit of bother. You won't bust us or anything. Grace grinned. I'm not interested in busting you. I just want to find Janie Stretton's killer. OK, we're cool. Then Ricky frowned. What was that stuff I read about a beetle? A scarab. It's not important, Grace replied, a little more curtly than he'd intended. Just interested because we got one in here, on a shelf in the VIP room. A little bronze, part of the decor. Pushing the ball of bronze shit. Yuck. Where did you get it from? Grace asked. Dunno. The interior decorator was responsible for all that stuff. Ricky picked up a remote control and pressed a button. Watch the monitor in the centre, he said. There was a flicker that momentarily turned into a blur, then a series of images dropped down as if the horizontal hold was on the blink. The image stabilised, showing a wide-angle sweep of the very crowded bar, with the date and time running in the bottom right-hand corner. Watch the door, the one that goes out the front. Now, Ricky said, sounding excited. Grace saw a muscular man in his thirties with a lean, hard face and a mean king-of-the-jungle expression walking in towing a girl with long hair, dressed in a tight-fitting miniskirt. It was Janie Stretton. No question. He studied her companion carefully, watching his strutting gait, which reminded him of the way Paris walked, as if ready to take on all comers. The man had gelled spikes of short hair, sported a thick chain around his neck and was dressed in a singlet and slacks. Holding Janie Stretton's hand all the way, he cut a swathe through the crowd and went straight up to the bar, at which point the camera, moving in a steady arc, lost them. A few minutes later, the camera picked them up again. The man was holding a pint glass of beer and she had a cocktail of some sort. The man clinked his glass against hers, then, in a curious movement, slid his free hand around her neck, appeared to grab a clump of her hair, pulled her head back and coarsely kissed her neck. Nick Nickel had the photographs of Janie Stretton on his lap and was alternately looking down at them, then up at the screen. It's her, he said. No question, Grace confirmed. Absolutely. Looking at the manager, he asked, Who's a squeeze? Dunno. Never seen him before. You're sure? Not 100%, no, I mean, we get an awful lot of people in here, but I don't think so. Grace's mobile phone rang. Without taking his eyes off the screen, he pulled it out of his pocket and glanced down at the display. It was Cleo Mori. Excusing himself, he hit the button to answer and stepped out of the office. She sounded very sweet and very humble. I just wondered if you were up for a drink tonight if you'd like to come over here. He melted at the sound of her voice. I'd love to, he said, but I have a good two hours' work to do. So, come over after that, for a nightcap. Um, he said, totally thrown. This was not the time or place for this sort of conversation. I've got wine, beer, vodka. Any whiskey, he teased. Now, that's a strange coincidence. I have a whole bottle of Glenfiddich I bought this afternoon. Obviously synchronicity, Grace said, trying to sound cooler than he felt and not succeeding. Obviously. Chapter 59 The family liaison officer who took over from Linda Buckley was a thin, overly polite young PC in his mid-twenties called Chris Willingham. He carried a small suitcase in which he claimed to have everything he needed for his night's vigil, and within minutes was happily installed in the living room with an iPod headset plugged into his ears and a copy of The Rough Guide to Croatia open on his lap. Glenn Branson had rung to say he was coming over again in an hour, making Tom wonder if he had any information. He was also determined to ask the detective why when he'd obviously recognised Reginald Diath as the dickhead on the train, he had not revealed this to him this afternoon at the CID headquarters. Tom left Chris Willingham with a black coffee and a plate of chocolate digestive biscuits and retreated to the sanctuary of his den with the Sunday Times, which he had not yet opened. 
Normally, on a Sunday evening, he and Kelly would flop out on the sofa in the living room with all the sections of the Sunday Times and Mail on Sunday strewn around the carpet. He always started with the business pages, looking for high-profile companies to target as potential customers. Kelly began with the Mail's You magazine. But it was a waste of time even looking at a paper tonight. All he saw was a blur of newsprint. He felt so alone, so afraid, so totally lost and scared. Scared witless for Kelly. Reginald Diaf, the dickhead on the train, the man who had left behind the CD, had been found murdered in his home, strangled in his bath, by... by the same people who had threatened to kill his own family, Tom wondered. On the news, it had been reported that Diaf, who had changed his name to Ron Dawkins, had done a deal with the prosecution in the forthcoming trial of a paedophile ring. So was it a professional hit? Or a revenge killing by a parent of a child he had abused? Or, he speculated wildly, the coil of fear in his stomach darkening all the time, was it punishment for losing the disc? The same punishment he and his family were threatened with because he had found it. Twenty-four hours ago, they had been drinking champagne in the drawing room of Philip Angelides's house. Not a great evening, but at least life had been normal. Now, he just didn't know what to do. He was trying to get his head around tomorrow, Monday, but was finding it hard to think more than a few minutes ahead. He couldn't cancel the presentation to Land Rover, and supposed he would have to delegate one of his team to do it for him, which would mean paying one of the two salesmen commission on the order if it came through, yet again reducing his margins and his ability to quote competitively. But at this moment, that was the least of his worries. Then he experienced a sudden flash of resentment towards Kelly. Irrational, he knew, but he couldn't help it. How can you bloody do this to me at a time like this? Almost immediately, he felt guilty for even thinking that. Christ, my darling, where the hell are you? He buried his face in his hands trying hard to think clearly through the fog of this nightmare and hating himself for being so damned helpless. It was over an hour later a blue saloon pulled up outside the house. Looking out of his den window, Tom saw Glenn Branson climb out of the driver's door and another man, white in his late thirties with close-cropped hair who looked every inch a copper, get out of the other side. He raced downstairs before they rang the bell and disturbed the kids and opened the door. Lady came bounding out into the hallway, but he managed to calm her and stop her barking. She had obviously recovered from the bug, or attempted poisoning. Good evening again, Mr Bryce. We're sorry to disturb you. No, thanks. I'm glad to see you. This is Detective Superintendent Grace, the senior investigating officer on this case, Branson said. Bryce stared briefly at the detective superintendent, surprised that he was so casually dressed. But then all he knew about the police was gleaned from the occasional episode of Morse or D.L. and Pasco or CSI. And thinking about it, detectives on those shows were often very casually dressed too. The man had a strong, pleasant face with laser-sharp blue eyes and a convincing air of authority. Thank you for coming over, Tom Bryce said, showing them in, then leading them through to the kitchen. No developments, Mr Bryce, Glenn Branson asked, pulling up a chair at the kitchen table. One, but I think you know that already. The man on the train was the paedophile who was found murdered today, Reginald Diath. I recognised his face on the news. Grace gave the room a quick sweep, absorbing the children's drawings on the wall the swanky fridge with the built-in television, the expensive-looking units. Then he sat down, keeping his eyes fixed on Tom Bryce's. I was very sorry to hear about your wife, Kelly, Mr Bryce. I'd just like to ask you a few questions to help us do all we can to assist in locating her. Of course. Watching Tom Bryce's eyes like a hawk, he asked, 
Can you tell me when you bought the Audi that was found burned out? The man's eyes swung immediately to the right. Yes, in March. From a local dealer? Again, the eyes went to the right. Establishing his memory was on the right side of his brain, which meant if his eyes swung left in response to a question, he would be accessing the creative side of his brain and would be in construct mode. Lying. But at this moment he was telling the truth. Yes, from Caffins. Grace pulled out his notebook. I'd like to start with some chronology. Can we run through the events leading up to the time when Kelly disappeared? Of course. Can I offer you something to drink? Tea or coffee? The SIO opted for a black coffee and Glenn Branson for a glass of tap water. Tom switched on the kettle and began to talk through in detail the events of yesterday evening. When he had finished, Grace asked, You and your wife didn't have a row or anything, either before you went out or on the way home? Not at all, Tom replied, his eyes briefly darting right again. He thought back to the drive home last night from the Angelides's. Kelly had been in a slightly strange mood, but she'd had plenty of those before and hadn't vanished afterwards. Can I ask a rather personal question? Grace said. Go ahead. Do you have a good marriage? Or are there any problems in your relationship? Tom Bryce shook his head. We don't have a good marriage. Then he said emphatically, We have a terrific marriage. The kettle started boiling. Tom was starting to stand up when Grace's next question nailed him back down to his chair. Is everything all right with your finances, Mr Bryce? From the look in those laser eyes, Tom could tell Grace knew something about his problems. Actually, they're not great, no. Did you have any life insurance cover on Mrs Bryce? Tom stood up angrily. What the hell are you getting at? I'm afraid I will have to ask you some very personal questions, Mr Bryce. If you would be more comfortable having a solicitor present, or if there are any you don't want to answer without one being present, that's your right. As the kettle switched itself off, Tom sat back down. I don't need anyone present. OK, thank you, Roy Grace said. So can you tell me if you have any life insurance cover on Mrs Bryce? The man's eyes darted again to the right. No, I had some on both of us, for the children's sake, but I had to cancel it a few months ago because of the cost. He stood up and went to make the coffee and run Branson a glass of water. Grace waited until he had sat back down and he could see his face clearly once more. Have you noticed any change in Mrs Bryce's behaviour in recent months? And now Grace saw the flickering hesitation in Tom Bryce's eyes. They darted very definitely to the left, to construct mode. He was about to lie to them. No, not at all. Then, immediately after Tom had said this, he wondered whether it was time to come clean and tell them about the vodka and about her strange Kelly moments. But he was scared that if he did, they might lose interest. So what the hell was the point in telling them? Grace picked up his coffee cup, then set it down again without bringing it to his lips. Again, fixing on Bryce's eyes, he asked, Do you have any concerns that Kelly might be having an affair? Eyes securely right again. Absolutely none. We have a strong marriage. Roy Grace continued with his questions for another half an hour, at the end of which Tom felt the detective superintendent had expertly and thoroughly, and at times more than a little unpleasantly, filleted him. He felt drained as he finally closed the door on them at almost eleven o'clock, and also uncomfortable. It seemed from the DS's questions and the way he had reacted to Tom's answers that he was to the police a prime suspect. This was something he wanted to change quickly, because all the time they were suspicious of him, they would be focusing their energies in the wrong direction. And he realised he had forgotten to ask DS Branson why he had kept quiet about the dickhead's identity this afternoon. 
Tom popped his head round the living room door to see the FLO engrossed in his book. He told him to help himself to anything he fancied in the kitchen and apologised for not having a spare bed. DC Willingham told him he had had some sleep during the day and planned to stay up all night. Then Tom climbed upstairs to his den, far too keyed up to contemplate sleep. He had some important emails to write about the morning's presentation and somehow had to find the strength to concentrate on them. He tapped the return key on his laptop to wake it up. Moments later, a load of emails downloaded, 20, 30, 40. The junk mail filter picked up most of them, leaving just half a dozen. Three were from friends, no doubt containing jokes. One was from Olivia, his ever-efficient secretary, listing the week's appointments and reminding him what he needed for the presentation in the morning. One was from Ivanhoe, the web doctor site he subscribed to but rarely had time to read properly. The last one was from Postmaster at scarab.tisana.al. The header read simply, Private and Confidential. He double-clicked to read the email. The text was brief and unsigned. Kelly has a message for you. Remain online. Chapter 60 at 11.15pm, Emma Jane Boutwood and Nick Nickel were still at their desks at the workstation. The rest of the team had left, heading home to their lives one by one, with the exception of Norman Potting, who was just getting to his feet now, straightening his tie and pulling on his jacket. A handful of people remained at the other two stations. The surfaces were littered with empty coffee cups, soft drink cans, food cartons, and the waste bins were overflowing. The room was always fresh first thing in the morning, Emma Jane thought, and by late evening it smelled like an institutional canteen, a faintly sickly confection of aromas, onion bargees from the deli counter of the Asda supermarket across the road, pot noodles, potato soup, microwaved burgers and fries, and coffee. Potting gave a long yawn, then burped. Oops, he said. Pardon me? <clears throat> them Indian things always do that to me. He hesitated for a moment, getting no reaction. Well, I'm off then. Then he lingered where he was. Either of you care for a quick jar? One for the road on the way home? I know a place that'll serve us. Both shook their heads. Nick Nickel was engrossed in what appeared to be, at least to Emma Jane, a difficult personal call on his mobile. From the few words she had caught, it sounded as if he was trying to pacify his wife, who was upset about something. Probably that her husband was still at work at this hour on a Sunday. In a way, although she missed having a boyfriend, it was a year since she had broken up with Ollie, Emma Jane was relieved that she had no one in her life at the moment. It meant she could concentrate on her career and not have to feel guilty about the crazy hours she put in. Ignoring the fact that Nickel was talking, Potting leaned closer to his face and asked, Don't suppose you heard the cricket score? I was trying to find it on the net. Nickel glanced up at him, shook his head, then focused on his call again. Hesitating again, Potting dug his hands in his trouser pockets and repeated, Well, I'm off then. Emma Jane raised a hand. Bye. Have a nice evening. Just about time to get home and back before tomorrow, he growled. See you at 8.30. Look forward to it, she said a touch facetiously, taking a sip of mineral water from a bottle. She watched him walk across the room, a shapeless man in a badly creased suit. Although she found him gross, in truth she felt a little sorry for him because he seemed so desperately lonely. She resolved to try to be nicer to him tomorrow. She screwed the cap back on the bottle, then resumed working her way through the statements from Reggie Diath's neighbours, which had been taken down earlier today by the House-to-House -house inquiry team. She was also working on trying to find out more information about the white Ford Transit van that had been clocked outside his house the previous night by one of the dead man's neighbours. Even though the Diath murder inquiry was being run by a different team, Grace believed it had enough relevance to Operation Nightingale for his team to be fully up to speed on all aspects of the inquiry at this stage. On her desk was the licence number GU03OAG. 
Its registered owner was a company called Born Holt International Limited, with an address a P.O. box number that she wouldn't be able to check out until the morning. When she'd shown it to Norman Potting earlier, he had told her that more than likely it was nothing more than an accommodation address. That seemed likely, as nothing came up for the name in a search on the internet. One of the phones on the workstation started ringing. Nick was still hunched over his desk talking into his mobile, so EJ picked up the receiver. Instant room, she said. The voice at the other end sounded brisk but courteous. Hi, it's Adam Davies here from Southern Resourcing Centre. Could you put me on to Detective Superintendent Grace? Southern Resourcing was the call handling centre where all non-emergency calls were answered and assessed by trained handlers like Davies. I'm afraid he's out at the moment. Can I help you? I need to speak to someone on Operation Nightingale. I'm DC Boutwood, part of the Operation Nightingale team, she replied, feeling proud at saying it. I have a gentleman by the name of Mr Siler on the line, phoning about a white van. I ran a registration check on the number he gave me and it came up on the system that DS Grace has put a PNC marker on this vehicle. I thought he might want to speak to the gentleman. You see the owner of it? No, apparently it's parked outside his flat. He made a complaint earlier this evening. It was logged at uh, 6.40pm. It was? Emma Jane said, surprised, wondering why this hadn't been picked up by anyone. Please put him on. Moments later, she was talking to an elderly, irate man with a guttural Germanic accent. Hello. Yes. You are not the police officer I'm speaking with earlier, he asked. Jamming the phone against her ear with her shoulder, the young detective constable was tapping the keyboard furiously. Seconds later, she found the 6.40pm entry logged by a Detective Sergeant John Rye of the High Tech Crime Unit. War driving... Sergeant Rye attended by phone. What on earth did that mean? I'm afraid it is Sunday night, sir. A lot of people have gone home. Yes, and the man in the white van is outside my apartment again, stealing my internet. It would be good if he went home. Stealing my internet, she thought. What on earth did that mean? But at this moment, she was more interested in the van. Can you read the registration number of the vehicle to me, sir? After a moment, and agonisingly slowly, he said, G for golf, U for uh, umbrella, zero, three, O, Oscar, A for alpha, G for golf. She wrote it down. G U zero three O A G. Suddenly, adrenaline coursing, Emma Jane was on her feet. Sir, let me have your number and I'll call you straight back. Your address is flat D138 Freshfield Road. He confirmed that it was and gave her the phone number. She tapped it straight into her mobile. Please don't go outside or frighten him off. I'll be with you in just a few minutes. I'm going to hang up and I will call you back in two minutes. Yes, he said. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Nick was still engrossed in his call and ignored her frantic gesticulations. In desperation, she physically pulled his phone away from his ear. Come with me, she said, now! Chapter 61 Tom, shaking with nerves, sat in his den with a tumbler of Glenfiddich, trying to focus on the emails he somehow had to send to his team tonight about the presentation tomorrow morning. Every couple of minutes, he clicked the send and receive button on his email, followed by a large sip of whiskey. At 11.20, his tumbler was empty and, in need of another, he went downstairs. PC Willingham was in the kitchen, making himself a coffee. Would you like one, Mr Bryce? he asked. Tom held up his glass and, aware his voice was slurring slightly, said, Thanks, but I need something a little stronger. I don't blame you. Would you like one? Tom offered, uncapping the bottle. Not on duty, thank you, sir, no. Tom gave him an it's-your-funeral shrug, filled the tumbler to the brim with whiskey, ice and water, but mostly whiskey, and went back upstairs. As he sat back down at his desk, he noticed another email had come in from postmaster at scarab.tisana.al with an attachment. The header said simply, Message from Kelly.
His hand was shaking so much he could barely steady the cursor on the attachment. He double-clicked. The attachment seemed to take forever to open. Then suddenly the entire screen went dark and Kelly's face appeared. Harshly lit like a solo performer on a stage under the glare of a single spotlight, she was staring straight ahead out of darkness. Still wearing her evening dress from last night, she was bound hand and foot and roped to a chair. A silver pendant Tom had never seen before hung from a chain around her neck. There was a large bruise below her right eye where it looked as if she had been punched and her lips looked swollen. She spoke in a choked, stilted tone, sounding as though she was attempting to recite from a memorised script. Tom stared at her, totally numb with shock, as if this wasn't real, was just a bad joke or a bad dream. Tom, please, watch me carefully and listen to me, Kelly said in a quavering voice. Why have you done this to me? Why did you ignore the instructions you were given not to go to the police? They are now punishing me because of your stupidity. She fell silent, tears flooding down her mascara-streaked cheeks. Steadily, the camera zoomed in tighter and tighter on her face, then even tighter, tilting down, favouring the pendant on the necklace, until the necklace filled the screen completely and the design engraved on it was clearly visible. It was a scarab beetle. Don't tell the police about this film, darling. Just do exactly what they tell you, otherwise it will be Max's turn next, then Jessica's. Don't try to be heroic. Please do what they tell you. It's... Her voice faltered. It's the only chance you and I have of ever seeing each other again. Please, please don't tell the police. They will know. These people know everything. Kelly's voice ripped through his soul like barbed wire. The screen went pitch black. Then he heard a sound. It started as a low whine, then steadily got louder and higher, more and more piercing. It was Kelly, he realised. She was screaming. Then silence. The film was at an end. The attachment closed. Tom vomited onto the carpet. Chapter 62 Nick Nickel drove the unmarked Vauxhall out of the security gates of Sussex House and floored the accelerator. Emma Jane on the radio gave instructions to the control centre operator. This is Golf Tango Julia Echo. We need uniform backup in the vicinity of Freshfield Road. The incident is at number 138, but I don't want anyone there to see or hear the car until I say so. That is very important, understood? She was shaking with nerves. This was the first serious incident she had been in control of, and she was conscious that she might be exceeding her authority. But what choice did she have? Can you confirm... Golf Tango, Julia Echo, dispatching uniform back up to vicinity of Freshfield Road, requesting total silence and invisibility until further instructions. ETA four minutes. They were racing down a long, steep hill. Emma Jane glanced at the speedometer, over 70 miles per hour. She dialed the number that Mr Siler had given her. Moments later, he answered. Mr Siler, it's Detective Constable Boutwood. We're on our way. Is the van still outside? Still outside! he confirmed. Would you like to go and speak with the driver? No, she implored. No, please don't do that. Please just stay indoors and watch him. I will stay on the line. Tell me what you can see. The flash of a Gatso speed camera behind them streaked around the car. Still maintaining his speed, DC Nickel continued down the hill, accelerating even harder as he saw a green light ahead of them. The bloody thing changed to red. Run it, she said to him. She held her breath as he edged over the line and made a sharp right turn, cutting dangerously in front of a car which hooted furiously at them. I am still seeing the white van, Mr Siler said. A man inside it. Just one man. They were driving along a dual carriageway, a 40 mph limit, the speedometer nudging 90. I only see one man. What's he doing? He has a laptop computer open. A second Gatso flashed. You'd better be right about this, Nick Nickel whispered. Otherwise my licence is toast. Streetlights sped past them. Tail lights appeared like in a DVD on fast forward. 
more lights flashed at them, angry drivers. Ignoring her colleague, she was totally focused on the informant. We're only a couple of minutes away, she said. So you want me outside now? No! Her voice came out as a shriek. Please stay inside. Nick Nickel braked, ran another red light, then made a sharp left up Elm Grove, a steep wide hill with houses and shops on either side. The sign Harmony Carpets above a shop front flashed past. What can you see now, Mr Siler? Nothing has changed. Suddenly the radio crackled. Golf Tango Juliet Echo, this is PC Godfrey, Uniform Delta Zebra Bravo. We're approaching Freshfield Road, ETA 30 seconds. Stop where you are, she said, suddenly feeling incredibly important and very nervous of fouling up. They passed the gloomy buildings of Brighton General Hospital, where her grandmother had died of cancer last year, then made a lurching, tyre-squealing dog-leg right into Freshfield Road. Emma Jane glanced at the street numbers. 256. 254, 248. Turning to Nick Nickel, she said, OK, slow down. There's a mini roundabout ahead. It will be on the other side of that. As they drove on, she suddenly saw the white Ford Transit about 200 yards ahead of them, its taillights glowing red. And now her heart really began to race. Within a few seconds, she could read the number plate. GU03OAG. She hit the radio button. Uniform Delta Zebra Bravo, there is a white Ford Transit outside number 138 Freshfield Road. Please intercept. Then she turned to Nick Nickel. Go for it. Pull up in front. Block it. She unclipped her seatbelt. Within seconds, they were sliding to a halt, angled in front of the van, and Emma Jane had her door open before they had even stopped moving. She clambered out and grabbed the driver's door of the transit. It was locked. She heard a siren, saw blue flashing lights skidding across the black tarmac heard the transit starter motor and the revving of its engine. Her arm was yanked almost out of its socket as the van jerked backwards. She heard the splintering crunch of metal on metal and glass. Then her arm was jerked forwards as the van accelerated, ramming the Vauxhall. The air was filled with the howling sound of an engine over-revving, the acrid reek of burning tyres, then a shriek of metal as the Vauxhall lurched sideways. She heard Nick shout, Stop! Police! then another scream of bending metal. She hung on for grim life. Suddenly her feet were swept away. The van was accelerating clear. It swerved sharply to the left and her legs trailed in the air, then to the right, towards a line of parked cars. She felt a moment of blind terror. Then all the air was shot out of her. She felt a terrible pressure, then heard a dull crunching sound like breaking glass and metal. In the seconds of agony, before she passed into oblivion, her hands giving up their grip, her body rolling into the gutter, she realised it wasn't glass and metal that had made that sound. It was her own bones. Nick saw her lying in the road and hesitated for a moment. Glancing in his mirror, he saw the marked police car a long way back. Ahead of him, the transit's taillights were disappearing down the hill. In a split-second decision, he accelerated after it, shouting into his radio, Man down! We need an ambulance! Within seconds, he was gaining on the vehicle. He jolted over a speed hump. There were red traffic lights at the bottom of the hill, the junction with Eastern Road. The transit would have to stop or at least slow down. It did neither. As the van ran the junction, Nick saw the glare of headlights and moments later, a Skoda taxi strike the driver's door broadside. He heard a loud, dull, metallic bang like two giant dustbins swung together. The transit spun and came to a halt, spewing steam, oil and water, its horn blaring, shards of glass and metal lying all around, one wheel buckled and at a skewed angle, almost parallel with the ground, the tyre flat. The Skoda, slewing, carried on for some yards, making a high-pitched metallic grinding sound, steam pouring from its bonnet. Then it mounted the pavement, hit the wall of a house and bounced a few feet back. Nickel halted his car, radioing for the emergency services, then jumped out and sprinted to the van. But as he reached it, he realised there had been no need to hurry. The windscreen was cracked and stained with blood. The driver was slumped sideways, his body partially draped over the steering wheel, his neck twisted, his face gashed open in several places, tilted up at the cracked windscreen. His eyes closed. Steam continued rising and there was a stink of diesel. 
Nick Nickle tried to open the buckled door, but it was still locked. He pulled hard, nervous the van might catch fire, then harder, wrenching at it with all his strength. Finally, it opened a few inches. He was conscious of vehicles stopping. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw two people at the taxi pulling the driver's door open and another person struggling with the rear passenger door. Nick yanked harder still on the transit door. It yielded a little more. And as it did so, he caught sight of a glow coming from the passenger footwell. A laptop computer, he realised. Squeezing through the door, Nick peered at the man's face closely. He was breathing. One of the principal lessons he had learned in first aid was never to move the victim of an accident unless it was to get them out of danger. He reached past the man and turned the ignition off. There was no smell of burning. He decided to wait, then went round to the other side of the van and removed the laptop, with presence of mind only touching the machine through his handkerchief. Then, desperately worried about Emma Jane, he radioed to ask the status of the emergency vehicles. As he did so, he could already hear sirens. And, on top of his concern about the young detective constable, he had another worry. Roy Grace was not going to be a happy bunny when he heard about this crash. Chapter 63 At half past eleven, Roy Grace parked his Alfa Romeo on a single yellow line outside the unlit shop window of a dealer specialising in retro 20th century furniture. He climbed out, locked the door and stood in the orange sodium glow of the street lighting in front of the wrought iron gates of the converted warehouse where Cleo lived. For some moments, he stared at the entry phone panel, feeling a confusion of emotions. Part of him was angry, part of him nervous about what she was going to say, and part of him was just plain low. For the first time since Sandy had vanished, he felt something for another woman. During brief moments when he had been awake last night and not thinking about Janie Stretton's murder, he had actually dared allow himself to think that it might be possible to start a new life, and that it could maybe have been with Cleo Morey. Then her text had arrived. Fiancé. Just what the hell was all that about? Who was this man? Some dribbling, chinless wonder from her posh background who Mummy and Daddy approved of with a Porsche and a country estate. How on earth could she have failed to mention that she was engaged? And why did she want to see him now? To apologise for last night? And tell him that the snog in the back of the taxi had been a terrible, drunken mistake and they needed to be grown up about it as they had to work together? And why had he come? He shouldn't be here. He should either be back at his desk in the major incident suite or, at this late hour on a Sunday night, heading home to bed to be fresh for the morning's briefing and all the follow-ups he needed to do on Janie Stretton, as well as keeping on top of the progress of the Suresh Hussain trial. In his mind, he was turning over the interview he had just come from with Tom Bryce. As part of Grace's training in recent years, he had attended several psychological profiling courses, but he had never found them that helpful. They could give you useful clues if you were having to pick between three different suspects, perhaps, but nothing he had learned was helping him at this moment assess whether Tom Bryce was acting his grief and concern or whether it was real. But the man had very definitely told one lie. Have you noticed any change in Mrs Bryce's behaviour in recent months? No, not at all. What was that all about? Bryce was covering up something. Did he suspect she might be with a lover? Or have left him? And despite all his sympathy for the man, it was this moment of hesitation, this lie, that had sowed sufficient doubt in Grace's mind to prevent him from pushing all the buttons tonight for a full-scale hunt for Kelly Bryce. He would suggest to Assistant Chief Constable Alison Vosper in the morning that Cassie and Pugh be put in charge of the woman's disappearance. And, with luck, the smug little shit would end up with a lot of bright yellow yoke all over his face on his very first job. How sweet that would be. He stared at the entry phone panel and felt butterflies in his stomach. Get a grip, man. Standing here on a doorstep like a pathetic teenager at half-past bloody eleven on a Sunday night. 
He felt tired suddenly, drained. For a moment, anger flared up inside him. Anger at Cleo and at himself for being so weak in coming here. And he was tempted to go back to his car and drive home. He turned, felt in his pocket for his keys, and was in the process of pulling them out when he heard her voice sounding strangely distorted through the speakerphone. Hi. And that voice did something to him. It totally energised him. Pizza, he said in a bad Italian accent. You have a order, a pizza. She laughed. Come into the courtyard and turn right. Number six, far end on the left. I hope you didn't forget the extra anchovies. The lock opened with a sharp click. He pushed the heavy gate open, digging in his pocket, suddenly remembering his chewing gum, and popped a stick in his mouth as he walked across the spotless cobblestones illuminated by a row of lights inside glass domes. As he reached her door, he put the gum back in its foil wrapper and balled it into his pocket. The door opened before he had even pressed the bell, and Cleo stood there, barefoot in tight jeans and a loose blue sweatshirt. Some of her hair clipped up, the rest loose. Her face was pale. She was wearing hardly any makeup, yet she looked more beautiful than ever. She greeted him with a meek smile and a round eyed, guilty sort of look, like a child who has done something just a little bit naughty. Hi, she said and gave a little shrug. Grace shrugged back. Hi. There was an awkward silence, as if each of them was waiting for the other to offer a kiss. Neither did. She stepped aside for him to come in, then closed the door behind him. He entered a large, open-plan living room, softly lit with a dozen or more small white candles and some hip, ultra-modern lights. There was a strong scent in the room, faintly sweet, musky, feminine, and very seductive. The room had a good vibe. He felt instantly relaxed, could feel it was every inch Cleo. Cream walls and throw rugs on a polished oak floor, two red sofas, black lacquered furniture, funky abstract paintings, an expensive-looking television, and a Latino song from El Divo playing quietly but assertively from four seriously cool-looking black speakers. There were several lush green plants, and, in a square glass fish tank on the coffee table, a solitary goldfish was swimming around through the remains of a submerged miniature Greek temple. Still up for a whiskey? Cleo asked. I think I need one. Ice? Lots. Water? Just a splash. He walked over to the tank. That's fish, she said. Fish, meet Detective Superintendent Roy Grace. Hi, fish, he said. Then, turning to Cleo, added, I have a goldfish too. I remember you told me. Marlin, right? Good memory. Uh-huh. It's better than a goldfish's. I read that they can only remember things for twelve seconds. I can sometimes remember things for a whole day. Grace laughed, but it was forced laughter. The atmosphere between them was strained, like two boxers in a ring waiting for the bell for the first round to clang. Cleo went out of the room, and Grace took the opportunity to take a closer look round. He walked over to a framed photograph, which shared a small side table with a rubber plant. It showed a handsome, distinguished-looking man in his early fifties, dressed in top hat and tails, next to a fine-looking woman in her mid to late forties, who bore a striking resemblance to Cleo in a stunningly elegant outfit and a large hat. There were dozens of people similarly attired in the background. Grace wondered if it was the royal enclosure at Ascot, although he had never been there. Then he wandered over to a floor-to-ceiling stack of crammed bookshelves. He picked out a row of Graham Greene novels, a set of Samuel Pepys's diaries, several crime novels from Val McDermott, Simon Brett, Ian Rankin and Mark Timlin, a Jeanette Winterson, two James Herbert novels, an Alice Siebold, a Jonathan Franzen, The Corrections, a row of Tom Wolfe, bios of Maggie Thatcher and Clinton, an eclectic mixture of chiclet, an ancient copy of Grey's Anatomy and, to his surprise, a copy of Colin Wilson's The Occult. Cleo came back into the room holding two glasses, ice cubes clinking. 
You read a lot? he asked. Not enough, but I'm a compulsive book buyer. Do you? He loved books and bought several every time he went into a bookshop, but he rarely ended up reading them. I wish I had the time. I mostly end up reading reports. She handed him a hefty glass tumbler filled with whiskey on the rocks, and they sat down together on a sofa, keeping a space between them. She raised her glass of white wine. Thank you for coming. He shrugged, wondering what bombshell she was going to hit him with. Instead, she said, Cheers, Big Ears. Big Ears? Here goes, Nose. He frowned. You don't know this? No. Cheers, Big Ears, she said. Here goes, Nose. Up your bum chum. She raised her glass and took a long swig. Shaking his head in bewilderment, he took a swig of the whiskey. It was dangerously good. What does that mean? Cheers, Big Ears. Here goes, Nose. Up your bum chum. Grace shook his head, not getting it. Just a saying, I have to teach it to you. He looked at Cleo, then down at his drink, and sipped some more, changing the subject. So, do you want to tell me about, um, Mr. Wright? Your fiancé? This ends Disc 9. Looking Good Dead Disc 10 Cleo took another gulp of wine. He watched her, loving the way she drank. No delicate, prissy little sip, but a proper mouthful. Richard. Is that his name? I didn't tell you his name. She sounded astonished. Actually, no. It sort of escaped your mind last night, and on our previous date. She peered into her wine glass, as if staring at ancient runes. But... Everyone... Everyone knows about him. I mean, I thought... You must know. I'm clearly not everyone. He's been driving the team at the mortuary nuts for months. Grace rattled the ice cubes around in his glass. I'm not sure I'm on your bus. Number 42, she said. The meaning of everything? The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Right, he said, the penny dropping. He wondered for a moment whether Cleo was drunk, but she didn't look drunk, not even tipsy. I'm sorry. I'm lost. You have a fiancé who's been driving everyone nuts. I thought you knew, she said, looking very meek suddenly. Oh, shit, you didn't, did you? Nope. She drained her glass. Oh, God! Then she tilted the glass as if searching for a few more drops of precious alcohol. Actually, that's totally the wrong word to use. The God word, she shrugged again. You want to fill me in? You want the full Richard download? Might be a good starting point. Richard and I met about three years ago. He's a barrister. He came to the mortuary because he wanted to view a body in a murder case he was defending. She raised her glass expectantly, then looked disappointed when she saw it was empty. I liked him. We started going out. My parents liked him. My brother and sister both thought he was lovely, and about a year and a half ago we got engaged. But about the same time I discovered I had a big rival. God. God? She nodded. He found God. Or God found him. Whatever. Lucky Richard, Grace said. Very lucky, she said with a trace of sarcasm. I envy anyone who finds God. How nice to be able to abdicate all your responsibilities to God. Suddenly she stood up. You need any more whiskey? Grace looked at his tumbler, which was still three quarters full. I'm fine, thanks. I have to drive. Cleo went out of the room, returned with a full wine glass, and sat back down much nearer this time. He started taking me to a charismatic church in Brighton, she said. But it just wasn't for me. I tried it because at the time I loved him, but all it did was start pulling us apart. And his solution was to pray even more?
Right. Now, you know, you're quite astute for a copper. Grace gave her a pointed look but couldn't mask his grin. Thanks a lot. She chinked her glass against his. He started making me kneel with him, praying for an hour, sometimes even longer, asking God to make our relationship better. After a while, I just couldn't hack it. Why not? Because I'm just not a believer. Not in anything. I spend my days cutting bodies open. You know what I do. I haven't yet found a soul in any of them. She swigged some wine down. Do you believe? I believe in some form of existence beyond death, but I have a problem with religion. That puts us on the same bus, she said. I saw Colin Wilson's The Occult on your bookshelf. All that stuff intrigues me. I know you're into that, and that's fine. You can believe in ghosts in some kind of spirit world. But you don't necessarily have to believe in some kind of monotheistic god, right? Grace nodded. I broke it off with Richard six months ago and he can't accept it. He's convinced God will fix it for us. It's hurt his career too. He spends more and more time praying for God to help him with his cases instead of reading up the briefs. I'm sorry. I look at all the shit that's happening in the world and mostly it's caused by people under some kind of delusion about their particular version of God. Sometimes I don't think Richard's obsession is that far removed from that of a Muslim suicide bomber. It's all part of the same damn belief system that it's not this life that matters, it's the next one. What a crap idea. Shall we change the subject? Grace drank some more whiskey. What would you like to talk about? She set her glass down, then removed his glass from his hand and put that down also. She wrapped her arms around his neck and whispered into his ear, How about we don't talk at all for a few minutes? Then she pressed her lips against his. They were soft, so incredibly soft. He breathed in her musky perfume, the smell of her freshly washed hair, felt her soft, sweet tongue deep inside his mouth, felt her pulling him deeper and deeper into her body as if she was gathering him in like folds of silk. And somehow their bodies entwined, their lips never parting, they were climbing steep stairs. One flight, two flights. He wasn't counting. He was shuffling across a polished wood floor, then across a deep rug. El Devo was still playing a soft, jazzy song now. Candles, flames guttering, lined the walls, and she was still kissing him, exploring his teeth with her tongue, then the roof of his mouth, then dueling with his tongue. And he felt, oh, Jesus, deep fire in his groin, bursting. An electrical current was running inside his belly, shooting tiny, wonderful sparks through his body. He opened his eyes, saw her pale blue eyes smiling back at him. She was unbuttoning his shirt and suddenly pressing her mouth moist and soft against each of his eyes in turn, and it was as if someone had turned up the current. She kissed his forehead, then his cheek, then his lips again, then again. It was so good, he was hurting. Just a few times in the past nine years, he had dialed a number in the personal ads in the Argus and ended up in seedy basements in Brighton. One time he'd had a hand job from a fat Spanish girl, another time he'd had oral sex from a Thai, and there had been a third embarrassing time when he had been barely able to raise it for a thin local girl with a coarse voice and a flat chest. Maybe because in his mind Sandy had been standing in that room. But she wasn't here now. Cleo's slender fingers were fumbling with his belt. Another kiss on his neck, right under his chin. He heard the clank of the buckle. Another kiss on his neck, lower now. Then suddenly he felt the release of his trousers opening, felt her hands inside his boxers, so warm and so incredibly, deliciously, sensually cold at the same time. Oh my God! He winced, feeling almost deliriously aroused. But he was determined to make this last a long, long time. She smiled at him, the most totally, utterly dirty smile he had ever seen in his life. Then she was working on his shirt buttons again, undoing each one in sequence, pushing the fabric wider open. Then she pressed her lips against his right nipple and he thought he was going to die of joy. 
She continued working on him slowly, setting her own slow, so slow, so tantalizingly slow pace. She pinched his left nipple with her fingers softly, then firmly, staring him in the face again now, smiling that wicked, beautiful, so incredible, so incredibly dirty smile. And he was so hard he could barely endure it one second longer. Her tongue pushed deep in his belly button. Her hands were working his trousers and boxers together downwards, down over his calves, right down to his shoes. Then she took him in her mouth. Air shot out of his lungs, air from deep inside him, from some place or zone he didn't know even existed anymore, that he thought had long ago died. And he slid his hands under her sweatshirt, felt the flesh, the soft flesh of her toned midriff, pulled the sweatshirt slowly, steadily upwards, not wanting this moment to end, not wanting to remove it, just wanting to be here forever, sliding her top upwards forever, for all the days, hours, minutes, seconds, nanoseconds, picoseconds, femtoseconds of his life, frozen in time. Then he touched her breasts, no bra, just large, much larger than he had imagined, firm, round, and she let out a moan as he touched them, then took him in her mouth again, deeper, far deeper. Moments later, with his shoes still on and his trousers and boxers around his ankles, they were lying on a leopard-skin print throw on her bed, staring at each other in silence. He slid his hand across her shoulders, feeling her strong shoulder blades, the contours of her back, her warm skin, and he was thinking and he was trying not to think this, but he couldn't help it, how so different she felt to Sandy. Not better, just different. Flashes of Sandy began coming into his mind. Comparisons. Sandy was shorter, her body fleshier, less well-toned. Her breasts were smaller, a different shape, her nipples larger, pinker. Cleo's were smaller, like crimson studs. Sandy's pubes were brown, a wild tangle. Cleo's were the winter wheat colour of her hair, trimmed, neat. She was entwined around him, her fine, strong limbs like some amazing pedigree racehorse, writhing, whispering, Roy, you are amazing. God, Roy, I've wanted this for so long. Make love to me. And he was gathering her up into him, not able to get enough of her, as if he was lost in some fairy tale. She was trying to pull him inside her, but he wasn't ready, not yet. It had been so long he was trying to remember, had to hold back, had to remember how to hold back. Had to slow everything down somehow, had to please her first. That had always been his private rule with Sandy and with the small number of girlfriends he had slept with before her. He moved down her body caressing her breasts with his lips, then the contours of her stomach, running his tongue through the soft bristles of those winter wheat hairs, and then tasting her moistness, breathing it in, an incredible taste, smell, and even more intoxicating muskiness than the perfume she was wearing. She was moaning. Oh, God, she tasted so good. So good. So damn beautifully good. His phone started ringing. She giggled. The phone persisted. Then it stopped. He went in deeper with his tongue. Roy, she murmured. Roy, oh, Roy. Oh, my God, Roy. Two sharp beeps from his bloody phone. A message. He was beyond caring. Chapter 64 Chris Willingham stared at the hysterical man with puke spattered down the front of his T-shirt, standing in the doorway of the living room, screaming at him, and tried desperately to remember from his recent training how to deal with a situation like this. You've got to do something, please! You have to do something! You have to help me find my wife! Talk quietly, he remembered. That was the first thing. So, in a soft voice, he said... What's happened, exactly? She's screaming! She's terrified out of her fucking wits, OK? 
Tom Bryce entered the room and grabbed him by the shoulders. You've got to fucking do something! The young family liaison officer gagged at the stench of the vomit. Keeping his voice soft, he said, Tell me, Mr Bryce, what's happened? Tom Bryce turned and walked out of the room. Come on, come and see, she's on my computer! The PC followed Tom up the stairs and into the small den lined with books and files and framed photographs of his wife and children. He saw a laptop on the desk, the lid open, the screen blank. Tom Bryce tapped the carriage return on the keyboard and his email inbox appeared. The stench of vomit was even stronger in here and Willingham, concentrating on the screen, carefully stood clear of the mess on the carpet. He watched Bryce sit down, stare at the screen, frown, then search down through it. It was here, Tom said. It was here. An email with a fucking attachment. Oh, Jesus, where the hell is it? Willingham said nothing. Tom seemed a little calmer for a moment. Then he appeared to lose it again. It was here! Tom stared in disbelief. The bloody email had vanished. He tapped in as a search key, one after another, every word from the email that he could remember. But nothing appeared. He sank forward, cradling his head in his hands, sobbing. Please help me. Oh, please do something. Please find her. Please do something. Oh, Christ, you should have heard her. You saw her on your screen? Tom nodded. But she's not there now. No! Willingham wondered about the man's sanity. Was he imagining something? Flipping under the pressure. Let's take it from the top, shall we, sir? Trying to keep calm, Tom talked him through exactly what he had seen and what Kelly had said. If you received an email, the PC said, then it must be on your computer somewhere. Tom searched the deleted folder the junk mail folder, then the rest of the folders in his email database. It had gone. And he began to wonder just for a moment whether he had imagined it. But not that scream. No way. He turned to the constable. You are probably thinking I imagined it, but I didn't. I saw it. (laughs) Whoever these people are, they're clever with technology. It's happened before. I've had emails this week that vanished, wiping my entire database out. Willingham stood there, unsure what to believe or what to do. The man was in a bad state, but did not seem mad, just in shock. Something had happened for sure, but in his limited knowledge of computers, emails did not just disappear. They might get misfiled. That had happened to him. Let's try again, sir. Let's go through all your files one at a time. It was past midnight by the time they finished. Still, they had not found it. Tom looked up at him, imploring, What are we going to do? The FLO was thinking hard. We could try the high-tech crime unit, but I doubt if anyone will be there at this hour on a Sunday night. How about the technical support of your internet service provider? They might be 24-hour. Then he frowned. I, uh, actually, on second thought, I need to run this by DS Grace first. Well, let me just try, Tom said. He looked up the number and dialed it. An automated response put him on hold. After ten minutes of drecky music, a human voice came on the line, an Indian accent, helpful and eager to please. After a further ten minutes that felt like ten hours, he came back and reported that he could find no sign of the email or the attachment. Tom slammed the phone down in fury. In a tone that told Tom the FLO was becoming increasingly sceptical, Willingham asked... What were the exact words your wife said to you? Trying desperately to think clearly, Tom related her words as accurately as he could remember. She said, Don't tell the police. Do exactly what they tell you. Otherwise, it will be Max next, then Jessica. Please do exactly what you're told. You must not tell the police. They will know if you do. Who are they? I don't know he said, feeling so utterly helpless. Willingham pulled out his digital radio. Tom immediately clamped his hand over it. No! There was a long silence between them. 
Several more emails came in and the junk filter deleted them. Tom checked the folders. Nothing. Finally, Willingham said, I think I should file a report on this. No! Tom snapped back. It will be secure, sir. I will only file it on the police system. No! Taken aback by the man's vehemence, the constable raised his hands. OK, sir, no problem, he grimaced. How about I make a cup of tea for us both, or a coffee, and we have a think about what to do next? Coffee, Tom said. Coffee would be good, thank you. Uh, black, no sugar. The constable left the room. Tom continued to stare at the screen. His entire life lay somewhere beyond its horizon. A new email came in. It was from postmaster at scarab.tisana.al. Instantly he clicked on it. Congratulations, Tom. You're cottoning on fast. Now get out of the house, take Kelly's car, head north on the A23 London Road and wait for her to call you. I don't like you ignoring my instructions not to talk to the police. If you say one word, just one word, to your new best friend, your rookie cop housekeeper, then, my friend, you will never see your wife alive again. Don't attempt to reply to this email and don't bother searching for the hidden camera. You're looking at it. Chapter 65 Cleo smiled at him, her face so gentle and beautiful in the glow of the candlelight. Mellow jazz was playing in the background. Roy Grace could feel her warm, sweet breath on his face, saw strands of her tousled hair on her cheeks. That wasn't bad, she whispered. For a copper. She gave him a playful punch. Then she cupped his face in her hands and kissed him on the mouth. The bed felt so comfortable. Cleo felt so comfortable, so good to be with, as if he'd known her for years, as if they were the bestest ever mates in all the world. He caressed her skin, a deep, warm glow inside him. He felt utterly, sublimely at peace. He was, for this fleeting moment at least, in a space he never believed he could ever find again in his life. Then he remembered his phone ringing earlier, the beep of a message which he had ignored and should not have, and he looked at the clock, emitting weak blue light on the bedside table. 1.15am. Shit! He rolled over, groped on the floor, found his phone and pulled it to his ear, hitting the message retrieval button. It was Glenn telling him to call if he picked the message up before midnight, otherwise to wait until the morning. He put the phone back down, relieved. I'm glad you came over, Cleo murmured. It was the lure of Glenfiddich, that was all. Can't resist it. So you really are that shallow, are you, Detective Superintendent Roy Grace? She teased. Anything for a free drink? Mm-hmm. And maybe I was just a tiny bit curious about your fiancé. How shallow does that make me? He took a sharp breath as she suddenly cupped his balls in her hands. You know what they say, Detective Superintendent? She squeezed gently. Gasping with pleasure and just a tiny bit of pain, he said, What do they say? When you have a man's balls in your hands, his heart and mind will follow. He exhaled sharply, deliciously, as she released the pressure a tiny bit. So, um, talk me through your plans for the rest of the night, he whispered. She increased the pressure, then kissed him again. You're not in a very good position to negotiate whatever my plans are. Who's negotiating? You think you are? She removed her hands rolled out of the bed and padded across the room. He watched her slender, naked body, her long legs, her firm, round, pale and gorgeous bum disappear through the doorway. Then he put his arms behind his head and lay back against a soft, deep down pillow. Plenty of ice, he called out. She returned a few minutes later with two rattling glass tumblers and handed one to him. Climbing back into bed beside him, she raised her glass and clinked it against his. With a toss of her head, she said, Cheers, Begears. 
Here goes, Nose. Up your bum, chum. Then she downed half her glass. He raised his glass. Cheers, big ears, he responded, then took a deep swig. Tomorrow was a million miles away. Her eyes fixed on his were sparkling. So you came over just because you wanted to know about my fiancé? Was that the only reason, Detective Superintendent Roy Grace? Stop calling me that! What do you want me to call you? The bonk at the end of the universe? Grinning, he said that would be fine. Otherwise, just Roy would be fine too. She tilted her glass to her mouth, then leaned across, kissed him sensuously on his mouth, and pushed a whiskey-flavoured ice cube in through his lips. Roy! It's a great name. Why did your parents call you Roy? I never asked. Why not? He shrugged. It never occurred to me. Then you're a detective. I thought you queried everything. Why did your parents call you Cleo? Because, she gave a little giggle. Actually, I'm embarrassed to say. It was because my mother's favourite novels were the Alexandria Quartet. I was named after one of the characters, Clea, except my father spelt it wrong in the church register. He put an O on the end instead of an A and it stuck. I've never heard of the Alexandria Quartet. Come on, you must have read them. I must have had a deprived childhood or a misspent one. Could you play poker when you were twelve? That's what I mean. God, you need educating. The Alexandria Quartet were four novels written by Lawrence Durrell. Beautiful stories, all interlinked. Justine, Balthazar, Mount Olive and Claire. They must be if, if what? If they resulted in you. Then his phone rang again, and this time he answered it very reluctantly. Two minutes later, even more reluctantly, he was standing by the bed hurriedly and clumsily pulling his socks on. Chapter 66 You scare easily, don't you, Kelly? Dazzled by the light in her eyes, Kelly squirmed against the bonds holding her, trying to move back in her chair, trying to move away from the wriggling legs of the hideous black beetle the fat, squat American was holding up to her face. No! Please! No! Just one of my pets, he leered. What do you want from me? What do you want? Suddenly he removed the beetle and was holding out the neck of a vodka bottle. Drinkies! She turned her head away, shaking, from terror, from hunger, from withdrawal. Tears rolled down her cheeks. I know you want to drink, Kelly. Have some. It'll make you feel so much better. She desperately craved that bottle, wanted to take the neck in her mouth and gulp it down, but she was determined not to give him the satisfaction. Out of the corner of her eye, in the glare of the light, she could still see the wriggling legs. Have one little sip. I want my children, she said. I think you want the vodka more. Fuck you. She saw a shadow, then felt a fierce slap on her cheek. She cried out in pain. I'm not taking any shit from a little bitch, do you understand me? Fuck you. The next blow was so hard it knocked Kelly and the chair over sideways. She crashed with an agonising jar onto the rock-hard floor. Pain shot through her arm, her shoulder, right along her body. She burst into tears. Why are you doing this to me? She sobbed. What do you want from me? What do you want? How about a little obedience? He held the beetle up to her face so close she could smell its sour odour. She felt its feet scratch her skin. No! She writhed, rolling across the floor with the chair, crashing, banging, every bone in her body hurting. No! 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 Her breathing getting faster, gulping down air, hysterical. She felt a sudden wave of anger against Tom. Where was he? Why hadn't he come to find her, rescue her? Then she lay still, spent, staring up into dazzling light and darkness. Please, she pleaded. I don't know who you are. I just want my children, my husband. 
Please let me go. This must be something to do with the email Tom had seen that he had gone to the police with. She was certain. Why am I here? She asked, as if for confirmation. Silence. Are you angry with me? She whimpered. His voice was gentle suddenly. Only because you were misbehaving, Kelly. I'd just like you to cooperate. Then unfucking tie me. I don't think that's really possible at the moment. She closed her eyes, trying desperately to think clearly, to fight the terrible craving for alcohol, for just one tiny sip of that stolly. But she was not going to give this fat American the satisfaction. Never. No way in hell. No way. Never. 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 Then the craving took over her brain. Please, can I have a drink now? She asked. Moments later, the bottle was inside her lips, and she was greedily gulping the liquid down. Its effect on her was almost instant. God, it felt good. Maybe she was wrong about this man. Maybe he was kind after all. That's good, Kelly. Keep drinking. That's really good, isn't it? She nodded in gratitude. See, all I won't do is be nice to you. You be nice to me, and I'll be nice to you. Any part of that you don't understand? She shook her head, then felt bereft suddenly as he abruptly pulled the bottle away. And suddenly she was thinking clearly again, and every scary movie she had ever seen started playing in her mind simultaneously. Who the hell was this man? A serial killer? What was he going to do to her? Fear squirmed like some wild creature loose inside her. Was she going to be raped, tortured? I'm going to die here in the darkness, without ever seeing Jessica or Max or Tom again. How did you deal with a person like this? In films, she had seen prisoners trying to establish a relationship, a bond with their captors. It made it much harder for them to harm you if they got to know you a little. What's your name? She asked. I don't think you need to concern yourself about that, Kelly. I'd like to know. I'm going to leave you now for a little while. With a bit of luck, your husband will be joining you soon. Tom, you got it. Tom's coming. Tom's coming. You don't want him to see you lying on the floor like that, do you? She shook her head. I'll get you set up, Brad. Want you to look good for the camera. Camera? Uh huh. Feeling a little drunk, she asked, her voice slurring, S "Why camera? You're gonna be a star." Chapter sixty-seven. At one twenty-five a.m., there was a sudden burst of Jay Z as Glenn Branson's mobile phone rang in his bedroom. Hurriedly shooting his arm out to answer it and silence the bloody thing before it woke Ari, he knocked over the glass of water on his bedside table and sent the phone and his alarm clock thudding to the floor. He sprang out of bed in the darkness. His brain a little scrambled and scrabbled under the chair beside the table where the phone had fallen. The music getting louder. He finally grabbed hold of it and thumbed the answer button. "Dear Branson," he said, as hushed as he could, crouching as if somehow that would make his voice even quieter. It was Tom Bryce, and he sounded terrible. Detective Sergeant Branson, I'm sorry to call you so late. No, no worries, Tom. Just hold. For Christ's sake. Ari said, "You arrive home after midnight and wake me up, and now you're waking me up again. I think we should consider separate bedrooms." Then she pointedly turned over away from him. Great way to start the week, Branson thought gloomily, heading out of the room. He carried the phone into their bright orange bathroom and closed the door. Sorry about that. I'm with you now, he said, perching naked on the lavatory seat for want of anywhere else. So tell me. The room smelled of grout. He looked at the shiny new glass shower door fitted only last week, 
and the crazy tiger-striped tiles Ari had chosen and which the fitter had only finished putting up on Friday. They'd moved into the house three months ago. It was in a nice position, a short distance from both sea and open countryside in Saltdean, although at the moment, Ari had told him, the whole neighbourhood was on edge because it was less than a mile away that Janie Stretton's body had been discovered. I need to know this line is secure, Tom Bryce said, sounding close to hysterics. There was a roaring sound as if he was driving. Branson looked at the caller display. The man was calling on his mobile phone. Trying to help keep Bryce calm, he said, You've phoned my police mobile. All its signals are encrypted. It's totally secure. He decided not to mention that Tom's mobile, presumably a normal one, was open to anyone out there who tuned into its frequency. Where are you, Tom? I don't want to tell you. OK, you're not at home? No, it's not safe to talk in my house. It's bugged. Do you want to meet me somewhere? Yes, no, uh, yes, I, I mean, I, I need you to help me. That's what I'm here to do. How do I know I can trust you? That it will be confidential? Branson frowned at the question. What assurance would make you feel comfortable? There was a long silence. Hello? Mr Bryce? Tom, are you still there? Yes. His voice sounded faint. Did you hear my question? I don't know if I... If I should... I, I don't think I can take the risk. The phone went dead. Glenn Branson dialed the number on the display and it went straight to voicemail. He left a message saying he had called back, then waited a couple of minutes, wide awake, his brain racing, wishing Ari would be more understanding. Yeah, it was tough, but it would just be nice if she showed a little more sympathy. He shrugged. What the hell? Maybe he should read that book she'd bought him for Christmas. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. She'd told him it might help him understand how a woman felt. But he doubted he would ever truly understand what women wanted. Men and women didn't come from different planets. They came from different universes. He dialed Bryce's mobile number again. It still went straight to voicemail. Next, he dialed the man's home number, feeling a sudden deep dread that he could not define. Gone? Roy Grace said, standing next to Branson in the hallway of Tom Bryce's house at ten past two in the morning, staring in bemused fury at the young family liaison officer. What do you mean he's fucking gone? I went up to see if he was all right, and he wasn't there. Tom Bryce, his four-year-old daughter, and his seven-year-old son leave the house, and you didn't bloody notice? I, uh... Chris Willingham said helplessly. You fucking fell asleep on the job, didn't you? No, I... Grace, chewing gum to mask the alcohol in his breath, glared at the young officer. You were meant to be looking after them and keeping an eye on him as the prime fucking suspect. You let them walk out on you. The FLO talked both detectives through all that had happened in the past few hours, in particular the email Tom Bryce claimed to have received and which had vanished from his computer. Grace had come straight from the Royal Sussex County Hospital, where the young detective constable he had such high hopes for, Emma Jane Boutwood, was on life support and about to be taken into theatre. He'd had the grim job of phoning her parents and breaking the news to them that their daughter was not expected to live. He had dragged himself away from Cleo reluctantly and on a high, but after finding out the full scale of EJ's injuries, all memories of his time tonight with Cleo had been erased, at least temporarily, and he was now feeling very low and desperately concerned for Emma Jane. The driver of the van, as yet unidentified, was still unconscious and in the intensive care unit at the same hospital. Grace had ordered a 24-hour police guard on his bed and left instructions with the constable who had turned up that, the moment the man regained consciousness, he was to be arrested for the attempted murder of a police officer. Grace could only hope they wouldn't have to upgrade the charge to murder. Meanwhile, DC Nick Nickel was waiting for him back at the incident room with a laptop computer he wanted Grace to see, and dodgy Mr Tom Bryce had done a moonlight flit with his two kids. Just what was that all about? And the week was just over two hours old. Turning to Branson, he said, 
This phone call Bryce made to you, you said he sounded strange. Scared? Well scared, Branson confirmed. Grace thought for a moment. Did you get him to fill out a missing persons report form for his wife yesterday? Branson nodded. You filed it? Yes. Phone Nick. He's at the incident room now. Ask him to look it up. It'll have the addresses of Mrs Bryce's close relatives and friends. A frightened man is not going to drive far with two small children in the middle of the night. Have you put out a description of the car? Both Chris Willingham and Glenn Branson stared at him blankly. It clearly had not occurred to either of them. What the fuck is going on? Glenn Branson, trying to calm him down, said, Roy, I didn't know how far we were supposed to go keeping tabs on him. Chris was just here to help him cope and to offer protection. Yes, and if we circulate a description of the bloody vehicle he's in, we can get him even more protection from every damn patrol car that's out there. Which wasn't very many at this time of night, he knew. Shall I tell Nick to call out the rest of the team? Grace thought for a moment. The temptation to haul Norman Potting out of his bed was almost irresistible, but he had a feeling it was going to be a very long day today. He would let as many of them as possible have a night's sleep, so at least he would have some fresh, alert people at the 8.30 briefing. He needed to organise a replacement for Emma Jane, he realised. And how was Alison Vosper going to react to yet another road traffic accident caused by a police pursuit? The taxi driver was in hospital with various minor injuries. His passenger, who hadn't been wearing a seatbelt, had a broken leg. An Argus reporter was already down at the hospital, and they would be all over this story like a rash. Fuck, fuck, fuck. One problem. I don't know the registration of the vehicle he's in. Glenn Branson said. Well, that shouldn't be too hard. There's probably the logbook somewhere in the house. Leaving Branson to make the call and the FLO to search downstairs for the information on the car, Grace went upstairs, found the children's bedrooms, then the master bedroom with its unmade bed. Nothing. Tom Bryce's den looked a lot more promising. He glanced at the man's desk, piled high with work files and a webcam on a stalk. Crinkling his nose against the stench of vomit, he rummaged around in the drawers but found nothing of interest, then turned to a tall black metal filing cabinet. All the information was in a file marked cars. Not all police work required a degree in rocket science, he thought. Fifteen minutes later, Grace and Branson were in a grim elevator with obscene spray-painted graffiti on every wall and a puddle of urine in one corner, in a tower block on the Whitehawk Council estate. They emerged at the seventh floor, walked down the corridor and rang the bell of flat 72. After a few moments, a woman's voice called out, Who is it? Police, Grace said. A tired, harried-looking woman in her early fifties, wearing a dressing gown and pom-pom slippers, opened the door. She looked as if she had been attractive in her youth, but her face was now leathery and crisscrossed with lines, and her wavy hair cut shapelessly was blonde fading into grey. Her teeth were badly stained, from nicotine Grace judged by the reek of tobacco. Somewhere behind her in the flat a child was screaming. There was a faintly rancid smell of fried fat in the air. Grace held up his warrant card. Detective Superintendent Grace of Brighton CID, and this is Detective Sergeant Branson. Are you Mrs Margaret Stevenson? She nodded. You are Mrs Kelly Bryce's mother. She hesitated for a moment, then said, Yes. He's not here. You're looking for Tom. He's not here. Do you know where he is? Grace asked. Do you know where my daughter is? No, we're trying to find her. She wouldn't disappear. She wouldn't leave the children. She didn't never hardly bear to let them out of her sight. She wouldn't even leave them with us. Tom brung the kids here about an hour ago. Just rang the bell, bundled them in, then left. Did he say where he was going? No. He said he'd call me later. The screaming got worse behind her. She turned anxiously. Grace fished a card out of his pocket and handed it to her. Please call me if you hear from him, the mobile number. Taking the card, she asked, Do you want to come in? Cup of tea? 
I must stop Jessica crying. My husband's got to have his sleep. He's got the Parkinson's. He must have rest. I'm sorry we disturbed you, Grace said. Mr. Bryce didn't say anything at all. Nothing. He didn't explain why he was bringing the children over in the middle of the night. For their safety, that's what he said. That was all. Safety from what? Didn't say. Where's Kelly? Where do you think she is? We don't know, Mrs. Stevenson, Glenn Branson said. As soon as we find her, we'll call you. Mr. Bryce really didn't say where he was going. Don't find Kelly, he said. He didn't say where. She shook her head. The screaming got louder still. Grace and Branson exchanged glances, a question and a shrug. I'm sorry we disturbed you, Grace said. He gave her a smile, trying to reassure her. We'll find your daughter. Chapter 68 Tom, driving Kelly's Espas slowly north out of Brighton, holding his mobile phone in his hand, was shaking. The road was quiet, just occasional headlights coming the other way, and from time to time lights appearing in his mirror, then passing him. Indistinct thoughts flitted in and out of his mind, like the shadows made by his headlights. His whole body was clenched tight. He leaned forward, peering through the windscreen, shooting nervous, darting glances into the mirror, fear riddling his stomach. Oh my God, my darling, where are you? He didn't know what he was doing here or what to expect. His brain felt locked. He was unable to think out of this box, unable to think beyond those words on his computer screen. He had visions of the girl, Janie Stratton, in her room being butchered by the hooded man with the stiletto blade. But it wasn't Janie Stratton now, it was Kelly. He couldn't imagine where Kelly was, nor what was going through her mind. He just had to get to her, whatever it took, whatever it cost. Money. That's what they would want, he suspected hazily. They had kidnapped Kelly and now they wanted money. And they would have to believe him when he told them he didn't have very much, but he would give them everything he had in the world. Everything. A road sign loomed up. Cowfold, Haywards Heath. Suddenly the display on his mobile lit up and it began ringing. Private number calling. Nervously, he pressed the answer key. Hello? Mr. Bryce? It was D.S. Branson. Shit, he killed the call. Moments later, there was the double beep of a message waiting. He played it. It was D.S. Branson for the third time, asking him to phone him back. Kelly, my darling, for God's sake, call me. Headlights loomed in his mirror. Although he was only doing 40 on a dual carriageway, this time they stayed behind him, right on his tail. He dropped his speed to 30. Still, the headlights stayed behind him. His throat tightened. His phone rang again. On the caller display was a number he didn't recognise. He answered, a cautious, shaky, Hello? A male voice in a guttural Eastern European accent said, Mr Bryce, how are you doing? Who, who are you? He said. The lights were right behind him, dazzling him. Your wife would like to see you. Finding it hard to see the road ahead, he said, Is she okay? Where is she? She's fine. She's great. She's looking forward to seeing you. Who are you? There is a lay-by coming up in half a mile. Pull into it and turn your engine off. Stay in your car and do not turn around. The phone went dead. He didn't know what to do. Some distance ahead, as he stared down a long hill with signs to a garden centre on his left, his headlights picked up a blue P sign for a parking area. Then he saw the lay-by. His heart was thrashing like a crazed bird inside his ribcage, and his mouth was dry with fear. He tried desperately to think clearly, rationally. A voice somewhere inside his head was screaming at him not to pull over to keep going, to call D.S. Branson back to let the police handle this. And another voice, a much quieter, more logical one, was telling him that if he didn't pull over, Kelly would die. Her screams of terror on his computer echoed all around him. 
That scream had been real. That woman on his computer last Tuesday night being cut to ribbons by the stiletto blade was real. He indicated left, slowed, pulled over. The headlights followed him. He braked, switched off the engine, then sat rigidly staring ahead, frozen in fear but determined to stick this out somehow. The headlights in his mirror went off. Darkness. Silence. The engine pinged. He thought he saw shadows moving. Behind him, tiny pinpricks of light appeared. They grew larger. A lorry roared past, shaking his car, and he saw its red taillights fade slowly into the distance. Then, both rear doors of the Espace opened simultaneously. A hand like a vice gripped his throat. Something was pressed over his mouth and nose, a damp cloth with a sharp, sour reek. He felt an instant blinding headache like a cheese wire slicing through his brain. Behind his eyes, it was as if a television had been switched off, one small diminishing pinprick of light rapidly fading to black. Chapter 69 the next Sussex police officer to get an early morning call was Detective Sergeant John Rye of the High Tech Crime Unit. His alarm clock showed 2.43am as his mobile began to ring, and he cursed not having turned the damn thing off. His wife stirred but didn't say anything as he snapped on the bedside light, waking up fast, looked at the caller display and saw only private number calling. Almost certainly to do with work, he thought. It was the SIO of the Janie Stretton case on the line. Rye glanced at his wife, asked Roy Grace to hold for a moment, then pulled on a dressing gown and hurried downstairs into the kitchen and closed the door. Sir, he said, sorry about that. Sorry to disturb you, the detective superintendent said. I need to ask you something urgently. Last night, you logged an incident on the system, a war driving. Oh, shite, John Rye thought blearily. He'd only logged that bloody phone call from that Swiss engineer out of cussedness. More as a joke than anything, really. Talk about something coming back to bite you. You put down the registration details of a white Ford Transit van. That van was outside a crime scene the previous night, and it's been involved in an accident following a high-speed pursuit tonight. I see, the head of the high-tech crime unit said. I've never heard of this expression, war driving, before. What did you mean by it? Rye explained. When he had finished, Grace said, OK, if I understand correctly, you're saying that people with Wi-Fi, a wireless internet connection, can log on to any system that's not password protected. Correct, sir. The wireless router, a small bit of hardware that costs about 50 quid, puts out a signal, and anyone with Wi-Fi who's within range can log on to the internet through it if they're not locked out by a password request. So they can get a free high-speed internet connection doing this. Exactly, sir. Why would they bother? Well, if you're out and about, wanting to pick up or send emails, it can be just out of convenience. I've done it myself. Rye, wide awake now, stepped over to the kettle, checked it had water and switched it on, deciding to have a cup of tea. You've done it yourself, how do you mean? I've been a passenger in a car in Brighton, stopped at lights with my laptop open and suddenly I've realised I'm online. My Wi-Fi's picked up a signal from a wireless router. In a few seconds you can download and pick up a lot of emails and web pages. Grace was quiet for a moment, digesting this. So Mr Siler, who made the complaint, was angry about a man in a white van outside his house connected to his wireless router by his Wi-Fi. That's what it sounded like to me, sir. But why would Mr Siler have been angry? Would it have mattered? Yes. If he'd been trying to send or download email, in particular large files, it would have slowed his connection speed down. Rye searched for an analogy. If you imagine in your house you turn on every tap at the same time, water's going to come more slowly out of each of them than if you had just one running. It's not a perfect analogy. So this man in the van realised he had found a good spot to surf the net from. Yes, sounds like it. It's a way to use the net without paying. The detective superintendent was quiet for some moments. But the charges are pretty small now. Could there be another reason? The kettle was hissing, coming to the boil. It was pitch dark outside. 
On the fridge door was a crayoned drawing of a spindly man in a cap in a boxy little car with four uneven wheels and the word Daddy beneath it. It had been drawn by his daughter Becky a good ten years back when he had been in traffic. She must have been about nine. Strange what tiredness did to you, he thought. He probably hadn't looked at that drawing for the best part of a decade. Another reason, John Rye said. Yes, if you had emails you wanted to send or receive that you wanted to make as hard as possible for anyone to track. Thank you, Grace said. You've been very helpful. No problem. That information about the routings from the laptop I was given, from your Mr Bryce, was it helpful? Incredibly, yes. Good, we're still working on it. Maybe talk later in the day. I'll call you if we find anything more. He sensed an anxiety in the detective superintendent's tone, as if the SIO was anxious to end the call, that it was now keeping him from something else he wanted to be doing. Something even more urgent than this call, which had woken his entire household up in the middle of the sodding night. Chapter 70 Grace, seated at the workstation in MIR1, hung up the phone and took a sip of the strong, sweet white coffee he had just made himself. Since he had left, the cleaners seemed to have been. The place was spotless, the smell of food replaced with a slightly metallic tang of polish, the bins emptied. Nick Nichols, seated beside him, also hung up his phone. No news from the hospital, the DC announced. At this moment, Grace thought, no news was good news. No news meant that EJ was still alive. OK, he said, nodding at the laptop that Nick Nickel had taken from the van, which was now sitting in a plastic evidence bag in front of him. I want to check out the inbox and sent mail on this machine. He glanced at the vantage screen, taking a quick look through the incident log for the night so far. Other than the flurry surrounding their own activities, it was a quiet night, typical of Sunday. Come Thursday and Friday nights, there would be ten times the activity. The detective constable pulled on latex gloves, removed the laptop from the bag and popped its lid. It was still powered up but had gone to sleep. For some moments, the processor went through its wake-up checks, then it opened at the entourage email programme that must have been running, Nickel realised, when they had approached the vehicle. Branson, sitting opposite them, asked, Was John Rye helpful? More helpful than I'd be to most people at this hour of the morning, Grace retorted, blowing on the coffee to cool it. Yeah, well, he used to be in traffic. Serves him right to get a bit of payback. One of them bastards done me about ten years ago. Could have been him. Grace grinned. Pissed? Breathalyzed? No, just speeding. Empty bloody road, I wasn't that much over. Bastard threw the book at me. Yeah, I got done for speeding three years ago, Grace said, by an unmarked car just up the A23. Told him I was a cop and that just made it worse. They seem to get sadistic pleasure out of nicking their own. No, that old joke, Branson said, about the difference between a hedgehog and a traffic cop car. Grace nodded. I don't, Nickel said. With the cop car, the pricks are on the inside. Branson said. Nickel frowned for a moment, as if his tired brain didn't get it. Then he grinned. Right, that's funny, he said, moving the laptop so Grace could see the screen clearly. Start with the inbox, Grace said. Anything that's come in since... He looked down at his notes to check the time of John Rye's log. Since 6.30 yesterday evening. There was just one email sitting in the inbox and it had a massive attachment marked capital S, capital C, 5W12. A symbol showed the email and attachment had been forwarded on to someone. The address of the sender was postmaster at scarab.tisana.al. Grace felt a surge of adrenaline as he saw the word scarab. We've hit the damn jackpot. Dot .al, Branson wondered, now standing behind them, reading over their shoulders. What country is A.L.? Albania, Nick Nichols said. Grace looked at him. Are you sure? Yes. You some kind of a closet geek, man? Branson asked admiringly. How do you know that? The detective turned to Branson and grinned a little sheepishly. It was the answer to one of the questions at a quiz night down at our local a few weeks ago. I've never been to that one, Branson said. Maybe I should go with Ari and prove our general knowledge. Might improve our marriage, more importantly, he thought. 
try and find a few things to do together other than argue. Grace was looking at the address again. Tisana, he said. Did they have that one in your pub quiz too? Nichols shook his head. Let's Google it. He keyed a search, but all that came up was an Italian website with a translator option. Nickel clicked on that. Moments later, they were staring at a long, detailed list of pathologies and plants. Acne, Grace read. Carrot soluble tisana vitamins. Germ of grain. Oil of borragine. Burdock. Then, more interesting to him at this late or early hour, he read. Fatigue. Ginseng. Guarana. Aloeta rococo. Tisana vitamins and minerals. Lecitina di soya. Maybe he's a health nut, Glen Branson wisecracked. Nickel ignored him, too weary for jokes at the moment. Go to the scent mailbox, Grace said. Nickel clicked on that. It contained just one email, the same one with the same attachment. Can you see who it was sent to? Grace asked. Strange, Nick Nickel said. There's no recipient showing. He double clicked on it, and moments later the reason why became evident. There were hundreds and hundreds of recipients, all blind copied, and all had email addresses that were just sequences of numbers combined with Tisana. Grace read the first one 110897 at tisana.al, then the next one 244651 at tisana.al. The first part. Looks like the name obviously coded, Nick Nickel said. Tisana must be the internet service provider. So why didn't Tisana show up on the search? Grace queried. My guess is because someone doesn't want it to. Can you hide things from search engines like Google? Well, I'm sure if you know what you're doing, you can conceal anything you want. Nodding, Grace said, Let's take a look at the attachment, see what that has to tell us. He stared at the screen as Nick Nickel moved the cursor onto the attachment and double clicked on it. Then, moments later, he was rather wishing he hadn't suggested it be opened after all. All three of them watched in numb silence for the next four minutes. Chapter 71 At 6 30 am, Roy Grace rang Dennis Pons, the senior public relations officer at home, apologetically waking him and asking him to come and see him at 8.15 in his temporary office in the major incident suite. Grace had managed to snatch two hours of restless sleep, slumped vaguely horizontally across the two armchairs in the interview room, before heading back to his desk at the workstation shortly after 6am. Branson had fared better, borrowing the sofa in the chief superintendent's office. Nickel had gone home for a couple of hours, concerned at leaving his heavily pregnant wife on her own for too long. At 7.20, Grace was standing outside the entrance to the Asda supermarket across the road and was the first customer when the doors opened at 7.30. He bought a pack of disposable razors, shaving cream, a white shirt, two croissants, six cans of Red Bull and two packs of Pro Plus. At 8, he rang Cleo but his call went straight through to her voicemail. He left her a brief message. Hi, it's Roy. Sorry I had to do a moonlit flit. You are amazing. Call me when you can. Giant hug. On the dot of 8.15, as Dennis Pons entered the small, bland office opposite the doorway to MIR1, Grace was feeling terrific. The wash, shave and change of shirt had freshened him, and two cans of Red Bull and four Pro Plus were doing their stuff. The only thing not good was his back, which felt like it was burning. Cleo had scratched it to pieces. He couldn't believe it, standing in the men's room, looking over his shoulder in the mirror at the long, raw red lines. But he grinned. It had been worth it. The fire on his back was nothing compared to the furnace burning in his belly for her. God, she was insane in bed. Morning, Roy, Pon said. He looked more like a city slicker than ever today, with his gelled back hair, loud, chalk-striped suit, pink shirt with cutaway collar, and a blue tie that looked as if it was made of snakeskin. Grace shook his hand, and they both sat down. I apologise for calling you so early. No problem, Pon said. 
I'm always up at Sparrows, two young kids, three dogs, he shrugged. So, I want you to sit in on the 8.30 briefing with us. There's some video footage I need you to see. Looking at him a little uncertainly, Pon said, Well, OK, I have quite a tight schedule this morning. I have to organise the press conference for Janie Stretton. That's what it's about, Dennis, Grace interrupted him. But it's also about something else. You may not have heard yet, but a vehicle my team was pursuing late last night was in collision with a taxi in Kemptown. Pon's face fell. No, I hadn't heard. As a consequence of trying to apprehend the vehicle before it drove off, one of my best young officers is on life support at Sussex County. I just came off the phone. She survived a five-hour operation, but it still doesn't look good. She put her life on the line to stop that fucking vehicle, a Ford Transit. Do you understand that? She put her fucking life on the line, Dennis. She's 24 years old. She's one of the brightest and bravest young cops I've ever seen. She clung to the side of that vehicle to try to stop it, and the scumbag driving it smashed her into a parked car. She was trying to do her job, to uphold the law. Are you still with me? Hesitantly, Pons nodded. I've got an officer on life support. I've got a scumbag suspect unconscious. I've got an innocent taxi passenger with a broken leg. I'm not exactly sure what you're getting at, Pond said. Grace realised all the caffeine might be making him seem a little aggressive. What I'm getting at, Dennis, is I want the editor of the Argus and the editors of any other papers, radio news or television news that might pick up this story to cut me some slack. I don't want to have to deal with a room full of braying vultures about another cheap let's have a pop at the police story about how reckless we are endangering public lives when actually we are trying to save lives and risking our own in the process. I hear what you're saying, Pond said. But it's not easy. That's why you're coming to the briefing, Dennis. I'm going to show you something that I saw earlier this morning. Then I'm going to give you a copy of it. I think you'll find it will make things a whole lot easier. He gave Pons an almost demonic grin. They walked a few yards along the corridor and into the briefing room, which was quickly filling up both with members of Grace's team and with the new team that had been assembled during the course of yesterday by Detective Superintendent Dave Gaylor for the Reggie Diath murder inquiry. There were several clear areas of crossover between the two. Grace had decided to use the briefing room for this session rather than MIR1, partly because of the extra space, but mainly because there was a large plasma screen on the wall, into which DS John Rye, whom Grace had also summoned to the briefing, was currently plugging the laptop DC Nickel had recovered from the crash transit. Sitting down in front of the curved Crime Stoppers display board, it felt at this moment as if his team couldn't stop a bloody bus, Grace thought, and remembered gloomily that today was the day Cassian Pugh started. How great it would be to get transferred to Newcastle, just as he and Cleo were getting together, he thought putting them at opposite ends of the country, 300 bloody miles apart. Well, it was not going to sodding well happen. None of them would enjoy the four-minute show Grace was putting on. To start their week with the worst horror movie most of them would ever see in their lives was hardly a Monday morning treat. These were shock tactics, he knew, and they wouldn't make him any friends but making friends was right at the bottom of his list of priorities at this exact moment. He started the session in the way he always did. The time is 8.30, Monday, June 6th, he read out. This is our sixth briefing of Operation Nightingale, the investigation into the murder of Jane, known as Janie Susan Amanda Stretton, conducted on day five following the discovery of her remains. I will now summarise events following the incident. For some minutes, mainly for the benefit of the newcomers from Detective Superintendent Gayler's team, he went over the circumstances surrounding Janie Stratton's death, the investigations and actions that had been put in place subsequently and the key events. These he listed as the theft of the computer disc which had enabled Tom Bryce apparently to witness Janie Stratton's murder, the discovery that Janie Stratton had been supplementing her income as a trainee lawyer by working as a prostitute, the discovery of the link on Tom Bryce's computer with Reggie Diath's computer, Kelly Bryce's disappearance, 
her husband's disappearance, the recovery of a laptop computer from a crashed van last night, and what it contained, which they would all shortly see. He looked at his watch. Whatever plans outside of work any of you have for the next 36 hours and 45 minutes, you can forget. You'll understand why at the end of this briefing. OK, can I have your individual updates? He looked first at Norman Potting. Can I just ask, is there any more news on Emma Jane? Potting asked. No, she's still on life support, Grace answered curtly. I've organised flowers from our team to be sent to the hospital. What progress have you made on the two escort agencies Miss Stretton was registered with? I went to take a formal statement from Ms Claire Porter, joint proprietor of BCE 247 Escort Agency, at 7.30 last night. She's about as much use as a chocolate teapot. I got nothing helpful from her. And her clients? I'm working my way through her clients and also through her girls, Potting said. I'll bet you are, you dirty bugger, Grace thought, and could see from the expressions on several other faces, including the two FLOs assigned to Derek Stretton, Maggie Campbell and Vanessa Ritchie, that he wasn't alone in this view. So far, I haven't come up with anything. And the second agency? She had only just registered. They hadn't introduced any clients to her. Grace looked at his notes. What about the man called Anton who took Janie Stretton out on four dates from the BCE 247 agency? I checked out the phone number. It was one of those pay-as-you-go jobs you can buy in just about any shop or petrol station. No record of the purchaser. Won't get us anywhere. This ends Disc 10. Looking Good Dead Disc 11 Grace circulated to the teams a dozen photographs of Janie Stretton with her date in the Karma Bar. They had been lifted off the CCTV tape and the quality was not great, but her face and the face of her muscular, spiky-haired date were clear enough. These were taken on Friday, May 27th, the night of Miss Stretton's third date with this Anton. I think we can presume this is him. I want these circulated to every police station in the country and we'll try to get it on Crime Watch on Wednesday night. Someone's going to recognise him. Grace knew that this might raise identification issues in the future, but he would deal with them with the Crown Prosecution Service when he had to. He turned to Maggie Campbell and Vanessa Ritchie. You said that Miss Stretton's father was talking about putting up a reward. He confirmed last night, Maggie Campbell said, £100,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of her killer. Good, Grace said. That's helpful. That should test a few loyalties. He looked at two of the new officers he had recruited from Dave Gaylor's team, Don Barker, whom Grace liked, a stocky, bull-necked detective sergeant in his mid-thirties with a fuzz of hair and a pale blue shirt straining at the buttons, and a very confident, much younger detective constable Grace had never seen before. His name was Alfonso Zaffaroni. He had Latino good looks, wet-look hair, and was dressed in an elegant houndstooth sports jacket and a sharp shirt and tie. Addressing both of them, he asked, Any progress on the ownership of this white van? Alfonso Zaffaroni replied. He had a cocky attitude, making Grace take an instant dislike to him. He exuded a demeanour that said he was cut out for higher things, and menial tasks such as vehicle checks were way beneath him. As we already know, it's a company with a P.O. box address in London. I checked out the company. It isn't registered at company's house. Meaning? Grace asked. Zaffaroni shrugged. His tiredness making him less tolerant than normal, Grace snapped at him, deliberately getting his name wrong, one of the best ways he had learned over the years to put someone in their place. This is a murder inquiry, DC Zabaglione. We don't do shrugs here, we do answers verbally. Would you like to try again? The young DC glared at him, looking for a moment as if he was about to answer back, then clearly thought better of it. A little more meekly, he replied, It means, sir. Either the company is registered overseas or the name is false. Thank you. I want to know which is the case by our next briefing at 6.30 and where the mail to that P.O. box is collected from, OK? Zaffaroni nodded sullenly. You're not going to go far, my son, Grace thought, 
Not unless someone pulls the chain and flushes you down the sodding toilet. How about the identity of the van's driver? He was starting to come round about ten minutes ago, Roy, Don Barker said. There was nothing on his clothes or in the van. He doesn't look English, maybe Central European. I'm going down to see him straight after this briefing. Good, Gray said. Then he turned back to potting. OK, another task for you today, Norman, is to finish visiting all the wholesale suppliers of sulfuric acid in the area. I'm on it, Potting said. Grace addressed Nick Nickel. Remind me, Nick, what time are we seeing the DI from Wimbledon? Oh, past 11, sir. And you're chasing up on any other force in the country that might have had a scarab beetle connected to a murder scene? Yes, I'm working on that, sir. Don't keep fucking surring me, OK? The DC blushed. Grace felt bad for having a go at him. He didn't need to snap at anyone. He needed to keep a lid on himself, he realised. He looked at the team and gave a smile. OK, we're now going to have a short movie. I apologise there's no popcorn. He got a ragged laugh. After what you're about to see, you won't be feeling like eating popcorn. You'll be doing well just to keep down your breakfast, he thought to himself, nodding at DS Rye to close the blinds, then start the video. While Rye closed the blinds, Grace said, This video clip was found on this laptop computer, which was removed from the Ford Transit van last night. The hard drive we removed and is now in safekeeping as a crime scene in the high-tech crime unit. What you are viewing is a cloned copy. John Rye clicked the keyboard to start the projection. Grace dimmed the lights. On the screen appeared a Scarab production. Here is a special bonus movie for all our customers. Bath time for Reggie. The man is a convicted paedophile. Enjoy. Moments later, a slightly unsteady handheld camera showed, in wide angle, a small, rather old-fashioned, avocado-coloured bathroom. The camera favoured the bathtub. Then a figure wearing what appeared to be a full chemical protection suit, with gloves, boots, a breathing tank and mask, struggled backwards in through the door carrying something. In a moment, it became clear it was the legs of a naked man bound tightly together with cord. A second man, in identical protective clothing, his face invisible behind his darkened glass mask, held the shoulders of the naked man, Reggie Diath. They deposited him in the empty tub. A large, baby-faced man with thinning hair and a flaccid body, he thrashed around in the bath like a fish out of water. His face was a mask of terror, but he was unable to speak because something, held in place with gaffer tape, had been jammed in his mouth. His arms were tied tightly to his sides. All he could do was wriggle his body, heave himself up and down with his thighs and twist his head wildly from side to side, his eyes bulging, imploring, his small, thin penis flopping around between his hairless balls amid an untidy thicket of pubic hairs. The men went out of the room and returned with a large black plastic chemical drum, which Grace estimated would hold about ten gallons. No markings were visible on it. Reggie Diath was now thrashing so wildly that for an instant it seemed he would actually manage to leap out of the tub. The men set the drum down. One then held Diath while the other produced a length of wire, wound it twice around his neck, then attached it to a towel rail high on the wall above his head and pulled it tight. Diath's eyes bulged even more. His movements became different after some seconds, convulsions rather than thrashing. With some difficulty, the two men moved him up a little so he was reclining rather than lying flat. They adjusted the ligature so that it was now supporting him, clearly deeply uncomfortable and cutting into his neck, but no longer strangling him. An unseen hand tossed a wriggling scarab beetle onto his chest. The little creature tumbled over backwards, almost comically, coming to rest on Diath's genitals. It started to right itself, but too late. Without wasting any time, the two men lifted the chemical drum, moving carefully out of view of the camera so as not to obstruct it, and tipped a good gallon of the liquid, which Grace knew to be sulfuric acid, straight onto Diath's genitals. Steam rose. 
Grace had never in his life seen a body shake and contort the way the unfortunate Diaths was doing now. The man's head was snapping from left to right, as if he was trying to saw the wire through his carotid artery. His eyes were strobing. As surreptitiously as he could, Grace glanced at the reactions of his colleagues. Pons was holding his hand over his mouth. Every single one of them looked numb. He turned back to the screen. The men continued pouring, emptying the entire contents of the drum into the bath. Within moments, Diath's body ceased to move. The room slowly filled with a haze of chemical steam. The video faded to black. Then appeared... Dearly valued customer, we hope you enjoyed our little bonus show. Remember to log in at 21.15 on Tuesday for our next big attraction. A man and his wife together. Our first ever double killing. Grace turned the lights back on. Chapter 72 From the parchment colour of Alfonso Zaffaroni's face, Grace guessed he wasn't going to have any more arrogance from this young DC for a while. He could not recall in his entire career when he had been in a room full of people so quiet. Dennis Pons was staring, bug-eyed and unfocused, as if he had just been told he was going to be put in the bathtub next. It was Norman Potting who finally broke the silence. He coughed, clearing his throat, then said, Do we presume this is a snuff movie, Roy? Well, it's not his fucking family album, Glen Branson rounded on him. There was no titter of laughter, nothing. One of the female indexers was staring down at the table as if afraid to lift her eyes in case there was more. Dennis, Grace said, I'm going to give you a copy on your laptop to take to the editor of the Argus. Don't show him everything, but make him aware of just what we're dealing with here. I want him to run photographs of Mr and Mrs Bryce on the front page of the midday edition of his paper. We have a day and a half to find these people. Does everyone understand that? That they are going to be killed and videoed. Branson took a deep breath, then exhaled loudly. Man, who watches that kind of shit? A lot of very ordinary people with sick minds, Grace said. It could be any one of us in this room, or your neighbour, your doctor. Your plumber, your vicar, your mortgage broker. The same kind of people who slow down to rubberneck road accidents. Voyeurs. There's a little bit of it in all of us. Not me, Branson said. I couldn't watch stuff like that. Are you saying that we're all potential killers? Nick Nickel asked. Grace remembered something a psychological profiler who had lectured on snuff movies at a homicide convention in the States had told him late one night in a bar. We all have the capacity to kill, but only a small percentage of us have the ability to live with having killed. But there are plenty of us who are curious. We'd like to experience it vicariously. Snuff movies enable you to do that, to experience the killing of a human being. Think about it, he said. There's no opportunity for normal people to actually kill someone. I could have aptly killed my mother-in-law, Potting said. Thank you, Norman, Grace said silencing him before he could go on. Then he turned to Glenn Branson. Tom Bryce left his house in the middle of the night in a Renault Espace. There can't be much traffic on the road. We don't know where he was going. We don't know how much fuel there was in the vehicle. I want you to call off the search for Janie Stretton's head and redeploy every single officer, all the specials and all the CSOs to cover every CCTV camera. Police, civic, Petrol station, the lot, within a 30-mile radius of this city. Right away. Then, turning back to D.S. Barker, he said, Don, I want someone to go through all of Reggie Diath's personal records, bank statements, credit card statements. Someone's already onto that. Good. Grace checked his watch. He had a 9.30 with Alison Vosper, then somehow had to get to a 10am appointment he had made on the other side of town. I'll see you all back here at 6.30pm. Everyone know what they've got to do? Any further questions? Usually there would be plenty. This morning there were none. Then a phone rang. It was answered by the secretary who handed it after a few moments to Glenn Branson. Everyone watched him as if sensing there was some important news coming. Branson asked the caller to hold for a moment, covered the mouthpiece with his hand and said, 
The Bryce's Renault Espas has been found down a farm track off the A23 at Bolney, he said. Empty, Grace said, knowing the answer to the question but asking it anyway. Burned out. Chapter 73 Alison Vosper was power-dressed as usual when he entered her office on the dot of 9.30am, and, as usual, he had an attack of butterflies. She scared him. He couldn't help it. The bloody woman's corrosive manner and the power she wielded over him affected him. And it didn't help that he knew she was out to get him with her new secret weapon, Detective Superintendent Cassian Pugh. Sitting at her immaculate desk, exuding a pungent but unsexy perfume, she was dressed in a black jacket that made her shoulders look massive and an ivory-coloured blouse with a lace collar. Expecting a face of thunder, the assistant chief constable surprised Grace by greeting him with a smile. Unscrewing the cap from a bottle of mineral water, she took a rather dainty sip. Good morning, Roy, she said, her voice even more cordial than her smile. She gestured to him to take one of the handsome Georgian carver chairs in front of her desk. Have a seat. Another good sign, he wondered. She rarely asked him to sit at these meetings. Or was this a very bad sign? Still smiling, very definitely in sweet rather than sour mode today, she said, So, Operation Nightingale seems to be a bit of a fiasco so far. I, I wouldn't go so... She raised a hand to silence his defence. You still have no suspect. You haven't located the victim's head. One potential witness has been murdered and two others are missing. And last night, again... Your team engaged in a high-speed pursuit which resulted in a serious accident. Miraculously, she was still smiling, but the warmth had gone and was replaced with apparent bemusement. Grace nodded. It's not going our way, he said. We need a lucky break. She replaced the cap on the bottle. It was a fine morning outside, but the room felt dark and oppressive. You are tying up a massive amount of resources. It would be one thing if you could give me a result, but all I seem to get is aggravation. Where are we at? Grace brought her up to speed. When he had finished, he waited for what he knew was coming. At best, she was going to stick Cassian Pugh on this case with him. At worst, she was removing him and replacing him with Pugh. To his surprise, she did neither. She pulled a slim black pen from the ammonite holder on her desk and tapped it thoughtfully on her blotter. You haven't got until 9.15 tomorrow night, realistically, have you? If these people are going to kill Mr and Mrs Bryce and broadcast it to whoever their customers are, they're going to do it well in advance. They could be already dead. I know. There was a brief silence. Grace looked down, feeling Vosper's eyes fixed on him. When he looked up, he saw understanding in them. Despite her antipathy to him, she was at least professional enough to recognise and accept that the problems he was facing with this case were not necessarily of his making. But he was puzzled that she had not yet mentioned Cassian Pugh. Why was she holding back? Very hesitantly, he asked, Is, uh, uh, is this meeting with Cassian on? You wanted me to see him this morning. Actually, no, it isn't, she said. Then she began tapping the pen harder and faster on the blotter without seeming to be aware she was doing this. OK, he said, feeling a little relieved but wondering what had changed her mind. Then he found out. Detective Superintendent Pugh was involved in a road traffic accident last night. He's in hospital with a fractured leg. Not only could Grace barely believe his ears, he could barely believe his eyes either. She was smiling again. Just the very faintest of smiles, to be fair, but a smile nonetheless. Smiling as she conveyed the information that her protégé was in a bad way after a car crash. Oh, I'm sorry, Grace said. What happened? It was a passenger in a taxi in the centre of Brighton late last night. It was in collision with a van being pursued by a police car. And the next moment, Grace was smiling too. He couldn't help it. Gallows humour. It got to everyone in this job eventually. 
As he drove away from Alison Vosper's office, Grace phoned the Royal Sussex County Hospital to find out if the van driver from last night had come round yet. Right now, that man was their best hope of getting to the Bryce's captors. Just about their only damned hope. Except for one long shot. He drove to the Bryce's house where DC Linda Buckley had just taken over from DC Willingham. She asked Grace if there was much point in her staying on in the house. After all, there was nothing to do except feed the dog. He suggested she wait a few more hours in case Tom Bryce turned up, which he thought grimly was unlikely. He went upstairs and into the Bryce's bedroom, then hurried back downstairs. The Alsatian was standing in the hallway, giving him a strange look, as if she knew he was the man who could bring her master and mistress home. Despite his rush, Grace paused for a moment, knelt beside the dog and stroked her forehead. Hi, he said. Don't you worry, I'll bring them back somehow, OK? He stared into the dog's large brown eyes and felt for an instant, just a fleeting instant, that the fine-looking creature had actually understood what he had said. Maybe it was his tiredness, or the stress, or whatever addling his brain, but as he left the house and drove quickly away, heading for the eastern extremity of the city, the expression on that dog's face stayed with him, haunting him. She had looked so sad so full of trust, and, for a moment, he wasn't doing any of this just for Mr and Mrs Bryce and for their children. He was also doing it for their dog. Chapter 74 Tom woke with a start, with a blinding headache, badly in need of a pee, thinking there must have been a power cut. It was never this dark normally. There was always the neon glow of the streetlights tinging the bedroom orange. And what the hell was he lying on? Rock hard. And then, as if a sluice had released cold water into his belly, he remembered something indistinct but bad. Oh, shit. Bad. His right arm hurt. He tried to raise it, but it wouldn't move. Must have been lying on it, he thought. Made it go to sleep. He tried again. Then he realised he couldn't move his left arm either. Nor his legs. Something was digging into his right thigh. His jaw ached and his mouth was parched. He tried to speak and found to his shock he couldn't. All he could hear was a muffled hum as he felt the roof of his mouth vibrate. Something was clamped over his mouth, bound tight around his face, pulling his cheeks in. Then a shiver ripped through him as he remembered the words last night. On his computer screen, Get out of the house, Take Kelly's car, head north on the A23 London Road and wait for her to call you. That's exactly what he had done. It was coming back now, driving up the A23, the phone call telling him to pull over into the lay-by. Now here. Oh, Christ. Oh, God. Oh, sweet Jesus Christ. Where was he? Where was Kelly? What the hell had he done? Who the hell had... Light suddenly appeared, an upright rectangle of yellow some distance away. A doorway, a figure coming through it holding a powerful torch, the beam glinting like a mirror. Tom held his breath, watching as the figure moved nearer. In the swinging beam of the torch he could see he was in some kind of storeroom stacked with massive plastic and metal drums that looked as if they contained fuel or chemicals. As the figure came closer, Tom made out a very fat man in a loose-fitting, open-necked shirt, his hair gelled back and squeezed into a short pigtail. A large medallion swung on a chain from his neck. There wasn't enough light to see his face clearly, but Tom put him in his late fifties to early sixties. Then the savage beam shone straight in his face. It felt like it was burning the backs of his retinas and he squeezed his eyes shut. In a Louisiana drawl and sounding sincere, as if it were a genuine question to which he was expecting an answer, the man said, So you think you're a bit of a hero, do you, Mr. Bryce? Unsure how to respond, and in any case unable to speak, Tom kept silent. He felt the beam move away and opened his eyes. The man squatted down in front of him, put out his hands until they were touching Tom's face and then jerked them back hard. Tom screamed, 
The pain was unreal. For several seconds he was convinced that half his face had been ripped clean off. A length of gaffer tape dangled in front of his eyes. He could move his jaw again, open his mouth to speak. Where's my wife? Tom said. Where is Kelly? Please tell me where she is. The man swung the beam across the room, and Tom's heart nearly broke as he saw a short distance away what at first he thought was a rolled-up carpet, then realised was Kelly. She was lying on the floor, trussed up, a manacle on her ankle, with a chain running from it up to a hoop on the wall, gaffer tape across her mouth, pleading at him with her eyes. Tom's first instinct was to scream at the fat creep in fury, but somehow he managed to hold himself in check, trying to think clearly, to work out what had happened, just what the hell this nightmare really was. Who are you? he said. You ask too many questions, the man responded dismissively. You want water? I want to know why I'm here, why my wife is here. For an answer, the man turned and walked away back into the shadows. Kelly, Tom called. Kelly, are you okay? He couldn't see her any more or hear her. Kelly, my darling. Shut the fuck up, the fat man said. No, I won't shut up, Tom nearly shouted out. One second his insides were squirming with fear, the next blind anger seized him. How dare this bastard keep Kelly tied up, or himself? Got the most important presentation of my career in the morning. It could save my business, and I'm missing it because of you, you fat... In the morning? Was it morning? It was coming back to him unevenly, like trying to put sheets of paper strewn across a room by a gust of wind back into their proper order. Kelly had gone. Her car had been burned out. Then he had responded to the email, and now she was lying across the room all trust. He thought of the young woman on his computer screen in her evening dress, the hooded man, the stiletto blade. Pain welled in his bladder. Please, he called out. I need to pee. No one's stopping you, the American said from the shadows. Tom wriggled round. The man was stooped over Kelly. He ripped the tape away from her mouth. Tom winced at the sound. Instantly, she screamed at the man. Fuck you! Fuck you, you bastard! Just be a little more ladylike. People will want to see you looking ladylike. Would you like a little more vodka? Fuck you! Oh, God, Kelly. It was so good to hear her voice, to know she was alive, that she was okay, that she had fight in her. Yet this wasn't the way to deal with this situation. He clenched his thighs together and his abdomen fighting the surge of pain from his bladder. Surely the man didn't mean him to relieve himself where he lay. Kelly, my darling, Tom called out. Get this fucking bastard to get us out of here. I want Jessica and Max. I want my children. Let me fucking go. Do you want the tape back over your face, Mrs. Braz? She rolled over onto her stomach and lay still, sobbing hysterically, deep, gulping sobs. And Tom felt wretched, useless, so utterly, utterly useless. There had to be something he could do. Something. Oh, God. Something. The pain in his bladder was stopping him thinking, and his head felt like it had been split open. The torch beam was moving. As it did, Tom saw hundreds of dark-coloured drums stacked floor to ceiling. Huge bloody things, many bearing hazard labels. It was cold in here. There was a slightly sour smell in the chilly air. Where the hell are we? Oh, Tom! Please do something! She shrieked. Do you want money? Tom called out to the man. Is that what you want? I'll, I'll rustle together whatever I can. You mean you'd like to subscribe? Subscribe? Tom said, pleased at last to get some sort of response to his questions. Engage the man in conversation. Reason with him. Try to find a... You'd like to subscribe so that you could watch yourself and your wife? The American laughed. That's rich. Tom's spirits lifted a fraction. Yes, 
Whatever, however much you want. The beam shone straight into his eyes again. You don't get it, fuckwit, do you? How are you going to be able to see yourselves? I, I don't know. You're even more stupid than I thought. You want to pay money so you and your vain little drunk of a wife can watch yourselves looking good dead? Chapter 75 Roy Grace was on the phone non-stop as he drove in his Alpha, making one call after another, checking on Emma Jane, then the progress of each of his team members in turn, driving them as hard as they could be pushed. He headed east along the coast road, leaving behind the elegant Regency facades of Kemptown for the open country, high above the cliffs, passing the vast neo-Gothic pile of Rodine Girls' School and then the Art Deco building of the St Dunstan's Home for the Blind. 9.15 tomorrow night. The time was lasered into his consciousness. It formed part of every thought that he had. It was now 10.15am, Monday just 35 hours to the broadcast, and how long before then would the Bryces be killed? Janie Stretton had been late at the vet with her cat for a 6.30pm appointment, and she hadn't left until at least 7.40. In between then and approximately 9.15pm, when Tom Bryce claimed to have seen her on his computer, she had been murdered and the video of it broadcast. If the same pattern was followed now, maybe they had until around 7.30pm tomorrow, just over 33 hours. And still no live leads. 33 hours was no damn time at all. Then he allowed himself just the briefest smile at the thought of Cassian Pugh in hospital. The irony of it, the incredible coincidence, and the fact that Alison Vosper had seen the funny side, showing him a rare side of herself, the human side. And the thing was, not a good thing he knew, but he couldn't help it. He didn't feel even the tiniest bit bad about it or sorry for the man. He was sorry for the innocent taxi driver, but not for that little shit, Cassian Pugh, who had arrived in Brighton newly promoted and with every intention of stealing his lunch. The problem hadn't gone away, but with the man's injuries, it was at least deferred for a while. He drove through the smart, historic cliff-top village of Rottingdean, along a sweeping rise, then dip, followed by another rise past the higgledy-piggledy post-war suburban sprawl of Saltdean, then to Peacehaven, near where Glen Branson lived and where Janie Stretton had died. He turned off the coast road into a maze of hilly streets crammed with bungalows and small detached houses and pulled up outside a small, rather neglected bungalow with a decrepit camper van parked outside. He ended a call to Norman Potting, who seemed well advanced with his search for sulfuric acid suppliers, downed another Red Bull and two more Proplus, walked up a short path lined with garden gnomes, and stepped into a porch past motionless wind chimes and rang the doorbell. A diminutive, wiry man, well into his seventies, bearing more than a passing resemblance to several of the gnomes he had just passed, opened the door. He had a goatee beard, Long grey hair tied back in a ponytail, wore a caftan and dungarees and was sporting an Ankh medallion on a gold chain. He greeted Grace effusively in a high-pitched voice, a bundle of energy taking his hand and staring at him with the joy of a long-lost friend. Detective Superintendent Grace, so good to see you again so soon. And you, my friend. Sorry I'm so late. It was just over a week since Grace had last called on his services, when Frame had undoubtedly helped save an innocent man's life. Harry Frame gripped his hand with a strength that belied both his years and his size and stared up at him with piercing green eyes. So, to what do I owe the pleasure this time? Come in. Grace followed him into a narrow hallway lit by a low wattage bulb in a hanging lantern and decorated in a nautical theme the centrepiece of which was a large brass porthole on the wall, and threw into a sitting room the shelves crammed with ships in bottles. There was a drab three-piece suite, the back draped with antimacassars, a television that was switched off, and a round oak table with four wooden chairs by the window to which Frame ushered him. On the wall, 
Grace clocked, as he did on each visit here, a naff print of Anne Hathaway's cottage, and a framed motto which read, A mind once expanded can never return to its original dimensions. Tea? I'm fine, Grace said, although he could have murdered a cup. I'm in a mega rush. Life's not a race, Detective Superintendent Grace. It's a dance, Harry Frame said in a gently chiding voice. Grace grinned. I'll bear that in mind. I'll put you on my card for a slow waltz at the summer ball. He sat down at the table. So, Harry said, seating himself opposite. Would you be here by any chance in connection with that poor young woman who was found dead here in Peacehaven last week? Harry Frame was a medium and clairvoyant, as well as a pendulum dowser. Grace had been to see the man many times. He could be uncannily accurate and on other occasions totally useless. Grace dug his hand in his pocket, pulled out three small plastic evidence bags and laid them on the table in front of Frame. He pointed first to the signet ring he had taken from Janie Stretton's bedroom. What can you tell me about the owner of this? Frame removed the ring, clasped it in his hand and closed his eyes. He sat still for a good minute, his wizened face screwed up in concentration. The room had a musty smell of old furniture, old carpet, old people. Finally, Harry Frame shook his head. I'm sorry, Roy. Nothing. Not a good day for me today. No connection with the spirits. Nothing at all from the ring. I'm sorry. Could you come back tomorrow? We could try again. Grace took the ring back, put it in the plastic bag and pocketed it. Next, he pointed in turn to the silver cufflinks he had taken from a drawer in the Bryce's bedroom and a silver bracelet he had taken from Kelly Bryce's jewellery box. I need to find the owners of these. I need to find them today. I don't know where they are, but I suspect they are somewhere in the vicinity of Brighton and Hove. The medium left the room and returned quickly holding an ordnance survey map of the Brighton and Hove area. Moving a candle in a glass holder out of the way, he spread it out on the table and pulled a length of string with a small lead weight attached from his trouser pocket. Let's see what we can find, he said. Yes, indeed, let's see. He held the bracelet and the cufflinks in his left hand, then, resting his elbows on the table, he inclined his face towards the map and began to chant. Yarum, Frame said to himself. Yarum, brun, yarum. Then he sat bolt upright, held the string over the mat between his forefinger and thumb and let the lead weight swing backwards and forwards like a pendulum. After that, pursing his lips in concentration, he swung it vigorously in a tight circle, steadily covering the match inch by inch. Helskum, he said. Piddingho? Ovingdean? Kemptown? Brighton? Hove? Portslade, Southwick, Shoreham. He shook his head. No, I'm not being shown anything in this area. Sorry. Can we try a larger scale? Grace said. Frame went out again and returned with a map covering the whole of East and West Sussex. But again, after several minutes of swinging the weight with fierce concentration, he produced no result. Grace wanted to pick the man up and shake him. He felt so damn frustrated. Nothing at all, Harry. The medium shook his head. They're going to die if I don't find them. Harry Frame handed him back the links and the bracelet. I could try again later. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. This afternoon sometime? Frame nodded. If you want to leave them with me, I'll spend all day. I'll keep working on it. Thank you. I'd appreciate it. Grace replied. He was clutching at straws he knew as he left with a heavy heart. Chapter 76 After the 8.30 briefing, John Rye had spent two and three-quarter hours working on the laptop that had been taken from the wrecked Ford Transit. But it was defeating him. 
At twenty past eleven, feeling drained and frustrated, he went out of the department to get himself a coffee from the vending machine, then returned deep in thought. With any computer, he could normally find a way around any password protection by using forensic software to go in via a back door and then through the computer's entire internet history. But on this machine, he was drawing a blank. He held his security card to the door panel of the high tech crime unit, then entered and crossed what he had jokingly christened the hamster's cage, the caged area housing the child pornography investigation Operation Glasgow. Nodding to a couple of the six people poring over their screens, who glanced up at him and walked through into the main part of his department. Andy Gidney and the rest of his team were at their desks, well stuck into their day's work. He sat back down at his desk, the laptop itself secure in the evidence room, its cloned hard disk loaded into his computer. Although he had been head of this unit for the past three years, Rye was smart enough to know his own limitations. He had been retrained from traffic. Several of the younger members of his team were techies from the ground up, university graduates who had lived and breathed computers from their cradles. Andy Gidney was the best of the lot. If there was one person in here who could persuade this laptop to yield its secrets, it was Gidney. He ejected the cloned hard drive from his processor tower, stood up, and walked across to Gidney's workstation. Gidney was still working on cracking the passcode on an online banking scam. Andy, I need you to drop everything for the next few hours and help me out on this. We have two lives at stake. Um, Gidney said. Thing is, I'm quite close now. Andy, I don't care how close you are, but if I stop, I could lose this whole sequence. Here's the thing. Gidney swivelled his chair to face Rye, his eyes burning with excitement. I think I'm just one digit away. How long will it take you? Um, Rye. Um, he said pensively. Then he closed his eyes and nodded furiously. Um, um. He opened his eyes again and looked down at the floor. I would hope by the end of this week. I'm、oh, sorry, John Rye said. You're going to have to park it. I need you on this right now. Um, the thing is, there's nine of us in this department, John. Right? Hesitantly, Rye said, "Yes." Concentrating hard on the carpet, Gidney asked, "Why exactly me?" Rye wondered if flattery would help. Because you're the best, okay? Gidney petulantly swivelled his chair and, with his back now to DS Rye, raised his hand, sounding supremely irritated. All right, gimme. The forensic image files are on the server under job number three four zero. So, what exactly am I looking for? Rye did not like talking to his junior's back, but he had learned from experience that there was no point trying to change this weirdo. It was best to humour him if he wanted the best out of him. Postal addresses, phone numbers, email addresses. Anything that could give us a clue where a couple called Mr. and Mrs. Bryce might be, Tom and Kelly Bryce. He spelt out their names. Do what I can. Thanks, Andy. Rye returned to his desk, then was almost immediately called over to the far end of the room by another colleague, DC John Shaw, a tall, good-looking young man of thirty who he liked a lot. Shaw was extremely bright, also from a university background like Gidney. But the complete opposite of the other man in every way. Shaw was working on a particularly harrowing photograph album on a hard drive seized in a raid on a suspected paedophile's house. He had noticed a pattern in the man's taste: bashing small children around before photographing himself having sex with them. It seemed similar to another case they had handled recently, and he wanted Rye's view. Ten minutes later. John Rye returned to his desk, deep in thought. He had become hardened to most kinds of vile stuff that he saw on computers, but hurting kids still got to him, every time. He barely noticed as he passed Gidney's workstation that he wasn't there. A short while later, taking a brief respite from his emails, Rye looked over his shoulder and was surprised and irritated, considering the urgency, to see that Gidney still had not returned. He stood up and walked over to the geek's workstation. On the screen, he saw.
The shipping forecast issued by the Met Office on behalf of the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency at 05:55 on Monday, the 6th of June, 2005. The general synopsis at midnight. Low Western France, 1,014. Expected South East England, 1,010 by 1,300. Low Rockall, 1,010. Moving steadily South East. High Fast Net, 1,010. Dissipating. What on earth was the man doing, looking at the shipping forecast when they were in the middle of an emergency? And where the hell was he? He'd been gone a good twenty minutes, if not more. After a further twenty minutes had passed, it became evident to Ray that Andy Gidney had vanished, and he was about to discover Gidney had securely deleted everything from the server and taken the laptop and the cloned hard drive with him. Chapter seventy-seven. Roy Grace drove away from Harry Frame's house, suddenly feeling very low and very tired, despite the latest can of Red Bull and the caffeine tablets he had swallowed less than half an hour ago. It was too soon to take any more. He hoped to hell that the clairvoyant would suddenly get one of his sparks of inspiration. Then his phone rang. He answered it hopefully. It was Branson, cheery as ever. Bearing up, old timer. I'm bagged," Grace said. "What news? Someone from D.S. Gayler's lot has been going through Reggie Diath's paperwork. They found a monthly standing order on his Barclay card to a company called Scarab Entertainment. The amount is one thousand pounds. Thousand quid a month? Yep. Where does someone like Diath get that kind of money? By supplying small children to rich men as a sideline. Where's the company based? Grace asked. That's the bad news. Panama. Grace thought for a moment. There were certain countries in the world where the law guaranteed a company total privacy from investigation. He recalled from a previous case that Panama was one of them. That's not going to help us much in the short term. A thousand quid a month. That's big business, Branson said. Couldn't we get a court order to force all the credit card companies to tell us who else is paying a grand a month to Scarab Entertainment? Yes, in these circumstances, with lives at stake, we could, but it won't help us. We'll get a list of nominee directors from some law firm in Panama that will tell us to fuck off when we approach it. How many subscribers did they have? It wouldn't need many to make a very substantial business, one that they would go to great lengths to protect. Dearly valued customer, we hope you enjoyed our little bonus show. Remember to log in at twenty-one fifteen on Tuesday for our next big attraction: a man and his wife together. Our first ever double killing. For a thousand a month, you would want to give the odd little freebie, wouldn't you? Just toss the occasional paedophile into an acid bath. You still there, old timer? Yes. Anything else, your end? We got one sighting of Mr. Bryce and Mrs. Spass just after midnight, filling up with petrol at a Texaco garage at Pycombe, from the CCTV camera. Other vehicles on the camera? No. And nothing of use in the Spass. Forensics are crawling all over it. Nothing so far. I'm coming back to the incident room, Grace said. I'll be about twenty minutes. I'll have some coffee waiting. I need a quadruple espresso. <laughs> Me too. Grace drove on, turning off the coast road and driving inland on the upper road through Kemp Town, past the posh girls' school, St Mary's Hall, the Royal Sussex County Hospital, then the Victorian Gothic facade of the mixed public school, Brighton College. On his left, a short distance ahead, he saw a muscular-looking man with a strutting gait walking into a newsagent's. Something about him looked familiar, but he couldn't immediately think what. But it was enough to make him do a U-turn. He pulled over on the opposite side of the road, switched off the engine, and watched. After no more than a minute, the man emerged from the shop, a cigarette in his lips, carrying a plastic bag with a bunch of newspapers sticking out of the top, and walked towards a black Volkswagen Golf parked with two wheels on the curb, its hazard flashers on. Grace stared hard through his windscreen. The gate was distinctly odd. A curious rolling swagger that reminded him of the way some hard nuts from the armed forces walked, as if they owned the pavement. 
Dressed in a singlet, white jeans and white loafers, the man had gelled spikes of short hair and sported a heavy gold chain around his neck. Where the hell had he seen him before? And then his sometimes near-photographic memory kicked in, and he knew exactly where and when he had seen this man before. Last night, on the CCTV footage in the Karma bar, he had been Janie Stretton's date. Grace's heart was pounding. The Volkswagen drove off. Memorising the number, he gave it a few seconds, led a taxi followed by a British telecom van pass, then pulled back out onto the road, made another U-turn and followed, dialing the incident room on his mobile. It was answered on the first ring by Denise Woods, one of the indexers, a very serious, very efficient young woman. Hi, it's Grace. I need a PNC check very quickly. I'm following the vehicle now. It's a Volkswagen Golf, registration Papa Lima 03, Foxtrot Delta Oscar. Denise said she would call him right back. A short distance on, the Volkswagen, still in front of the taxi and British telecom van, stopped at a red traffic light. When the lights went green, the Golf turned left into Lower Rock Gardens, heading down to the seafront. The other two vehicles went straight on. Grace paused for a second, then turned left, keeping as far back as he dared. Come on, Denise. The lights at the bottom at the junction with Marine Parade were green, and the golf turned right onto the coast road. Grace went over on amber, keeping as far behind the golf as he dared, letting a Ford Focus and then an elderly Porsche overtake him, but keeping the golf in sight. As the golf negotiated the roundabout in front of the Palace Pier, his phone rang. It was Denise. The registered owner of the car was a company called Bourne Holt International Limited, with a P.O. box number in Brighton. The car had not been reported lost or stolen, and there were no police interest markers from anybody. Bourne Holt International Limited, Grace said. I know that name. Then he remembered why. Denise, quickly take a look at the registration of the van that crashed last night. I'll hold. The Golf continued heading west along the seafront, past the recently repainted façade of the Royal Albion Hotel. Then, as they approached the old ship hotel, the Golf moved into the outside lane, its right turn indicator signalling. To his relief, a blue S-Class Mercedes in front of him was signalling right also. Grace tucked in behind its substantial bulk. He saw the Golf head up past the hotel and make a right down into the huge Civic Square underground car park. So did the S-Class. Grace was right on its tail, waiting behind it on the ramp. Denise came back on the phone. It's the same, Roy. Bornhole International Limited. He clenched his fists in excitement. Brilliant! The automatic barrier swung up and he moved forward, waited for the ticket to emerge from the machine and grabbed it. Well done, he said. But there was no signal. The barrier swung up again, and he drove the Alpha through. Just as he did so, a BMW 3 Series reversed out of a space, blocking Grace's path. It reversed slowly, a nervous man inching back inch by sodding inch. Come on, Grace screamed silently. After what seemed an eternity, the BMW drove forward, then turned off onto the exit ramp. Grace accelerated. All the spaces on this level were taken. He took the ramp down to the next level. That was full too. So was the next level. But as he raced through it, a Ford Galaxy people carrier filled with children, a nervous mother at the wheel, reversed across his path. Jesus, woman, get out of the way! He had no option but to wait. And wait. And wait. Finally, he got down to level four and saw several free spaces. He accelerated looking for the golf, and then he saw it, parked in a bay. The driver had vanished. He braked behind it, cursing. There was a blast of horn behind him. In his mirror, he saw a Range Rover. He raised a finger, drove on a few yards, then turned into the first empty space he saw, switched off the engine and jumped out of the car. He sprinted towards the exit, up the steps two at a time, and out into the large open square with a Japanese restaurant in the middle, the Thistle Hotel on one side, and rows of shops on the two other sides. There was no sign of the man with the rolling gait and the spiky hair. 
There were three other exits he could have left by. Grace ran round, covering each of them, but the man had vanished. Grace cursed, thinking hard, standing by the first exit nearest the golf and his car. He doubted the man had seen him tailing him, but how long it would be before he returned to the car was anyone's guess. It could be five minutes or five hours. Then he had an idea. He dialed his former base, Brighton Central, and asked to be put through to an old mate, Mike Hopkirk, a Brighton divisional inspector. To his relief, Hopkirk was in and not on a call. Hopkirk was a wise old owl with many years of service behind him. He commanded a lot of respect in the force and was well liked. Grace had made his choice of who to call for this task very carefully. To get everything galvanised at the speed he needed, if Hopkirk agreed, he was the man. Roy, how are you? Keep seeing your name in the press. Glad to see your move to Sussex House hasn't blunted your appetite for pissing people off. Very witty. Listen, I'll chat later. I need a big favour and I need it right now. We're talking about two people's lives. We've reason to believe they've been abducted and their lives are in imminent peril. Tom and Kelly Bryce, Hopkirk said, surprising Grace. How the hell do you know that? He was forgetting just how razor sharp Hopkirk was. The roar of a passing lorry drowned out Hopkirk's reply. Covering one ear and jamming the phone hard up against the other, Grace shouted, Sorry, can you repeat that? They're on the bloody front page of the Argus! The PRO had managed to pull it off. Brilliant! OK, Mike, here's what I want. I need you to close down Civic Square car park for an hour to give me enough time to search a car in here. He heard what sounded like a lot of air going backwards very quickly. Close it down. I need an hour. The biggest car park in Brighton in the middle of the day. Close it down. Are you out of your mind? No, I need you to do this now, right this minute. On what grounds, Roy? A bomb scare. You've had a call from a terrorist cell. Shit, you're serious, aren't you? Come on, it's a quiet Monday morning. Wake up your troops. And if this goes pear-shaped, I'll take the rap. Won't be you, Roy. It'll be me, and you know that. But you'll do it? Civic Square. Civic Square. OK, he said, sounding dubious but resigned. Get off my bloody phone. I need it. Grace needed his, too. He called Sussex House to arrange for a Soco team to get down here immediately and for the officer to be accompanied by someone from traffic who was capable of getting past the locks and security system of a VW Golf. Next, he phoned a detective inspector called Bill Ancrum, who was responsible for the deployment of the local surveillance team. In a rare stroke of luck, Ancrum had good news for him. We were down to follow someone in Central Brighton today and the job's gone short. We've had a no-show. I was about to pull the team out and have a training afternoon instead. How quickly could you get them covering the Civic Square car park? Grace asked. Within an hour? We're not far away already. Grace made the detailed arrangements, gave him the vehicle registration and exact position of the golf. Then he phoned the incident room and had them fax and email the photograph of the Volkswagen's driver to Ancrum. Next, he spoke to Nickel and told him he would have to see the officer from the Met on his own after all. As he was speaking to him, there was a deafening explosion of wailing. It sounded as if all the emergency vehicles in the entire city of Brighton and Hove had switched on their sirens simultaneously. Chapter 78 Kelly was scaring Tom. It was like being locked in the darkness with a total stranger, a completely unpredictable one. There were long periods of silence, then suddenly she would screech hysterical abuse at him. She was starting again now, her voice cracked and strained from so much screaming. You stupid bastard! You idiot man! You got us into this! If you'd left the bloody CD thing on the train, this would never have happened! They're never going to let us go. Do you understand that? You stupid fucking failure of a man. Then she burst into a fit of sobs. Tom felt all scrunched up inside. The sound of her crying was terrible, so harrowing. 
but there was nothing he could say that she seemed to take on board. He had been talking to her continuously since the fat man had left the room, trying to calm her down, trying to boost her, to keep up their spirits, trying to do anything to distract himself from the searing agony in his bladder, from his raging thirst and the pangs of hunger and his fear. He wondered if it was the vodka that was talking, making Kelly behave like this, or the lack of it. Had she been on the edge, the way she had been for a few months after Jessica had been born, and this had pushed her over the cliff? All that stuff with eBay. Had that been some kind of a warning or a cry for help that he had missed? You stupid fucking failure! She screeched again. Tom winced. Failure. That was how she saw him. She was right. He had failed in business. Now he had failed in the most important thing of all, protecting his family. He clenched his eyes shut for a few moments and prayed to the God he hadn't spoken a word to in 25 years. Then he opened them again, but it made no difference. It was still totally black in here. His legs were cramping from being bound together. He rolled over, but only did one complete loop before the chain around his ankle snagged tight and he cried out in pain as the manacle or clamp or whatever it was cut into his leg. Think, he said to himself. Think. The wall on the floor immediately around him was smooth. He needed something jagged he could rub against to saw through the cords, but there was nothing. Damned, damned, damned nothing. You hear me? You stupid fucking failure! Tears welled in his eyes. Oh, my darling Kelly, I love you so much. Don't do this to me. What did the fat creep want? Who the hell was he? How did you get through to someone like that? But deep down, he knew who the man was and why they were here. Suddenly, his fear deepened even further as his thoughts crystallised. He had dropped the kids off with Kelly's parents some while back during the night. Her mum was feisty enough, but her bedridden father was totally helpless, poor man. Was the fat man planning to seize the kids too? What if he or his thugs came when Kelly's mother was out? In desperation, Tom rolled over, the chain jerked tight. He pulled, ignoring the pain, Holding his breath, he pulled again, 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 but nothing gave. He lay still for a while. Then he had an idea. At that moment, some way in the distance, he saw the rectangle of light appear again, the door. Two figures came through, each with a torch. His pulse quickened. He felt a tightness in his throat. He tensed up, ready to fight any way, any which way he could. One figure was walking towards Kelly, the other towards himself. Kelly was silent. The next instant, the beam, like quicksilver in his eyes, dazzled him. Then it swung away and lit a paper cup of water and a bread roll lying on the floor. It for you, said a voice in broken English, a hard voice which sounded Eastern European to his untrained ear. I need to urinate, Tom said. Go on! Piss in your pants like everyone else around here! Kelly shouted out. You do no urinate, the man replied. I have to go, Tom implored. Please take me to the bathroom. The man was tall, lean, late twenties, dressed sharply in black, stern-faced with a short modern haircut. Tom could make out his features now, but more importantly... He could see beyond him. The nearest row of chemical drums. It, the man said again, then walked away, joined by his companion. A few seconds later they'd gone. The rectangle of light went out. Tom and Kelly were back in total darkness. Darling, Tom said. Silence. Darling, please listen to me. Why didn't they bring me anything to drink, she said. They brought water. That's not what I fucking meant. 
How long had she been drinking? Tom wondered. How long he had not noticed. How am I supposed to drink with my arms tied to my side? Want to tell me that, Mr. Smart Husband? Tom moved his head slowly towards where the water and the roll had been placed. His nose touched the side of the cup, and he cursed silently at the indignity of what he was being put through. Moving his lips gingerly over the rim, desperate not to spill any precious drop, he finally gripped the rim with his teeth, tilted the cup up, and drained it greedily. Then, like some kind of blind nocturnal animal, he felt with his nose until he found the roll. He had no appetite, but forced himself to take a bite. He struggled to chew and swallow. Then he took one more bite, swallowed, and spat the rest out. I think we should go home now, Kelly announced. Do you think they'll give us goodie bags? And for the first time in the last couple of days, Tom smiled. Maybe she was calming down. I don't think much of their hospitality so far, he said, trying to crack a joke back. But his words fell away into black silence. The water and the food were already making him feel a little better, giving him some strength. He decided to make his move. Half rolling, half squirming, he eased his way slowly, painfully across the floor, over to the left, in the direction he had memorised from the spill of the torch beam a few minutes ago, towards the line of chemical drums. Then he panicked as the chain jerked tight on his ankle. Please, just a little more. Just give a little more. He pulled hard, but the clamp bit in even harder, making him cry out in pain. Tom? Are you okay, darling? Thank God. She was calm now. Yes, he hissed, suddenly concerned anyone might be listening in. I'm fine. Then his face touched something. Please don't let it be the wall. It felt plastic, cold, round. It was a drum. He tried to push his way up it. The drum wobbled. He slid down, rolling onto his stomach, his legs tangled behind him, his ankle agony. He jerked himself up, then up again. Finally, taking a massive breath and exhaling and pushing himself at the same time with all he had, he succeeded. He got his chin over the rim, and it felt beautifully, raggedly sharp. Slowly, inching back, keeping his chin clamped over it, he levered it back. It was heavy, much heavier than he had imagined. Too heavy for him. Suddenly it toppled and fell to the floor with a loud, echoing boom. Tom! Kelly cried out. It's OK. What are you doing? Nothing. Working as fast as he could, he moved up to the rim, felt in the darkness where the cord strapping his arms to his side was, and began to rub that against the rough edge. After some minutes, almost as surprised that it had actually worked as relieved, he was able to move his arms away from his body. Just one tiny step, he knew, but he felt as if he had just climbed Everest. Relief surged through him. He could do this. Now, he swung his hands, still tied tightly together, through the darkness, feeling for the rim. He found it and began to rub the cord between his wrists furiously against the edge. Slowly, steadily, he could feel the strands giving and the binding loosening. And suddenly, his hands were free. He shook off the last bit of slack cord from his wrist, pushed himself upright, stretching his arms and flexing his hands, trying to get the blood circulating in them once more. Are we going to die here, Tom? Kelly whimpered. No, we are not. Mum and Dad couldn't bring the children up. We've never thought about that, have we? We are not going to die. I love you so much, Tom. Her voice brought him close to tears again. There was so much tenderness, warmth, caring in it. I love you more than anything in the world, Kelly, he said, leaning forward, feeling his way along the cords that bound his legs until he came to the knot. It was tied incredibly tightly, but he worked on it relentlessly and, after a short while, it started to come loose. 
and suddenly his legs were free, except for his shackled ankle. The thought was ever present in his mind that if the fat man came in now, there would be hell to pay, but it was a risk he had to take. He knelt, gripped the rim of the drum, then stood up, and lifting as hard as he could, righted it. Then he felt along the top for the cap and found it quickly, clasping his hands around it, moving them across it, trying to work out how it opened. For the first time in his life, having some understanding of what it must be like to be blind. There was a twisted wire and a paper seal over it. He worked his fingers underneath the wire and pulled. It cut into his flesh. Digging his hand in his pocket, he pulled out his handkerchief and wound it round his fingers, then tried again. The wire snapped. Why are we here, Tom? she asked plaintively. Who is that gross creep? I don't know. What did he mean about us looking good, dead? He was just trying to scare us, Tom replied, attempting to sound convincing, struggling to make the cap move, aware that his voice sounded considerably higher than usual, a vague, flimsy plan developing in his mind. Slowly, the cap began to turn. It took five, maybe six full turns before it came away in his hand. A vile, burning, acrid reek instantly filled his nostrils. He lurched back, choking, dropping the cap and hearing it roll away in the darkness. Tom! Kelly called out, alarmed. He continued coughing, his lungs on fire. He was trying to think back to when he had done chemistry at school, a subject he had been crap at. There had been bottles of acid in the chemistry lab. Sulfuric and hydrochloric were the ones he could immediately remember. Would this stuff, whatever it was, eat through the chain attached to his ankle? But how could he get it out of the drum in this darkness? If the drum fell over and the stuff started pouring out, it could spread over the floor to Kelly or choke them. Then his heart felt as if it had stopped. He saw the ray of light out of the corner of his eye, the rectangle in the distance. Someone was coming in. This ends Disc 11. Looking Good Dead. Disc 12. Chapter 79. Down on level four of the Civic Square car park, a group of police officers was clustered around the black Volkswagen Golf. Outside, officers were blocking every entrance. There wasn't a soul anywhere else inside the entire building. I don't want the owner to know we've been in, Grace said to the young PC from traffic who was kneeling by the driver's door, holding a huge set of levers on a ring in one hand and what looked like a radio transmitter in the other. No worries, I'll be able to lock it again, he'll never know. Joe Tyndall, in a white protective suit, stood beside Grace, chewing a stick of gum. He seemed in an even more grumpy mood than usual. Not content with ruining my weekend, Roy, the senior Socko said. Making sure you screw my week up right from the word go too, eh? There was a loud click and the golf's door opened. Instantly its horn started blaring, a deafening, echoing beep, 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 beep. The traffic constable popped the bonnet open and ducked under it. Within seconds, the beeping stopped. He closed the bonnet. OK, he said to Tyndall and Grace. All yours. Grace, also in white protective suit and gloves, let Tyndall go in first and stood watching him. A quick check of his watch showed it had been 25 minutes since they'd closed the car park. The scene outside the entrances was total chaos. Police vehicles, ambulances, fire engines, dozens of stranded shoppers, business people, visitors. And the knock-on effect was that most of Central Brighton's traffic was now gridlocked. Grace was going to have a lot of egg on his face if nothing came of this. He watched Tyndall take print dustings in the most likely places first. The interior mirror, gear stick, horn pad, interior and exterior door handles. When he was done with those, Tyndall picked a hair off the driver's headrest with tweezers and deposited it in an evidence bag. Then again, using the tweezers, he removed one of several cigarette butts in the ashtray and put that into a separate bag. 
After a further five minutes, he emerged from the car looking marginally more cheerful than when he had arrived. Got some good prints, Roy. I'll get straight back and have the boys run them on the NAFIS. NAFIS was the National Automated Fingerprint Information System. I'm coming up there myself, Gray said. I'll be about ten minutes behind you. I'll have a result waiting for you. I appreciate it. Actually, I don't give a fuck whether you appreciate it or not, the Socko said, staring hard at the detective superintendent. Sometimes Grace found it hard to tell when Joe Tindall was being serious and when he was joking. The man had a peculiar sense of humour. He couldn't gauge it now. Good, Grace said, trying to humour the man. I admire your detached professionalism. Detached bollocks, Tindall said. I do it because I'm paid to do it. Being appreciated doesn't bang my drum. He stepped out of his protective clothes, bagged them, and headed off towards the exit staircase. Grace and the traffic constable exchanged a glance. He can be a tetchy bugger. Cool glasses, though, the constable said. Grace checked the interior of the car, looking in the glove compartment, which contained nothing but an owner's manual, and in each of the door pockets, which were empty. He checked under the front seats, removed the cushion from the rear seat and looked under that. Nothing. There were absolutely no personal effects in the car at all. It felt more like a rental vehicle than a private one. Then he checked the boot. It was spotless, containing just the toolkit, the spare wheel and a reflective warning triangle that he presumed came with the car. Finally, he crawled underneath. There was no mud, nothing to indicate anything out of the ordinary. He hauled himself back to his feet, told the traffic constable that he could lock it up and reset the alarm and walked along to his car, anxious to get back to Sussex House. Hoping desperately the stroppy but brilliant Joe Tindall was going to produce a result with those prints. And that the surveillance team did not lose the VW. Bringing Brighton to a halt for no result was hardly going to improve Alison Vosper's opinion of him or his chances of avoiding relegation to Newcastle, Cassian Pew or no Cassian Pew. Then suddenly he thought of Cleo. It was 12.20. She hadn't returned his call. Chapter 80 Tom threw himself down onto the floor and frantically scrabbled across the hard stone surface with his hands, trying to find the cords. A torch beam stabbed the darkness. It briefly fell on Kelly, then on his face, then jigged against the wall, lighting up a row of chemical drums, including the one with its lid removed. Shit, 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 shit. He lay on his side, very still, holding his breath still, hands rigidly to his side, legs clamped together, dripping perspiration. He heard the clack, clack, clack of footsteps approaching. His heart was thudding the roar in his ears of his blood coursing through his veins. The bitter bile of terror rose in his throat. This was going to be the moment. As soon as he was discovered, Christ, maybe he'd been stupid all over again. Stupid to have left the house. Stupid to have let them into his car. And now stupid, unbelievably stupid to have tried to escape. Kelly was right, what she had said earlier, calling him a failure. For an instant he shut his eyes, praying, fighting down vomit. Was this how it was going to finish? All the dreams? Never seeing the children again? Never! There was a loud clatter. He heard something rolling across the floor. Whatever it was, it hit him on the side of the head. A hard object, but light. He turned, remembering to stay in his trussed-up position. The beam shone directly into his eyes for a moment, blinding him. Then he heard the same broken English voice he had heard a short while ago. For urinate. No shit. The beam moved away from his face and onto an object lying on its side just a few feet away. It was an orange plastic bucket. The footsteps receded. Tom turned to watch. He saw the flashlight beam swinging across the floor until the man reached the rectangle of light in the distance. He thought, fleetingly, that it didn't seem to have occurred to the man how he was going to use the bucket with his hands trussed to his sides. 
He heard the slam of a heavy-sounding metal door, and then, once again, there was total darkness. Chapter 81 Are you out of your fucking mind? Carl Venner shouted, his face puce like his shirt, with its buttons straining against his gut. Veins bulged at his temples. The scratch the young girl had made during his visitor's last call was still very visible. What do you think you're doing? Coming here! I told you never, ever, ever to come here unless you are told. What part of don't ever, ever come here unless you are told do you not fucking understand, John? Andy Gidney stared down at the cheap beige carpet, his eyes fixed on one tuft. He was trying to calculate how many strands of fibre might be in the tuft. Venner brought his index finger to his mouth and began to tear at the skin around the nail. A cigar smouldered in the ashtray on his metal desk on the top floor of the warehouse. And anyhow, just where have you been? I've been trying to call you for the past hour. Um, I've been on my way here. So why didn't you answer your fucking phone? Because you told me never to bring it here. To the weatherman's quiet satisfaction, that temporarily silenced Venner, who continued working on his finger for some moments, examined it, then worked on it some more. We have a major disaster on our hands. That's why I was calling you. Actually, you have two, the weatherman thought, one you don't know about yet. Not that he cared. Carl Venner could have a thousand disasters and he wouldn't care. He continued counting the fibres. Venner picked up his cigar, stabbed it between his lips, and puffed it back into life, blowing the smoke out of the corner of his mouth. A fucking disaster, OK? Cromarty, 4th, southwest, veering north, 4 or 5, occasionally 6 in north at Sierra, he informed Venner, still staring at the floor. Rain at times, moderate or good. What the fuck's with this weather forecast crap? Um, actually, um, it's the shipping forecast. Venner shook his head. Jesus! One of our associates is in a coma, and y'all giving me the goddamn shipping forecast. Um, yes, um, that's right. Venner stared at him. This fuckwit was really beyond him. Joan! The disaster is that our associate had a laptop with him that he was using to upload our latest offering to our customers. The police have seized it. We need that laptop back. I have it, Gidney said, and the clone the high-tech crime unit made of the hard disk. Venner looked astonished. You have it? Um, yes, sort of, exactly. You have the laptop back. The weatherman nodded. The fat man's whole demeanour changed. He heaved himself up, and shook the surprised Gidney by the hand. You are one smart motherfucker. Then he sat back down, as if exhausted by the effort, clamped his cigar back between his lips, and held out his hand greedily, like a fat schoolboy wanting more sweets. So, gimme. You have it in your rucksack? Um, no, that's my sandwich. One of the two silent Russians entered the room. He was dressed as usual in a black suit over a black T-shirt. He stood a few feet behind Venner, silent and unsmiling. The weatherman stared back down at the tuft of carpet, ignoring the outstretched hand, trying to pluck up the courage to say what he had come here to say. He thought about Q in Star Trek again and muttered the words silently to himself. If you can't take a little bloody nose... Maybe you ought to go back home and crawl under your bed. It's not safe out here. It's not for the timid. The man who was not timid took a deep breath and, stammering, his face reddening, he blurted, I don't actually have them with me. Venner's face clouded over. Where do you actually have them? Kidney sensed an almost silent footfall behind him. 
he detected the faintest shadow on the carpet. Venner bringing in his team, the Russian in front, the Albanian behind, to intimidate him. But today he was the man who was not timid. He would stand his ground. He was shaking, his face burning, rivers of perspiration rolling down inside his white shirt. But he was standing his ground. I have them in a safe place. Exactly how safe? Venner inquired coldly. Very. Good. Sensible. If you want them back, you have to pay me what you promised. And 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 I. He was now blurting, gabbling. I don't want to do this any more. Then he stared at the carpet, gulping down air. Is that right, John? Venner said calmly. You don't want to work in our team any more. Um. No. I'm really hurt. I figured we all got along so well. You know, John. I thought you and I were becoming real good buddies. I'm really hurt. Of course, you want to leave. You want your money. That's absolutely fine. The weatherman was silent. He had not been expecting this reaction. He had expected Venner to explode. So, exactly where is this very safe place you have the laptop and the clone disc? Smiling proudly, Gidney looked up. <laughs> you would never believe it. No one will look there. No one will find them in a thousand years. That's so. The weatherman nodded excitedly. Not even the police. Absolutely not. Venner beamed happily at the weatherman, then swung his left hand sharply through the air. The movement puzzled the weatherman. It appeared to be some coded signal, but he did not have long to fret about it. Watch the birdie, Venner said. The weatherman felt increasingly confused. The Russian standing beside Venner was holding up a small video camera. The Albanian standing behind him took two swift steps forward and, with one chop of the side of his hand, snapped the weatherman's neck and spinal cord in two. Chapter Eighty Two. The fingerprint department occupied one of the largest floor spaces in Sussex House. On the ground floor, a short walk along from the high-tech crime unit, it was a hive of quiet activity. And every time Grace went there, he noticed just the very faintest aroma of ink in the air. Derry Blaine, one of the senior fingerprint officers, sat at a workstation more or less in the middle of the labyrinth of desks and machinery. On his computer screen was the best print Joe Tyndall had lifted from the Volkswagen off the interior mirror. Grace and Tyndall stood behind him, looking down over his shoulder at the screen. Blaine, a balding, bespectacled man, had avuncular looks and a quiet, learned manner which inspired confidence. He clicked the keyboard, and a full set of ten prints appeared. He clicked again, and Grace's heart skipped a beat. There on the screen was a police custody photograph of his man, and his name, the driver of the Golf, Janie Stretton's date at the Karma Bar. We've got a match, Derry Blaine said. I've run him through NAFIS, and he was printed just over a year ago after a brawl at the Escape Nightclub in Brighton. He was released with a caution. His name is Mick Luvich. He's an Albanian of no fixed abode. What else do you have on him? Grace asked. Well, here's the thing. Blaine tapped his keyboard again. There's a PNC marker on him as someone to watch, at the request of Interpol. Grace's excitement increased. PNC was the Police National Crime Database. So I ran an international search on his full set. We need a full set to do that, and it came up with a link to this charmer. Blaine tapped another couple of keys, and after a moment, the head and torso of a grossly fat man appeared on the screen. He had a small head in comparison to the bulk of his body, with gelled silver hair pulled back into a tiny pigtail. His name is Carl Venner, also goes under the name of Jonas Smith. He has an interesting history, Blaine continued. 
Werner was in the US military, started out as a chopper pilot in Vietnam, got a purple heart for being wounded in combat, then stopped flying for some health reason and became a radio operator. He later got promoted to a high position in military communications out there. After that, he was involved in a scandal. You may remember it. A war cameraman and a couple of photographers were indicted on charges of filming the torture and execution of Viet Cong and then flogging the footage. Snuff pictures, Grace asked. Exactly. But Venner wormed his way out of the charges. He stayed with the US military and was moved to an intelligence posting in Germany. Then when Bosnia started up, he was posted there. The same thing happened as in Vietnam. Eventually, he was court-martialed for filming the execution of prisoners and selling the films into the international snuff movie market. For real? Grace asked. Yes, absolutely. This guy is lower than low life. He's your absolute bottom feeder. A smart lawyer got him off the charges, but enough mud stuck and he was slung out of the military. Next thing, his name crops up in an international child pornography ring based in Atlanta. Except, it's not just men having sex with children, it's footage of kids being murdered. Mostly Asian, some Indian, some white too. You really mix with the best, don't you, Roy? Tyndall said with a smile, his humour back. That's me all over. You should come to one of my dinner parties. I'll keep waiting for the invite. So, what happened to him? Grace asked, turning back to Blaine. Seems he did a runner. Fell off the FBI's radar, then three years ago he popped up in Turkey, then Athens, then Paris. Cosy little snuff movie ring got busted there. The French police raided an apartment in the 16th arrondissement of Paris. They seized a load of equipment and a bunch of people who said Venner was the ringleader. He hasn't been seen since. What's the link with Luvich? Interpol have a desk man in London who knows about that. I have his number. His name's uh, Detective Sergeant Barry Farrier. Thanks, Terry. You've done a great job and incredibly quick. Because of the traffic, it had taken Grace 20 minutes longer to get back to headquarters than he had planned. But Joe Tyndall must have had the same problem. Blaine couldn't have had the prints more than 15 minutes. Back upstairs in his private office opposite MIR1, Grace checked first with the surveillance team watching the Gulf. The driver had not yet appeared. Then he was about to dial Detective Sergeant Barry Farrier when his mobile rang. As he answered, he recognised Harry Frame's high-pitched, effusive voice. You have something? Grace asked the clairvoyant. Well, I don't know if it means anything to you or not. I'm getting a watch. A watch, Grace said, like a wristwatch. Exactly, Frame's enthusiasm mounted. A wristwatch. There is something very significant. A wristwatch will lead you to something very satisfying to do with the case you're working on. This case, I think. Can you elaborate? Grace asked, puzzled. No, uh, no, that's all. As I said, I, I don't know if it means anything. Any particular make? No. Expensive, I think. Expensive? Yes. A man's or a woman's? Oh, it's a man's watch. I, I think there might be more than one. Grace shook his head, thinking hard. It really meant absolutely nothing at this moment. OK, he said. Thank you, Harry. Let me know if you get anything else. Oh, I will. Don't you worry. Grace ended the call and immediately dialed the Interpol number in London. He had a two-minute wait for Farrier to finish a call, listening to Greensleeves on what seemed a permanent loop, then heard a sharp Cockney accent. So yes, Farrier, can I help you? Grace introduced himself immediately. Farrier became excited. Oh, I've got detectives in Greece, Turkey, Switzerland and Paris who'd like a chat with Mr Luvich. I know where his car is, Grace said. What do you have on Carl Venner? Zilch, ain't been sighted in three years and there's enough of him to see he's a fat bastard. There was a knock on the door and Norman Potting came in, clutching a sheet of paper. Grace signalled that he was busy. Potting hovered by the door. I'll be very interested in anything you can come up with on Venner, Barry Farrier said. Got markers on him as long as my right arm, right across Europe. Could he be in England? Well, if Luvich is, there's a chance. Tell me more about Luvich. Albanian, 32, smart boy. Studied technology at uni there, as well as becoming a kickboxing champion and a bare-knuckle fighter. 
Typical of his generation, came out of uni, no jobs, got involved with a bunch of students designing computer viruses for fun, probably out of boredom. Then he itched up with another lot, blackmailing large companies. Blackmailing? Big business. Take a big sporting event here, like the Derby. The major bookies get threatened with attack by computer viruses just a few days before, which will shut down their systems for 24 hours on Derby Day unless they pay up. So they pay up. It's the cheaper option. I've heard of this happening, Grace said. Yeah, it's big time. Anyhow, then somehow Luvic got hooked up with Venner, probably recruited by him, and they were involved in a French snuff ring together for sure. Both of them vanished at the same time. I can email you all the files. Please. Yeah, no worries, right away. I'll tell you one thing, I've seen one of the pictures. I'd like to get my hands on Venner and Luvic in an alleyway on a dark night. Just five minutes with them, I'd like. I know how you feel. Tell me something. Does a scarab beetle mean anything to you in connection with these two? Scarab? Scarab beetle? Yeah. After some moments' silence, Barry Farrier said, their business in France, there was an insect, uh, a scorpion, always present somewhere in the photos and films. Alive or dead? Dead. Why are you asking, can I inquire? Sounds like he's well into his entomology, Grace said. If it's the same man, he's now using scarabs, dung beetles. Very fitting. Grace thanked him, agreed to keep him fully in the loop and hung up. Norman Potting immediately strode over to his desk and laid the sheet of paper he was holding down in front of him. Sulfuric acid, Roy. I've got what I think is a pretty comprehensive list of all the suppliers in the UK. There are five down in the south, two of them in our patch, one in New Haven and one in Port Slade. Grace, still absorbing the information he had been given by Barry Farrier, picked up the list and quickly scanned through the names and addresses. He clocked the two local ones. Suddenly, the door burst open and Glenn Branson came in, his face lit up with excitement. I've got a result, he said, his face inches from his SIOs. Tell me. Branson slapped the photograph of the VW Golf driver down triumphantly on the desk. I've just had a phone call from a taxi driver mate of mine. Frivolously, and for no real reason, Grace asked, Not the one who sneaked on me and Cleo to you. The very same, Branson grinned then continued, totally elated. I circulated this photograph to all my contacts. He just bailed me. He just picked up a fair who he says is a dead ringer for this fellow in Central Brighton 20 minutes ago. He's convinced it's this man. Dropped him off at a warehouse in Port Slade at this address. He gave a handwritten scrap of notepaper to his boss. Grace read it. Then he looked again at the list Potting had just given him. At the distributor of sulfuric acid based in Port Slade. It was the same address. Chapter 83 Tom remembered something. He did not have his mobile phone, but he had something else. He had felt the hard lump. He had been lying on it some of the time. Why the hell hadn't he thought of it before, he wondered. He dug his hand into his trouser pocket and extricated his palm tungsten PDA. He pressed one of the four buttons on the bottom. Instantly, the display lit up. The machine emitted a glow that, at this moment, suddenly felt as good as a thousand torches. He could see. What's that? Kelly called out. My palm! He could see her, actually see her face. How did you... You can move! She hissed. My hands! The beam did not have a long throw. It was wide and short, but for the first time he could begin to orient himself. They were in a huge store, with a ceiling maybe twenty feet high stacked all the way round with racks of chemical drums. There were hundreds of them, if not thousands. There was a concrete floor, no windows, and the beam did not get as far as the door. From the temperature and the total absence of light, he guessed they were underground. There must be a door big enough to get a forklift through for these drums, he thought, and almost certainly a lift. He examined the shackle around his ankle. It looked like one of those police manacles for criminals he had seen in the movies. A wide metal clamp, locked with a chain running off it, secured to the wall by a metal hoop, which was not going anywhere. 
Kelly was chained to another hoop some distance away. Her chain was fully extended. He stood up and moved towards her, but when his chain went tight, there was still a gap of about ten feet between them. You can't dial with that thing, can you? She asked. No. What about email? I could if I had my phone. He urinated into the orange bucket which had arrived a few minutes earlier with a relief that was, for a few fleeting moments, close to bliss. Don't forget to pull the chain, Kelly said. He grinned, suddenly loving her courage. If you could still smile, keep your spirits up. That was how people survived ordeals. I won't, he said, and I'll put the lid back down. He took the few paces the chain allowed him over to the drum he had opened, then shone the light on its side, looking for the label he had felt earlier in the darkness. He found it. It was white, with a yellow and black hazardous substance warning label next to it. On the white part was written, H2SO4, concentrate, 25 litres. Tom again thought back as hard as he could to his schoolboy chemistry lessons, would this stuff eat through metal? How quickly? There was just one way to find out. He put the palm down on the floor and picked up the bucket. As he did so, the display went out. For an instant, his heart sank as he feared the battery had died. Then he realised it was on automatic power down after two minutes. Quickly, he reset it to stay on permanently. Then he picked up the bucket and hurled its contents away from himself and Kelly as far as he could. He turned his attention to the drum. He had removed the cap earlier, and there was a fierce, acrid smell as he neared it. He took a deep breath and, holding the drum as firmly as he could, very aware and scared of the consequences of knocking it over, tilted it so that some poured from the top and splashed on the floor beside the bucket. Shit! Steam curled up from the floor. The acid was reacting with something, which was a good sign. What are you doing? Just trying an experiment. What? What are you trying? Kelly asked, her voice pitifully tight. From his poor memory of chemistry, some acids would not dissolve both plastic and metal. The fact that these drums were plastic told him they should not dissolve the bucket. The burning, acrid reek was getting worse. He could feel it right down his throat. He stepped back took a deep breath, then eased the drum back a few inches and tried again. This time, the acid rattled into the bucket. He kept going until it was just under half full, set the drum back down, upright, then picked up the palm, examining the bucket carefully to make sure no acid was on the handle nor anywhere else he would touch. He poured a small amount of the acid onto a couple of links of the chain. Nothing happened. Wisps of vile-smelling steam rose from the floor on which the two links lay, and immediately around them, but there was no apparent reaction with the steel at all. He stared down in agonised frustration and swore. He might just as well have poured water onto them. Chapter 84 Carl Venner waddled up and down his office, a freshly lit cigar clamped in his mouth, wringing his hands, directing his anger alternately at Luvich, who was chewing gum and smoking a cigarette at the same time, and the Russian. Boys, this is not a good situation. It is just so not good. He raised his hand to his mouth, removed his cigar, then began biting the skin on the end of his index finger again, tearing at it. The Russian, who rarely spoke, said, We need get Yuri out of hospital before he wake. Either get him out or silence him, Venner said. I don't kill my brother, he said darkly. You work for me, Roman. You do what I fucking tell you. Then I no work for you. Venner strutted up to him. Listen, you piece of shit. You'd be fucking driving a tractor in the Ukraine if it weren't for me, so don't ever threaten to quit, because I might just accept your resignation, and then what the fuck do you do? The Russian looked sullen, but said nothing. 
Luvich mimed a chop across his own neck with his hand. I fix. The Russian walked across to the Albanian and planted himself squarely in front of him. He stood a good head taller than the former bare-knuckle fighter. You kill my brother, he said. I kill you. The Albanian stared mockingly back at the Russian, still chewing his gum. He brought his cigarette to his mouth twice in rapid succession, taking two quick drags, inhaling sharply and blowing the smoke out, then said, I do what Mr. Smith said to me to do. I obey Mr. Smith. We have an even more urgent problem, Venice said. That fuckwit creep John Frost, Gidney, with his goddamn weather reports. Well, there's one fucking report he got wrong. The two men looked at him quizzically. Acid rain! Bad hair day for him today! The Russian grinned. The Albanian, who had no sense of humour, did not get it. He had put the weatherman's body in the sulfuric acid tank as was normal. In a couple of days, he would move the bones to the hydrochloric tank. After that, there would be no trace of him left. Our problem, Venner went on, is we don't know what he did, what he said to anyone. And he lied about his phone, right? The Albanian nodded his confirmation. It was in his car outside, switched on. We know what that means, right? Venner said. Both his employees nodded. The police can get his phone company to plot his route across Brighton and Hove, exact times and places. Gentlemen, we need to bail, I'm afraid. We need to get out of here and go back to base in Albania until things calm down. I prefer stay here, the Russian said. Venner tapped his chest. I'm 59. You think I want to spend any part of what's left of my life in that shithole country if I don't have to? It's even got the world's ugliest women. We are here in this country because we like it here. But you guys have fucked up. How? Oh, the Russian said, looking angry now. How? Venner asked, as if astonished by the question. Mick gets followed from somewhere in Kemptown to a car park in the centre of Brighton. Interrupting him, the Albanian said, Yes, but I lose him in the car park. Yes, and your goddamn golf and all. I will get that back. Ignoring him, Venner turned his rage back to the Russian. Your idiot brother attracts the attention of the police, then gets in an automobile wreck and lets them get their hands on his laptop with our film of death on it. And you don't think that's a fuck up? The Russian was silent. Here's what we do, Venner said, his tone suddenly more conciliatory. We shoot the film of Mr. and Mrs. Bryce right now and get rid of them. Then we're out of here. We'll go to Paris this afternoon, then on from there, OK? Two silent, reluctant nods. Then the Albanian said, Where do we do the film? Here, Venner said. In this room. I have some very creative ideas. Mr. Bryce has put us through a lot of grief. I want to hurt him. And I'd like to see him watch all the things we are going to do with Mrs. Brass first. He looked at the Russian. Roman, go bring them up here. Just untie their legs and gag them with gaffer tape. I always like tearing that stuff off. And suddenly, his mood buoyed by the thought of some very inventive things he was going to do to the Bryces, Carl Venner began to hum. Chapter 85 Tom! The sudden hushed urgency in Kelly's voice made Tom look up. Shit! The rectangle of light had appeared at the far end of the room. Someone was entering, a tall, thin man in black, the Eastern European. Tom dived to the floor on top of the palm to smother the light. Quickly groping with his hands, he found the PDA, located the power button and pressed it in hard to switch it off. Had the man come to empty the bucket, Tom wondered, a little irrationally. He pulled his arms tight to his sides and squeezed his legs together, faking the original position he had been trussed up in as best he could. 
He lay still, watching the torch beam steadily jig across the floor towards them. Then it was right in his face. Mr. Bryce, I take you upstairs now. We make you and Mrs. Bryce movie stars. Tom, quaking with terror, was thinking that any second now the man was going to see that his cords had been removed. He must see that, unless he was blind. What do you mean? Movie stars, Kelly said, her voice cracking with fear. The man swung the beam onto her face. We enough talk. Maybe you like quick fuck. Mr. Bryce, you like watch me sex your wife for you. Tom's terror suddenly switched to fury. Touch her and I'll kill you, he said. The man rounded on him and shouted imperiously, Enough talk, I say! He stabbed the beam of the torch right into Tom's face. You quiet! You are not threat me! Then the man knelt down. Tom heard the sound of tape ripping and realised what was coming next. Blinking hard, he could see the man was leaning over him. He could smell cologne on him, a sharp, masculine tang. Tom stiffened. He knew he had just one shot at this, that was all. He hadn't thought it through, he just had to do it. The man was holding a wide strip of gaffer tape between his hands. You'll close mouth! He said, can I just blow my nose? Tom asked, no blow, I'm going to sneeze. And in that moment, he detected the hesitation, just the briefest wavering by the man. It was enough. He sprang sideways, rolling over once, grabbing the bucket with both hands and lifting it, then turned and found the torch beam straight in his face. Kelly was safely to the left, well out of range. With all his strength, he hurled the contents of the bucket straight at the flashlight beam. He felt a few sharp pains on his hands like stings, droplets of the acid, but barely registered them as his ears filled with a terrible, piercing scream of agony. The torch fell to the floor. Tom could just see the man staggering back, clutching at his face. Had to get him. He had to grab him before he got out of reach. Had to. Tom lunged, launching himself forward in a full rugby tackle, aware there must be some acid on the floor but beyond caring. This was his only chance. Somehow, his arms almost leaving their sockets, he just managed to grab the man's right ankle before the chain snapped tight against his own, jolting him to a halt. Then, with a strength he didn't even know he had, he yanked the ankle back towards him. The man fell back across him, writhing, screaming, howling pitifully, clawing at his face with his hands. Kelly was screaming also, Tom! 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 Help! the Russian cried. Help! You help! You help! Please help! Then he just started bellowing in agony, clawing at his face, at the same time writhing, trying to wriggle away from Tom. The man had come to get them, which, Tom realised, meant he must have the keys to the shackles. He seized the torch and cracked it down with all his force on the back of the man's head. There was a tinkle of glass and the light went out. The man was silent, motionless, and for an instant the only sound in the room was the ghastly hissing coming from the man's head, accompanied by a new smell, a vile stench of burning flesh and hair. Tom retched, the acid seeming to fill the air with an invisible caustic haze. He could hear Kelly coughing too. He found the palm, switched it on and rummaged in the man's jacket pockets. Almost immediately, he found a small chain with just two keys on it and pulled it out. He stood up, shaking from shock and fear, not knowing if someone else was about to appear at any second. Knelt and, using the light of the palm, found the keyhole but his hand was shaking so much he could not get it in. Jesus, come on, please! Finally, it slipped in, but it would not turn. It must be the other one, he realised. Somehow, he got the second one in straight away, turned it. The lock sprang open and, seconds later, he was limping across to Kelly. His hands were really stinging now, but he had no time to think about that. Crouching beside her, he kissed her and whispered, I love you. She was staring at him, wide-eyed, near motionless with shock. 
he unlocked her ankle shackle, then started working on the tight knot on the cord binding her legs. His hands were shaking again. The knot was so tight, so damn tight. It wasn't moving. He tried again, then again. Are you okay, my darling? She said nothing. Darling? Nothing. Then, in a tone that sent a shiver rippling beneath every inch of his skin, she said quietly, Tom? Someone's coming into the room. He looked up, straight into a torch beam coming from the doorway. Then he heard the chiding voice of the obese American. You are one silly boy, Mr. Brass. Very foolish indeed. The beam swung away from Tom's face around the room. In seconds, it would find the Russian on the floor. Tom, his nerves jangling, made a snap decision. He had no idea what the outcome would be, but it couldn't be any worse than waiting here crouched down for the American to come over. He sprang up and ran at the doorway, aiming straight for the man in the puce shirt standing in it. He just ran, head down, screaming at the top of his voice, You hideous bastard! He vaguely took in that the man was trying to pull something from his pocket. Something black, metallic, a gun. Then, running flat out, he struck the American full in the stomach with his head. It felt like hitting a massive cushion. He heard a winded gasp, felt a sharp, jarring pain in his own neck, and a moment of blackness. The American tumbled backwards, and Tom fell with him, hitting the floor with his head between the man's legs. Then a hand grabbed his neck from behind, a hand that felt cold and hard, more like a metal pincer than human flesh. It released his neck, and a split second later grabbed his hair, jerking his head painfully up, then pulling him right over onto his back, thudding the back of his head down on the floor and holding it pinioned there. Tom looked straight up into the stubby barrel of a handgun and the eyes of ice behind it. The man was stocky and muscular, with gelled spikes of short fair hair and heavily tattooed arms. He was wearing a white singlet with a gold medallion on a chain, which was almost touching Tom's face, and he smelled of sweat. As he stared down expressionlessly, he was chewing gum, mashing it with small, intensely white incisors that reminded Tom of a piranha fish. The American was staggering to his feet. You want I kill him? No, the American gasped, puffing and wheezing. Oh, no, we're not going to make it that easy. Suddenly, Tom heard a commotion a short distance away. A male voice shouted, Police! Drop your gun! Tom felt his hair released. He saw his assailant turn in shock, then, without any hesitation, raise his gun and fire several shots in rapid succession. The noise was deafening. Tom's ears went numb for a moment, and his nostrils filled with the reek of cordite. Then his assailant and the American vanished. An instant later, he heard a different voice, English, cry out, I've been hit! Jesus! Oh, Jesus Christ, I've been shot! Chapter 86 Grace, emerging from the large elevator, pushed past a partly open door labelled with a large yellow and black warning sign. Protective clothing must be worn beyond this point. Glenn Branson, first out of the elevator, rounded a corner ahead of him, and Grace heard him shout, Police! Drop your gun! Moments later, he heard five shots in rapid succession, then Glenn crying out. Turning the corner... He saw his colleague lying on the ground, clutching his stomach, blood all over his hands, his eyes rolling. Grace shouted into his radio, This is DS Grace. We have a man down. We need an ambulance. Send the firearms unit straight in and all other units. He stopped, torn for an instant between staying with his colleague and wanting to catch whoever had done this. Waiting outside the building, he had two vans of uniformed officers, an entry team from the police operations department, a public order team armed with shields and batons, and a firearms team. 
He turned to Nick Nickel and Norman Potting, who were right behind him. Norman! he yelled. Stay with Glenn! Then he ran on. Ahead of him, he saw a heavy metal door marked emergency exit only, swinging shut. He dived through it, then leapt up a stone staircase two steps at a time, hearing Nickel pounding up right behind him. He rounded a corner, then another. Round the next, he caught sight of the man in singlet and jeans with short, spiky hair, who Derry Blaine in the fingerprint department had identified as Mick Luvich. Police! Stop! Grace shouted. The man stopped, turned, pointed what looked like a gun at him. Grace, flattening himself against the wall and holding Nick Nickel back with his arm, saw a muzzle flash, heard a zing, then felt shards of cement dust strike his face. The man disappeared. Grace waited for several seconds, then ran on up the steps, totally oblivious to danger, just angry, determined to get the bastard, to get him and tear him apart with his bare hands. He rounded another corner and stopped. No sign of Luvich. Up another flight, his heart pounding, round another corner. He paused again, inching forward cautiously. Still no sign. They had to be near the top. Up more steps and another corner. More steps, another corner. Then a metal door ahead of them with a big red exit sign swinging shut. Grace raced, panting up to it, then turned to Nickel. Careful. The young DC nodded. They heard the roar of an engine, the clack of rotors. The helicopter he had seen on the roof, Grace realised. He pushed the door open. A hugely fat, pigtailed man, who he recognised instantly from the photograph Derry Blaine had produced as Carl Venner, was in the pilot's seat of the black helicopter. It was a small chopper, a four-seater Robinson. Luvich was untying a mooring rope attached to one of the helicopter's skids from a metal stanchion. Bursting through the door, Grace yelled, Stop! Police! The Albanian raised his gun. Grace dived to the ground as he saw the muzzle flash. A strong wind was blowing, worsened by the downdraft of the accelerating rotor blades. Sheltering from the wind and the Albanian's gun behind the structure next to him, the top of the lift housing, he presumed, Grace heard a crack close to his ear. Seven shots he had counted. How many in the magazine? The mooring rope came free. Luvich ran round to the other side of the helicopter. Grace turned to Nickel and yelled, Stay back! Then he began crawling forward on his stomach, looking around for something he could use as a weapon. A short distance to his right, he clocked several bags of cement and a pile of bricks. Spiky Hare was working on the second rope. Grace got to his knees and launched himself at him. Luvich raised his gun. Grace threw himself sideways just as he saw the muzzle flash, wishing to hell he'd had the sense to put on a flak jacket. An instant later, he heard the crack of the pistol. The man pulled the trigger again. This time, nothing happened. Grace went straight for him. The next thing he knew, the Albanian's feet were flying at him, catching him full on under his chin. Grace was catapulted onto his back on the pitch surface of the roof, winded and stunned. He heard the engine roar rise. He rolled over, blinking, still a little dazed, saw rooftops, the single tall chimney stack of what had once been Shoreham Power Station in the distance. Felt the wind increasing. Luvich was on board now. The helicopter's skids were off the roof. In desperation, he threw himself at the pile of bricks. Then he saw a length of scaffold pole lying beside them. He grabbed it and hurled it in a swirling arc with all his strength at the tail rotor. For an instant, it sailed through the air in what seemed like slow motion. He thought he had thrown it wide, but, to his amazement, it was a bullseye, right in the middle of the rotor. There was a grinding metallic sound and a shower of sparks. The helicopter lurched sideways. Then, he thought he had failed after all, as it rose sharply several feet in the air before suddenly beginning to rotate on its own axis, and Grace saw that the entire tail rotor had gone. The helicopter spun once, twice, then a giddying third time. It veered straight towards him, engine screaming, and he had to flatten himself on the roof to avoid being hit by the skids. 
The wind threatened to rip his jacket from his back and the hair from his head. Grace heard a huge bang and the next moment was showered with bits of metal and pieces of masonry as the helicopter struck the side of the lift housing. Like some massive beetle crazed by fly spray, it skewed away, almost sideways, part of one of its main rotor blades clattering down inches from Grace, who rolled sideways to get out of its path. He caught a glimpse of Venner in his puce shirt at the controls, saw the fear in his face as he struggled, saw the frozen white shock in the face of Luvich. The helicopter tumbled over onto its side and did a complete flip, followed by another, tumbling towards the edge of the roof, reminding Grace of one of those cheap toys Brighton Street vendors sold, which were weighted and rolled over and over, propelled by their own momentum. And suddenly, there was a stench of aviation fuel in the air. The stricken machine crashed into the lift housing for a second time, crabbed round, still under power, until the cockpit was hanging over the edge of the roof and the helicopter was prevented from going completely over only by its tail wedged against the base of the structure. The engine stopped. Grace scrambled to his feet and ran across. The machine was seesawing, teetering on the brink. Luvich was unconscious, lying upside down on the glass bubble of the cockpit roof. Venner was struggling upside down also, suspended by his harness. At any moment, the helicopter was going to fall. Help me! the pigtailed man implored, thrusting a hand out of the open swinging door. Please, for God's sake, help me, man! Grace, who was not good with heights, knelt staring at the car park a long way below, the wind threatening to blow him over the edge. He grabbed the man's wrist, which was greasy and thick as a ham. The helicopter lurched. The stink of fuel was horrendous. Grace felt something bite into his hand. It was the man's wristwatch. He gripped the pudgy flesh just above it and met the man's tiny, terrified eyes staring into his own, imploring him, Help me! Get me out! His medallion was hanging above his head. The helicopter lurched again. Grace was pulled forward. Another few inches and he would fall over the edge. He realised what the man had to do. Your seat belt! Undo your seat harness! The man was beyond thinking in his panic. Help me! He screeched. Undo your fucking harness! Grace screamed back. There was a grinding sound. The helicopter lurched further. It was going. Only seconds left, Grace reckoned. Undo your belt! Your harness! Suddenly, he felt his arm almost wrenched out of its socket. Grace clung on for dear life, but it was no good. Still, he clung. 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 Saw those tiny, desperate eyes once more. Then Nick Nickel was beside him, reaching down into the helicopter. Grace heard a faint click. Then, as if in a dream, the helicopter was dropping upside down away from him, like a huge toy, until it hit the ground, straddling the roofs of a black Mercedes and a small white Fiat. Almost instantaneously, there was a huge ball of flame and the wriggling, petrified, dead weight of Venner was suspended below him, over the drop, supported by nothing except the grip he and Nickel each had on a wrist, the metal strap of Venner's watch cutting painfully into his hand. Venner produced a long, gurgling whimper. The heat was burning Grace's face. Venner was slipping. He had to hold on to him. He wanted this creep to live. Death was too damn good for him. Somehow, he did not know from where, he found some strength. Nickel seemed to find it too at the same time. And the next moment, like a huge blubbery fish, the fat pigtailed man was hauled to safety up over the edge of the roof. Venner lay on his back, yabbering in terror. There was a dark stain around his crotch where he had pissed himself. Moments later, with no time to spare, Grace roughly rolled him over onto his front, grabbed his hands and cuffed him. There was a vile stench. The creep had crapped himself as well, 
but Grace barely noticed. He was on autopilot now. Yelling at Nickel to get the man out of the building, Grace ran back to the fire exit, hurtled down the flights of steps and into the basement. Norman Potting, accompanied now by two uniformed constables, was kneeling beside Glenn Branson, who seemed semi-conscious. This whole fucking place is going up! Let's get him out! Grace yelled. He shoved his arms under his friend's shoulders, with a constable supporting his midriff, and Potting and the other constable each taking a leg. They carried him up the stairs, then burst through a fire exit door into the car park, into a searing blast of heat from the blazing cars and the helicopter, the stench of burning paint and rubber, and a cacophony of sirens. They carried Branson away as far as they could from the heat until Grace saw an ambulance racing towards them. They stopped. He looked down at Branson, bringing his face close to his mates. How you doing? Remember John Wayne when he got shot in that movie? Branson said, his voice wheezy. Did he live? Grace interrupted him. Yeah, he lived. That how you feel? Yeah. Grace kissed him on the forehead. He couldn't help it. He loved this man. Then, standing back as the paramedics took over, he felt something cutting into his hand. He looked down and saw a blue-faced brightling watch on a broken metal bracelet. It was covered in blood, his own blood. It was the watch, he realised, which had been on the pigtailed man's wrist. How the hell did he and he thought back to a couple of hours earlier today, to the phone call he had had from the clairvoyant Harry Frame. I'm getting a watch. A watch, like a wristwatch. Exactly, a wristwatch. There is something very significant. A wristwatch will lead you to something very satisfying to do with a case you're working on. This case, I think. Can you elaborate? No, I... No, that's all. As I said, I don't know if it means anything. Any particular make? No, expensive, I think. Sucking at his hand to staunch the bleeding, he turned to Nick Nickel, who was closing a police car door on Venna. Do you know anything about wristwatches? His colleague was white, shaking in a bad way, seriously in shock. Not a lot. Why? Grace held up the watch he was holding. What about this? Norman Potting piped up. That's a Breitling. What do you know about them? Only that I could never afford one. They're expensive. A constable came running towards them, looking petrified. Please move away. We're worried the whole building might go up. It's full of chemicals. Suddenly, seized with panic, Grace said, Christ, where the hell are Mr and Mrs Bryce? It's all right, sir, the constable said. They're in ambulances on their way to hospital. Good man. Chapter 87 Five minutes later, just as the first fire engine pulled up outside, the warehouse exploded. The blast blew out windows from buildings up to a quarter of a mile away. It was over two days before it was cool enough for the forensic investigators to enter and begin their grim task. Three sets of human remains were eventually found. One would be identified in a few weeks' time by his brother, still under police guard in hospital, from the partially melted gold medallion found around his neck. The second, just a human skull, would be identified from dental records as being Janie Stretton. The third would also be identified from dental records as being Andy Gidney. The intense heat had made it impossible to determine, from what little remained of his bones, Gidney's precise cause of death, and no one was able to offer any explanation of what he had been doing on the premises. In a couple of months, Detective Sergeant John Rye of the High Tech Crime Unit would provide a report for the coroner's court, and, for lack of evidence, the coroner would have no option but to return an open verdict more succinct but less informative than a shipping forecast. It was half past four when Roy Grace finally left the blaze, which was a long way yet from being under control. 
he drove straight to the Royal Sussex County Hospital and went to find Glenn Branson in the emergency ward. Glenn's pretty wife, Ari, was already there. She had never shown much warmth towards Grace, blaming him, he suspected, for keeping her husband away from home so much. And there was no thaw today. Glenn had been lucky. Only one bullet had hit, and it had gone through his abdomen, missing his spine by half an inch. He would be a little sore for a while, and Grace had no doubt he would enjoy much of his convalescence watching movies in which screen heroes took bullets and survived. Next, in the intensive care unit, he met Emma Jane's parents. Her mother, an attractive woman in her forties, who gave him a stoical smile. Her father, a very quiet man, who sat squeezing a yellow tennis ball in his hand, as if his daughter's life depended on it. Emma Jane seemed to be improving. That was the best they could say. When he left the hospital, he felt depressed, wondering what kind of a leader he was to let two of his team come so close to death. He stopped off at a workman's cafe, went in and had a massive fry-up and a strong cup of tea. When he had finished, feeling considerably better now, he sat hunched over the Formica table and made a series of phone calls. As he stood up to leave, his mobile rang. It was Nick Nickel, asking how he was, then telling him he hadn't had a chance to report on his meeting with the officer from the Met about the girl who had been found dead on Wimbledon Common with a scarab design on her bracelet. It had turned out to be a dead end, a coincidence. The girl's boyfriend had confessed to her murder. Bella Moy, who had been working on all the other forces, had found no other murders with a scarab beetle at the crime scene. Maybe we got lucky and caught them early, Grace wondered. But not early enough for poor Janie Stretton. He told the young DC to go home, to put his arms around his wife, who was due to give birth any day, and tell her he loved her. Nickel, sounding surprised, thanked him. But that was how Grace felt at this moment. But life was precious and precarious. You never knew what was around the corner. Cherish what you had while you had it. As he climbed back into his car, Cleo rang, sounding bright and perky. Hi, she said. Sorry to be so long calling you back. Are you free to talk? Totally, he said. Good. I've had one hell of a day. Four cadavers. You know what it's like after a weekend. I do. One motorbike fatality, one fifty-year-old man who fell off a ladder, and two old ladies. Not to mention a male head that came in yesterday without much else left of him. But I think you know about that one. Just a little. Then I had to go into the centre of Brighton at lunchtime to buy an anniversary present for the aged peas. Aged what's? My parents. Ah. I got my damned car stuck in the Civic Square car park. There was a bomb scare. Can you bloody believe it? Really? When I finally got the car out, the whole bloody city was gridlocked. I did hear something about that, he said. So how was your day? she asked. Oh, you know, average. No big excitement? Nah. There was a strange but comfortable silence between them for some moments. Then she said, I've been longing to speak to you all day, but I wanted to do it when we had some quality time. I didn't want it to be just a hurried, hi, great shag last night, bye. Grace laughed, and suddenly it seemed an awfully long time since the last time he'd laughed. It had been a long, long few days. Later, much later, after hours in the office making a start on the mountain of paperwork that would keep him occupied for the rest of the week and beyond, Grace found himself back in Cleo's flat. That night, after they had made love, he slept in her arms like a baby. He slept the sleep of the dead, and for a few of those hours it was without any of the fears of the living. Chapter 88 on Thursday morning, his hands heavily bandaged and still hurting like hell from the acid burns, Tom Bryce went into his office for a couple of hours. 
It was clear from the exuberant greetings from his staff and the stack of press cuttings on his desk that the front-page headlines he had made with Kelly nationwide over the past couple of days had done Bryce Wright promotional merchandise no harm at all. His two salesmen in the office, Peter Chard and Simon Wong, were over the moon. They couldn't remember when they had last had this level of inquiries from existing and potential customers. Oh, Chard added, standing over his desk, good news is that we've delivered the Rolexes to Ron Spax, all 25 of them. Our margin is unbloody believable. I never saw the final artwork, Tom said, suddenly feeling a little concerned. If there had been a screw-up on the engraving of 25 Rolex watches, it would be a financial disaster. No worries. I rang him yesterday to check all was kosher. He's happy as Larry with them. Get me the paperwork on them, will you? A couple of minutes later, Chard put the file down on his desk. Tom opened it and stared at the order. The margin was fantastic. £1,400 profit per watch, multiplied by 25. That made £35,000. He had never made that kind of profit on an order before, ever. Then his elation turned to gloom. Kelly had agreed to go to a clinic to dry out. Afterwards, they would start afresh together. But the good places cost a fortune. For the top ones, you could be looking at the wrong end of a couple of thousand pounds a week, multiplied by several months, a good 30,000 to 40,000 pounds if you really wanted a result, and the cost of childminders while she was there. At least with this order, he would have the dosh to cover it, and in the six years he had been doing business with Ron Spax, the man had always paid on the nail, seven days from delivery, never a day late. Looking at the paperwork, Tom asked, When were these delivered? Yesterday. Fast work, Tom said. I only took the order last Thursday, Peter Chard said. Yeah, well, I found a supplier who had stock and got our engraver to work through the night. I never saw the design. He was going to send it through. Chard turned a couple of sheets of paper over, then tapped an A4 photocopy. This is a massive enlargement. It's actually a microdot, invisible to the naked eye. Tom looked down and saw a drawing of a beetle, a rather fine but slightly menacing-looking creature, with strange markings on its back and a horn rising from its head. He frowned. It's called a scarab beetle, Peter Chard said. Apparently they're sacred in ancient Egyptian mythology. Is that right? Yeah. Disgusting creature, also known as a dung beetle. Why would he want these on a watch? Chard shrugged. He's a DVD distributor, isn't he? Yes, massive. Maybe there's a record label with that name. The salesman shrugged again. He's your client, I figured you knew. Tom felt a sudden cold shiver run through him. Maybe he should mention this to Detective Superintendent Grace when they next spoke, as a coincidence, to have a laugh about, if nothing else. But he decided it might be wise to wait until Ron Spax had paid first. You have been listening to Looking Good Dead by Peter James, narrated by David Thorpe. If you have enjoyed this recording and would like to receive information on other titles, please contact us at the address on the cover. We will be pleased to send you a catalogue of all our available titles. Clipper Audio presents The Author Talks. Peter James in conversation with Peter Curran. Well, I'm joined now by Peter James, and we're talking about his book, Looking Good Dead. Peter, how does it feel to uh, hear the book in uh, audio, spoken word form, as opposed to merely on the page? It's kind of interesting, because as a writer, you, 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 in a sense, play God, not in a sort of magnificent sense, but in a sense that you, know, you, you create this stuff out of your head. And actually, when I'm creating dialogue... Um, my my friend, in fact, my, my my beloved, always thinks I'm sort of bonkers because I walk around talking to myself, and I'm constantly trying to visualize um, and audioize um, scenes and, and, and particularly dialogue. So it's kind of interesting actually hearing it, it for real and seeing how it compares with how I had originally imagined it. And I think that every time um, actors have their interpretation on it, but 
Most I love it. I mean, I just I, I think it's a great kick as a writer to see something you've created being performed in in any medium. Um, and what about the extent uh, to which you uh, research the book? I mean, a, an actor reading the book is not going to know about the hours you spent haranguing uh, police departments, uh, going to see those happy people at Hove Morgan and everything else. Uh, tell us how you go about then uh, getting the authenticity for your books. I'm a great um, lover of research. I, mean, I think the research in many ways is for me, the most fascinating part of the whole writing process. And I've been very lucky over the years. I've become friendly with a lot of police officers, particularly in Sussex, where the Roy Gray series is set. And I've got their trust. Just to give you an example, I, I, I've had three phone calls in the last 24 hours because I've asked if I can go to the next major murder inquiry in Sussex. Um, and there's a team of four senior investigating officers, any one of whom is going to get that call in the, in the middle of the night or, or, or whenever, whenever the next unfortunate body is discovered. So they've all been phoning me to work out where I am and, and, and to, to get me prepped. Um, so literally I could get a phone call any time in the, in the next few days if, God forbid, and there will be, there's another murder and I, and I will go and follow that right from the, from the get-go. Now, there's one thing, uh, having fantastic access, but... On the other hand, are you not sometimes uh, restricted by you know the police wanting to get their version of themselves as investigators across, uh, you know, bypass the novelist's independence, as it were? I think every profession has its ways of doing things, and I'm sure you know, I'm sure you, from your own experience in your profession, if you read in a novel about an interviewer on a, on, a, on a successful radio show interviewing some. Pratt novelist, um, if he's not asking the questions the way you think that an interviewer would ask the questions, you probably think this guy's not done his research, he's an idiot. I think every profession is, is proud of what they do. And the police are, are, are very much proud of what they do. And it's kind of interesting, the police very rarely watch television shows about police because they get so irritated about all the stuff that's wrong. And I do too. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a great stickler for research and I want somebody to read my book I don't necessarily want you to be able to have a trained timetable but I want you to read my novel and think actually this is how the police really do things and I get annoyed you know I watch something like Frost on television and, and I think you know, Jason's great but hello the guy walks into a crime scene in his old Mac and his hat and his, and his brogues the guy would be locked up in, in the real world you know, there, there are incredibly strict procedures that, that, that the police have for doing things. Um, you know, and a crime scene is the most sacrosanct thing there is now. And, and, you know, the police have this expression of, of clearing the ground beneath your feet and, 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 and the golden hour, which is those precious first hours after a body is discovered, when the crime scene is sealed off, <clears throat> when anybody who comes in that perimeter is logged on, they're in protective clothing, they have a set path so they don't contaminate the crime scene. There's all kinds of regulations, which I think are very fascinating. I mean, the, the most interesting, because of modern forensics, what has become the most interesting forensic area is is the dead body in a, in a murder scene because of not only the clues the body can reveal about how it's been killed, but about the killer. Um, you know, just one clothing fibre or one bit of skin may have fallen off the killer's face, and it's lying there on that body, and it can be discovered. And forensics fascinates me. There's a, there's a great forensic boast, which is, uh, if, if you've ever been in a room in your life, give the soccer guys enough time, and they'll be able to prove it, even if it was 20 years ago. I wanted to ask you also about the uh, you know the, the psychological uh, aspect uh, to your work, and it's particularly prevalent here in uh, Looking Good Dead. Uh, this trick that, that Roy Grace has for finding out if someone's lying or telling the truth uh, down to eye movements. Uh, tell us about that and if it's just authorly invention or that there's uh, real evidence for it. Oh yeah, and that I use um, for Roy Grace, he's got a particular interest in, in an area of psychology which is called neuro-linguistic programming which, which is a very big field and it's basically reading body language 
And if you go back through the history of, of the police and, and all the great detectives, both real and, and fictional... I must have here, I'm just about to fold my arms so I don't give away any clues, or perhaps that's even the worst thing to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm mirroring you now. <laughs> And, and, and that's, that's where mirroring is one, is one of the techniques in, in neurolinguistics, which is you fold your arms. You at the moment have control because you're interviewing me. If you fold your arms, I fold my arms. Now you've opened your arms, I open my arms. If I keep doing this and I wasn't alerting you to it, within a few minutes you'd start copying me instead. And that would mean I've got you in my control. And it's, it's one of the big secret techniques that, that, that police can use in interview te- in interviews particularly if you've got somebody who's a dominant bully and, and, and isn't going to be intimidated by the police. There are very certain subtle ways you can, you can change that balance of power in an interview. And Roy Grace, who's my main character in, in, in the series of books that I'm, that I'm writing, detective superintendent who has this particular interest in body language and has studied it. Um, and absolutely, there are ways that you can tell if somebody's telling the truth or lying. And the, su- the suspect he's talking to, she uh, looks to her left when he asks a question, and that's heading towards the memory part of the brain, which, as opposed to looking to the right, which is where you look if you're going to construct something that might necessarily be true. Correct. Every- everybody has a right and a left side of their brains. And some people, well, and one side is construct, which is where we lie, and the other side is memory, where we where we tend to tell the truth. And it varies in different people. So the first thing I would do is if I wanted, I would ask you a control question. I'd say, like, what did you have for breakfast? Well, uh, for breakfast I had, um, I think it was sausage sandwich. No, it was yesterday. Uh, so your I eyes, can't remember. Your, your eyes went to the right. That's a constructive so that, one. That, 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 no, that tells me that's your memory mode. Ah, uh, okay. So if, if you're going to tell the truth, if I ask you a question, probably telling the truth, your eyes will go to the right. So if your eyes go to the left, if I, if I ask you a question, your eyes went to the left, then I'd know you're lying. Okay. This is uh, certainly wresting the power from the interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever happened to timid authors who simply answered questions? Uh, what about um, the uh, relationship that uh, Roy Grace has with those around him? I mean, there's something about creating uh, a memorable uh, 